All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, and we're welcoming you to a regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County. It is an absolutely beautiful day today in Manatee County, and we're going to start this day in our normal fashion. In Manatee County, we always start by honoring God and by honoring this great nation. So today, we have Pastor Nicholas Lee from Harvard Methodist Church, who will lead us in prayer, after which our County Commissioner and Marine Corps veteran, Mike Ron, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this time, if you're able, please stand. Let's pray. <clears throat> Eternal Father, God, Creator, this morning we take a brief moment to pause and give you thanks for such a beautiful day here in the county. We pause knowing that you are present with us and we ask that this morning, as we consider the business of the people, you would speak clearly to us so that we can do the work that needs to be done to provide for the people of Manatee County to bring justice, to bring peace and order so that we can function in the way that you've called us this morning to do. God, we know that we come with different thoughts and feelings, but we pray that this morning, as we consider the business, you, in fact, would give us your heart and your mind so that we can work together for the best for this county at this moment for the people. We thank you, God, for all that you've given us, and we pray that you would allow us to do the best with what we have been given today as we consider this work. In your son's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for your service to our community, Pastor. Commissioner, thank you for your service to our country. Mr. Washington, would you please read announcements and updates to today's agenda into the record? Good morning, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Updates and changes to the agenda dated April 21st, awards and presentations and proclamations, item number two, presentations of certificates of recognition to Dr. Deborah Gosner Vinick. The agenda item was added to the agenda. Citizens' comments, written correspondence was submitted by Mike Adams and Charlene Cow. Changes to the consent agenda under the county attorney, item number nine, adoption of resolution R-23-069 to initiate conflict resolution procedures with the Manatee County School Board with respect to the claims filed by Cynthia M. Daltrey and Richard C. Daltrey and authorize the county attorney to file a cross-claim against Manatee County School Board pursuant to Florida R-CV P-1-170. The agenda item was updated to include resolution R-23-069. Item 11, Tamara Adivar versus Manatee County, case number 2020-CA-1443, motion to allow plaintiff's proposal for settlement to Manatee <laughs> County to expire and take no action regarding the proposal for settlement. This agenda item was added to the agenda. Financial management, item number 15, adoption of resolution R-23-002, authorizing the issuance of the Public Utilities Revenue Improvement and Refunding Bond Series 2023. This agenda item was updated to include Exhibit C, to the resolution. Under public safety, item 34, execution of the memorandum of understanding for remote site education at the Bishop Animal Shelter between the School Board of Manatee County doing business as Manatee Technical College and Manatee County Government. This agenda item was moved to the regular portion of the agenda item as item 43. Under public works, item 37, adoption of ordinance 23-68 prohibiting engine, engine compression release braking on Talavas Road from US 301 to Lockwood Ridge Road. This agenda item was moved to the advertised public hearing presentation upon request as item number 40 and updated to include the affidavit, affidavit of publishing. Advertised public hearings, presentations upon request under national resources. Item 39, adoption of ordinance 23-082, amending section 2-25-55E, one of the Manatee County Code of Ordinance to revise the terms of members of the Environmental Lands Management and Acquisition Committee representing each county commissioner district. This agenda item was updated to include the affidavit of publishing. 
Under the County Administrator, under the regular agenda, item 42, discussion of veterans transitional housing. This agenda item was updated with a replacement PowerPoint presentation and financial handout. Nas National Resources, item 44, Environmental Lands Programs Update and Environmental Lands Management and Acquisitions Committee, LMAC, recommendations. This agenda item was updated to include written correspondence. Under Commissioner Agenda and Comments, item number 45, execution of the use agreement between the University of South Florida Board of Trustees in Manatee County and adoption of resolution R-23-063, authorizing the conveyance of real property to the University of South Florida Board of Trustees for property located at the Crosley Estate, Bradenton, Florida, District 4. This agenda item was updated to include the use agreement, resolution R-23-063, county deed, request for legal services and location map. Updates the agenda dated April 24th, 2023 under citizens comments. Written correspondence was submitted by Diana, Diana Adams. Changes to the consent agenda. Item number 10, adoption of resolution R-23-078, appointing John Mass as acting county administrator. This agenda item was updated to include resolution R-23-078. Under the regular agenda, national resources, Item 44, Environmental Lands Program Update and Environmental Lands Management and Acquisitions Committee, LMAC recommendations. This agenda item was updated to include a revised PowerPoint presentation, candidate property summary, existing and candidate um, conservation land map and additional written correspondence. Under Commissioner Agenda and Comments, Item 45, execution of the use agreement between the University of South Florida Board of Trustees and Manatee County and adoption of resolution R-23-063, authorizing the conveyance of real property to the University of South Florida Board of Trustees for property located at the Crosley Estate in Bradenton, Florida. This agenda item was deleted from the agenda. Those are all the updates, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. We're now going to recess this meeting of the Board of County Commissioners, and we're going to open a meeting of the Port Authority of Manatee County. So the County Commissioners are in recess. And I don't need a gavel. It's fine. Uh, all right, we're, <coughs> we're opening up the, uh, the monthly meeting for Seaport Manatee. Uh, this is entirely a consent agenda item, but we have uh, the executive director, Carlos Pacaris, here with us. Uh, so I will, uh, well, we start with public comment. We never get it. So before I let you start, just I'll, I'll see, is there any public comment here for Seaport Manatee? Of course, Glenn. Our, our, our rules at Seaport Manatee are the same as our rules at Board of County Commissions. Uh, please state your name and your county of residence. You have three minutes. Hello, hello. Glenn Jablina for the record. Uh, Port Manatee, I've been beating this drum about renewable energy out there. We have hundreds and thousands of square feet of roof space that we're not taking advantage of. As you know, the utility rates are going up. Why not be your own power company? Why not you put up 20, 30,000 solar panels on the warehouses we rent and sell the electric to them? It's a no-brainer. You know, why, why would you, why, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars writing checks to FPL every year. There's a better way. Why would you import electric from 15, 20 miles away when you can import it 50 feet from the roof? I don't get it. Prices are down. You, you can get solar on your roof for a buck and a half a watt. Ten years ago, it was $15. Price of solar panels have plummeted 80% in the last five years. Let's get on board here with some renewable energy uh, projects out there and start saving the taxpayers some money. These panels have a 25-year year warranty at 90%, and they're good for another 25 years. So I encourage this board to look into the renewable energy source. You know, New Haven, East Coast, their whole port is run by solar panels. And guess what? They got cold wind, sleet, snow. They make the numbers work. LA port, part of there is done by solar panels. They make the numbers work. We're in the sunshine state. Make the numbers work. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Seeing none, we will close public comments and 
Carlos, I'll turn it over to you to present your consent agenda. Is there anybody who wants to pull anything from this consent? Thank you, Mr. None. Chairman. Go Commissioners, ahead. as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's only one item, one consent agenda, and that's all we have at this time. Okay. Then I will entertain motions to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All right. I have a motion by Commissioner Ron and a second by Commissioner Satcher. Any dialogue, discussion? Seeing none, we will take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, is approved unanimously. Carlos, I'll turn it back over to you. Excuse Thanks. me, Commissioner Cruz. I'd like to vote yay as well, please. Thank you. <laughs> I had no idea she was on Zoom. <laughs> I, right. I realize you didn't, and I apologize, but I had no way to let you know at the time. Do you have any comments on the consent agenda? No, sir. I'm good. I just wanted to make the vote. All right. Sounds good. So it is approved 7-0, inclusive of Commissioner Baugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. The port is doing very well. We are continuing to grow the business, the footprint. The amount of customers interested in expanding at the port continues to grow, so it bodes well for the future. Just as an FYI, we're hoping to put on your calendar May 23rd back here for our May agenda items. And then uh, if time allows and your schedules uh, are able to accommodate them, June 15th at the port to do our two, you know, on the first half of the year, two meetings at the port, and hopefully two more in the fall. Uh, May 23rd here, June 15th at the port. We'll check your calendars, so uh, we'll see how how your you know how your calendars look. That's it. That's all I have. All right. Does anyone up here, any of the members, have any comments to make? Seeing none. Carlos, thank you as always. I look forward to getting back out to the port and having our, our longer presentations. Are always entertaining and informative. But uh, with that, if you have no further comments, commissioners have no further comments, I will close this meeting of the Port Authority. Thank you. Welcome back to the Board of County Commissioner meeting. Um, commissioners, we'll go right to consent. Are there any items that commissioners would like to have removed from today's consent agenda? I'll, I'll remove item 10 since it's not supposed to be. Commissioner removed. Cruz would like to remove item 10. Are there any other items on consent that commissioners would like to remove at this time? Uh, Mr. Chair, Sir. I'd just like to maybe rather than remove, but just highlight that 28 is good news for the people of Parish, um, that we've got a new contractor on Erie, and they're going to be able to actually get the job done instead of just barrels sitting around. Um, so I'm very excited about that, and people in the Parish area can be excited about that as well. Um, but I don't see any reason to actually pull it, but I appreciate you could let me comment on it. Thank you. Yes, sir. And for clarification, item number 28 is ratification of emergency guaranteed maximum price addendum to agreement, and that is construction management at risk services for Erie Road. Yes, sir. And that's from 301, uh, US 301 to US 301 nor south dash north phase two, to be specific, if people are wondering. So. It does connect to 3012 places. I had to think about that for a second, but you're right. It does connect to 3012 places. Okay. A um, few unique roads in this town, that being one of them. So item number 10, commissioners, I, you know, sort of for stability purposes, and, and, you know, I think it's a good idea for us to pull item 10 and, and hear it now. I think we should get it out of the way at the onset of the meeting. Does anyone have any objection to that? Okay. Then we're going to hear item number 10, and this is essentially the county attorney's item. Yes, sir. So we'll go to the county attorney now. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, and Commissioner Cruz is right. This this was not it was not my intention for item 10 to be a consent item. So there must have been a miscommunication there. I, I sent you all a copy of the agenda matter last night, and it was designated as a regular item. Um, it is the adoption of resolution 23-078, appointing John D. Mast as acting county administrator, and it is a county attorney item. At the board's April 18th regular meeting. Uh, you directed me to bring this back to you, uh, and if adopted, this resolution would appoint Mr. Mast as acting administrator, and it would authorize the chair to execute an employment contract with him. Um, the, the terms that Mr. Mast is requesting for his employment contract are summarized in the agenda item, and I briefed 
each of you individually about those yesterday. If you'd like me to go over any of them in detail, I'm uh, certainly prepared to do so. And it is a board decision whether or not those terms are acceptable. The board wanted me to handle this, but I, I do need to say it, it's not appropriate for me to speculate which terms would receive the support of four or more commissioners and which ones would not, and I take my direction from the whole board, so I brought this through to you, um, you know, so that you can make your decision on it, and typically I don't recommend business terms to the board unless there is a significant legal interest involved. Um, so the board's options today are, of course, to uh, approve and adopt the resolution and accept those proposed terms, or you could reject or modify them. You could discuss those directly with Mr. Mast, who is present here today, or you could send me back to talk to him further if the board um, is, you know, if they are not acceptable to the board. I do need to make you aware of a Scrivener's error in Section 2B of the resolution, uh, which was brought to my attention by my chief assistant yesterday afternoon, which has been corrected in the final version. Um, it, it has a phrase in it that says, or the removal of from the position of acting county administrator that should say or his removal from the position of acting county administrator and again i have a corrected copy for the clerk uh, if the board adopts the resolution so mr chairman that's all i have and i'm happy to answer any questions thank you sir commissioner cruz is on the board with a question sir i have lots of questions i mean first off the fact this is on consent and the fact that it includes an employee contract along with the resolution, in my opinion, completely violates the entire motion that was made a week ago today. I went back and watched that. In fact, the county attorney specifically stated in that meeting that we would not be getting an employment contract. His, he said that we typically handle these via resolution and an employment contract would be withheld until we had a permanent county administrator. That was clearly stated on this board. I understand that, that your negotiation could change that, but that even the nature of the vote was a vote to authorize a resolution being prepared and negotiated. So, I mean, that, that, that right there is a, a question because it doesn't sound like that's what we authorized to be done. Second, the, the motion specifically said that we we're going to direct you to come back with options for us to discuss. The very nature of consent violates that motion in and of itself that we're trying to put this on something that that intended to avoid discussion in fact there was a commissioner up here who wanted all seven of us to be involved in the negotiation but this got crammed in here so i don't like the nature of how this kind of went through but i want to talk about the the specifics of this contract I, i've said it before about timing i talked about it last thursday and i meant that with you know good faith explanation of how things were going to work and that was under the assumption that a new interim county administrator was going to start effectively this afternoon. That's what we did with Dr. Hopes. That's what we did with, with Mr. Washington. They, that's what we did with Karen Stewart. They started immediately. And even then, I had meaningful concern about timing and its disruption in this county because it was only going to be five to six weeks before the budget meetings, which wasn't going to be a lot of time to prepare a budget, and only like six to eight weeks before we, less than that, before we turn over the county. Now, this contract doesn't start till May 22nd. That's a month from now. So one, we have a, an interim county administrator who's basically being told to, to stand there and, and work hard to construct a budget that he's not going to be here in this position, at least, to present. And now we have a, a new interim county administrator starting 15 days before the first public budget meeting that has to present a budget that isn't even being prepared by that interim county administrator and only three weeks before we turn over the entirety of this county to somebody who most likely wouldn't have had time even to introduce themselves to all the employees that they're now the boss over. This timing is incredibly terrible. This isn't like we're doing this in October at the start of a new fiscal year and you know we can, we can deal with it as we get through the holiday season. This is just awful, awful timing and I said that before. But my concern is the nature of this contract is so out of market <coughs> compared to other contracts we've presented, we're setting ourselves up to fail for, for the taxpayers because when we go out and look for a new county administrator, which we are, presumably, they're going to look at this contract. They're going to look at what they're getting into. They're probably watching these meetings right now, and, and we're probably losing potential applicants in and of itself. But when they come in, they're going to benchmark off of this contract. We have a contract with an interim county minister who has years of experience in this county, and he's at $200,000. This is 
225 plus we pay all the, the benefits, plus a car allowance. This contract is a solid 20% plus higher than the current interim county administrator position that we're having, and it's higher than the last permanent county administrator we had. And to get to the 215 for Scott, we removed the car allowance. We removed the, well, I don't think he ever had the, the benefits clause to it, but we also removed the part where he gets an automatic pay bump if employees get pay bumps, which has been added back in here. Last year, that pay bump was 7%. That's like 15 grand on this contract if this contract is still outstanding. This is a, a out of market contract, maybe not relative to the state of Florida, but relative to Manatee County. And no permanent county administrator is going to walk in here to negotiate in good faith and feel that they're, they're owed a penny less than what this contract says. We're setting it a, an anchor floor to any future negotiations because they're not gonna say, I deserve less than the interim guy you just put in 90 days ago. So that's immediately costing the taxpayers money. Second, we're putting a poison pill in here. And look, I, I, I know everyone's like, why are you after John? I'm not, I, I, I think John and Teresa are great people. They endorsed me in my campaign. I've already endorsed his wife and her campaign. This is not personal. This is in the best interest of the seven people up on this board, the 2,000 people working in this building, and the 400,000 people working here, that this is just a bad idea, and if we're going to do this, we need to do it the right way to set ourselves up for success in the future. And to automatically have somebody drop down to deputy county administrator upon the completion of this is basically telling any future county administrators you are forced to hire the former county administrator as your underling, a person who has more, more, more relationship with the staff at that point in time and more contacts in this building. It's like electing a new president and telling that president, the, the former president is now your vice president. Like, no, they're not going to want that to happen. That, that's going to hurt our ability to find the best candidate for the long term for Manatee County. I also question the legality of it, in all honesty, because Florida Statute 125. whatever, 74, I think, clearly states that the county administrator has the sole authority to hire staff. So we're trying to circumvent the Florida statute by effectively hiring a deputy county administrator from this dais solely by putting him into a temporary position and then sliding him down to a position that we want him to be in, which we don't have the authority to. We can put in a contract that we recommend a future county administrator consider hiring this person, but I, I, I don't see how this, this sleight of hand works from a Florida statute standpoint of effectively hiring someone. I, I don't think this is the right time. I've said that before and I stand by it. I don't think this is the right contract because I think it's putting us and the taxpayers in a very bad position in the future. I think we're putting too many poison pills in here that is, well, you know, here's how I envision it. Someone's gonna come in and want more money than we're willing to pay them because of this contract. Someone's gonna come in and not wanna hire somebody that we're forcing them to hire, and then we're going to lose people. And three months, six months down the road, we're all gonna sit up here and go, well, we couldn't find any qualified candidates, but we got somebody here right now. We might as well slide that person in. That's what's going to happen. We all know that's what's going to happen. That's the game that's being played here because we're basically setting up this contract to almost ensure that our national search is unsuccessful. And then we have a convenient backstop. That, that's how I read this. I don't like the fact that it was on consent. I don't like the fact that we negotiated an employment contract without giving the authority to the county attorney to do so. And I don't like how this contract is for the seven of us. I don't like how it is for the 2,000 people in this, this building. I don't like how it is for the 400,000 people in this county. This is just still a bad idea. And if we're going to do a bad idea, I don't want to do it with a bad contract. I'm hoping this contract is so intentionally bad that it gives people the ability to vote against it, honestly. Thank you, sir. Uh, just to be clear, commissioners, the item was not supposed to be on consent. Uh, that was a staff error, and I said, don't worry about it. We'll just pull it off at the beginning of the meeting. So. I did bring it to your attention immediately. You, you did, and I told you, don't that. worry about it. We'll pull yeah, it off when the meeting starts. not my starts. intention, so. Commissioner Cruz, and I'm sorry it happened, but it was not something Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a, something yeah, that Yeah, it was just an error. It's not a big deal. Commissioner Bearden, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, last week uh, when this happened, you know, Commissioner Cruz uh, made a point, and um, – I got to think about that point over the weekend and, you know, we do have budget coming up and, and a lot of major things that are coming down the pipeline. And, um, you know, looking back now, I, 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 I do agree with Commissioner Cruz in regards to the statements that, you know, he was saying. And, um, you know, looking at this contract, right, he, you know, nothing against Mr. Mast, but we would be paying him 
he would be the highest paid county administrator that we've ever had based off the stipulations that were being implemented in the contract. I mean, we're looking in a range of between $258,000 to $265,000 um, with all in uh, regarding this contract. And, um, you know, I just don't think that it's in the best interest of the taxpayers of Manatee County regarding this. So I completely agree with you, uh, Commissioner Cruz, in regards to the direction that you brought to the board. Um, and so, you know, I think we definitely need to relook at this contract and make sure that, you know, we're, we're ensuring that we're um, approaching this in a matter for the benefit of the taxpayers. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. I'm next on the board. Um, so Commissioner Bearden, you and I have had our differences lately. Um, so I wanna keep this conversation as above the fray as I possibly can. <coughs> I can't sit here without pointing out the fact that I negotiated the contract for the current administrator at $200,000. And the board made the decision to remove me from the negotiations. And now this is what we're faced with. Um, so I guess my request is that if, I want Mr. Mast here, obviously, I'm going to give Mr. Mass two points, two bonus points here, right? The guy came in. It's called the power of ASK, right? The power of ask. Um, he came in um, with a big ask, and I never knock somebody for that. I don't knock people for trying to make money um, and trying to make the best of their situation that they possibly can. Um, but that said, I think we do need um, a board member to be involved in the negotiations. Uh, to, to get this to um, a contract to, to something that everybody can agree upon and, and something that's in the best interest of the taxpayers and, and Mr. Mass, to be honest. He's not walking into an ideal situation. I, I see that. Um, literally, the situation is not what it was, you know, a week ago or two weeks ago, I guess. Um, so I, I, I understand that. It, it gives, it gives the, the incoming more, more leverage. I understand that. You and Commissioner Cruz both make valid points in that potential candidates for the permanent position are watching this, and this is giving them more and more leverage as we as we go forward here, right? Um, it's it's not putting us in a great situation with as far as negotiating with the, the next permanent, uh, and I, I do I think we all see that. So you're both right about that. Anyway, those are my comments. I, I don't know that I'm necessarily making a specific ask, but I am certainly going to put it out there, sir. You're next on the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I can see your point, uh, Mr. Chair, in regards to this, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was obviously, you know, I, I think that everybody on this board maybe had a, a an interview with uh, Mr. Mass at one point in time, and it wouldn't surprise me if um, Mr. Mass was influenced by, you know, what to bring to the board. I mean, let's just be honest, um, to so that you know, the board wouldn't have the input in regards to the negotiations moving forward. And so that wouldn't surprise me in this case. And, and, I'm, and I'm just a, making that assumption, so. Well, the board has all the input in the world. I mean, that's why we're here discussing <laughs> exactly. it, is, is discussing for the purpose of input. Uh, there's no one else on the board at this time. Not sure where the board wants to go with it at this point. Uh, there is a, we'll, uh, sir, you're out of order. You're not recognized. Thank you. Um, so, Commissioner Ballard, you're on the board, ma'am. So I, I do agree with some of the comments that have been made, and I and I also agree with uh, with with Chair Van Austin Bridge that I, I think that we do need um, a little bit more board input um, on this contract. I don't really think it's appropriate for us to negotiate this entire contract from the dais. Um, but I, I don't think that we're um, at a contract at this very moment that's palatable for for the board and um, good for the taxpayers of Manatee County. That's my that's my thought. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Clegg is on the board next. Commissioner Baugh, are you there? Commissioner Baugh, are you able to hear us? I can hear you. Okay. If you uh, do, you want to speak? At the, do you want yourself on the board? I guess is my, my question. Not at this time. Okay, I'll it's wait. just it's an important mm -hmm. discussion. I just want to make sure I am listening to the board excluded. and then I'll make my comments. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Clegg. Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I think look, it's very difficult for a lawyer 
to sit down on a contract negotiation with a client rep. I mean, I think you all are thinking the right way. If you want to, if you want to, you know, go back and talk to Mr. Mast about what is acceptable or not, I, I think it would be a good idea for me to have somebody that I can take with me that can be the person that can negotiate and discuss the business issues with him. It's very hard for me to do that. I've been through a number of these votes now since I've been county attorney, and this isn't the first time that something's come back and the board has said, well, wait a minute, that's really not what we're comfortable with. And so this is the, uh, that's the next step in the process, I think, if that's where the board wants to go. And I'll be happy if somebody wants to make a motion to help you craft it. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I'm going to propose that uh, if that's the direction that we go, um, that we send Commissioner Bearden. Because I'll second that if that's a motion, Because he seems like the most down the middle on this. I, I clearly think even hiring a, a new interim is a terrible idea for the county. So I, I don't think I could go in in good faith. Uh, other people are clearly far on the other side of this. I think Commissioner Bearden is, is the most down the middle, looking at things rationally person up here. And if anyone's going to negotiate this with, with the county attorney, I would trust him. Yeah, I'll, if you make a motion, if you'd word a motion, I'll second it. Yeah, I, I will make a motion that if we bring, if this is going back, we don't know what's going to happen with this vote, so I can't. So well, there's no motion on the floor, sir. No well, there is a motion on the floor. Well, no, no, one, there's no, no, one's, motion. no one's made it. There's, there's, there's no motion correct. on the you're floor. Correct. You're correct. Would you like right. me to help you all craft yeah, one? Yeah, just craft something that says you're going to work with Jason. The motion would be to authorize Commissioner Bearden to work with the county attorney to enter into discussions with Mr. Mast and bring back options to the board for his employment as acting county administrator. So moved. Second. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to direct the county attorney and Commissioner Bearden to enter into negotiations with Mr. Mast uh, to be the acting county administrator. Um, I mean, we're pretty far along here, to be honest. We have a meeting on Thursday. Uh, Commissioner Bearden, is there any, does your schedule allow for you to, to work that out tomorrow and come back on Thursday? Okay, good, good, because I think sooner the, you know, sooner the better. Right. Um, okay, so we'll open this up to public comment then. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to comment on the board directing Commissioner Bearden and the county attorney to enter into negotiations with Mr. Mass to be the acting county administrator? So, sir, please state your first and last name, your county of residence, and you'll have three minutes to dis address the board regarding the motion on the floor. My name is Martin Hyde. I live just south of uh, Manatee at the uh, northern end of Sarasota County. Nearly 165 years ago, Abraham Lincoln said in a speech at the Illinois Republican Convention that a house divided against itself cannot stand. He was paraphrasing Matthew 12:25, which says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. The county commission has no political opposition on it, but it does have seven commissioners fighting each other instead of fighting for the citizens of Manatee County. Sir, is this regarding the motion on the Absolutely. floor? Absolutely. Okay, carry you on. Just bear with me. Removing and then reinstating the ceremonial chair of this board was the latest of many petulant squabbles. The vote to negotiate the hire of an interim county administrator who would be the third boss staff have had in less than three months, would be laughable if it wasn't so outrageous. To hire, even temporarily, a man who is currently president of one of the largest builder developer advocacy groups in the region is like hiring a bank robber to run a bank. The biggest issues consistently in this region in citizen surveys are traffic congestion and overdevelopment. But six of you voted to negotiate with someone who's not only a personal friend to some of you, but an advocate for more building and development. None of you would have been elected on a platform of corruption and cronyism, and certainly none of you will get re-elected by handing over the administrative reins of the county to someone who actively promotes the interests of the few, by which I mean developers, over the many, which, lest you forget, are the 412,000 people who live in Manatee County. I'm not buying the upon further reflection justification for a vault face last week on the board chair, and neither are many people. Sunshine law requires government to be done in the sunshine, not through cutouts working for one interest or another. That having been said, none of you has more authority than another. If staff has been unresponsive to you, the answer is demand of the administrator they do so, not to go hire one of your pals. 
County business is not about, for the most part, national policy, but rather local impact, which is arguably more important. Giving this county administrator role to a development advocate is not just putting a fox in the hen house, it's saying we don't care about the hens, meaning citizens. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that our masters are happy with us and we know who your masters are. I'd say do better, but surely you can't do worse. Say no to this bizarre hire and start fighting for the citizens and not property developers. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on the motion on the floor? Yes, sir. Please state your first and last name, your county of residence, and you have three minutes to address the board on the motion on the floor. Kevin Wright, Manti County. Uh, first, I'll stand in uh, support of Citizen Martin Hyde, and I'll stand in support of everything that uh, Commissioner George Cruz had to say. Uh, I don't hear any music in the background right now, so that means the music stopped, and you all are in a seat, and I assume that uh, Commissioner Baugh is sitting someplace, wherever she's at. I see that Acting County Administrator Lee Washington is in a seat. I see that the... Uh, uh, Commissioner, the chair is in the chair seat right now. So for today, 25th of April, we're set. Nobody will make the presumption that you all are beholden to developers. We don't make that presumption, but we all know that developers have an inordinate influence over elections and over county government. That's a given. That's the way things work. Uh, so we have a healthy disinterest and we take a very close look when we look at things that may serve uh, their, their interest. We championed each of you, by we, meaning those that uh, voted for you, in election, and we champion you uh, regularly on many of the things that you attempt to do and the work that you do now that you're elected. Some of you are in your rookie season, some of you are a little bit more seasoned than that. After November of last year, uh, those of you that put you in the seat that you're in, we were not seeking to have conformity, nor did we want to have absence of disagreement. Quite the contrary. We like that. That's good. In America, that's good. But what we did not want to see was to see a continuation of infighting, which has been going on for years. Uh, we did not want to see uh, any of you failing to listen to each other for the purpose of understanding rather than coming up with your argument or defense of your own established position. All too often, that is what we have seen. So and what we mostly wanted was to see that the sensibilities of those, your bosses, we, your employers, uh, would be adhered to. And I would have to say that individually, we still continue to champion. Collectively, you have failed. Collectively, you have failed. The process has failed. You are not exercising the process. And leadership is what needs to make the process work uh, correctly. At this time, and for this person, the timing as Commissioner Cruz pointed out, could not be any worse. Now, it may well be that Mr. Mast is extraordinarily capable at doing the duties of county administrator and interim administrator. We've got somebody that can carry us through. Let the process work the way it was. You're wasting time. You're wasting energy for that. Work on your process. Work on your communications with one another and with the staff. We don't observe that occurring. You and those that advocate for you on a regular basis will be best served, as will the 400-plus thousand citizens of Manatee County. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on the motion on the floor, which is to direct Commissioner Bearden and the county attorney to negotiate with Mr. Mast for an interim county attorney contract? First and last name, county of residence. Three minutes, sir. Glenn Jablina. Glenn Jablina, for the record, are you cut my mic off already? Glenn Jablina, for the record, um, I go along with uh, everyone that, uh, that spoke up here. George, great points. Here's the problem. You promised the citizens of Manatee County a national search. That's what you told us. And it currently is in the process of doing that. What is the message you're sending to all these people that want to look for this job, that you're negotiating a contract for a year, and then maybe we'll think about you? We're spending money on a professional vetting company to look for the best administrator in the country. When you sidestep the process and say, we're just going to go off the reservation and do this, you corrupt 
the system. You corrupt the process. You marginalize your integrity. When you come back with a process like this, it's a slap in the face, not only to the citizens, but to an outstanding employee, Lee Washington, that you have here. This is insane. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. You need to pull this item. There's, there's what it says, okay? So we're going we're gonna to give him, over the summer, everything to do with the county. He doesn't, ha he doesn't have the experience. Now, look, I like John. You know, he's on the Affordable Housing Board, Sarasota County, Manatee, uh, Sarasota County, the city of Sarasota, carpentry shop. I like a lot of things about him. I don't like the way this is going down, and I don't think the rest of these citizens in this country, in this county, appreciate you sidestepping the process of what we're doing. He wants to be county administrator. God bless him. Throw his head in the ring with the professional vetting company that we have. And if he comes out as top dog, give him the job. I don't get it. I don't get it. You just, you are vet, you are sidestepping the process. You're going to bring in more chaos and calamity uh, with this short-term uh, budget meeting coming up. Absolutely insane. This is not in the best interest of the citizens. And if you guys want to be one-term wonders, that's the direction you're going to take if you approve this. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone else would like to come forward? Yes, ma'am. Please state your first and last name, your county of residence, and you have three minutes to address the board on the motion on the floor. Good morning. My name is Stacy Jesse, and I live in Manatee County. Um, it turns out I didn't need to be here today. We've had some great speakers today, and Commissioner Cruz, I think, really covered everything really well that a lot of us are sitting at home really concerned about. Um, I don't think that we should be negotiating a contract with Mr. Mast at this point because the public hasn't had the opportunity to weigh in. Last week this item wasn't on the agenda and it came up. There was no ability for public comment. Last night or sometime yesterday, I was at a lightning game when I realized this was on the agenda. Mr. Mast's salary negotiations are on the agenda. Again, consent, you know, accidentally or whatnot. But there was no time for public comment. Those of us that made it today either, you know, can sit at home all day and just show up when we want or had already made the conscious decision to be here. There needs to be an opportunity for the public to weigh in on a huge decision like this. And there's also a lack of public trust right now. Um, I know a couple months ago, I believe it was the Bradenton Times that reported that Mr. Mast was being considered for this role. And there were three commissioners sitting up there that said this was fake news, that this wasn't true, that Mr. Mast didn't live in the county. And now here we are today looking to hire him as an interim commissioner. Uh, Administrator. I know there's a difference, you know, it's interim, it's not full time, but as we've all seen in the past, an interim often becomes the sitting county administrator for the long term. And so I just think it's really important. We have seven conservatives sitting up here that we championed. The people who've spoken today are all from the same party as you. We championed a lot of you up here. We want you up here and to be a beacon of hope in our county as conservatives. But instead, we're seeing a lack of trust build. And people are questioning whether this is the party that they can trust, that this party has integrity and the honor that's needed to do this job. And we just ask that you consider these things and the optics that are going on with the musical chairs up here and with the sleight of hands when it appears that we have to start taking rumors seriously, that there are commissioners coloring outside the lines and making decisions, staff decisions that aren't theirs. Normally these are things, you know, people are making a mountain out of a molehill, we wouldn't listen. But now no one knows what to listen to because it seems that we're being told different things and then we're told, oh, don't worry about it, and then it's up here without notice. So we just ask that you really give the public a time to comment and to give you our thoughts on these issues. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Th thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to speak or address the board on the motion on the floor? Okay. Seeing no one coming um, forward. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Let me close I'm public sorry. comment. We'll close public comment, and then we will go to Commissioner Baugh. The speaking order is Baugh, Ron, Cruz, and Bearden. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I've sit here, and I've listened to all of you. I've sit here, and I've listened to the citizens. And I want to thank all the citizens, including Martin Hyde, for coming forward with his comments. <clears throat> but I think there are some things that need to be said, and I think I probably am the one that should say them. First of all, let's, let's talk about the Board of County Commissioners for a second. This is a great board. Everyone sitting up there 
I'm not on the dais this morning, but I'm in the meeting. And everyone up there has one thing at heart that they want to do, and that's be a good commissioner to all the residents of Manatee County. And they all want to make good decisions. Some have a little bit more experience than others, but most don't have a lot of experience. They are learning as they go. Our chairman has been a great chairman for the last year and a half. In case people forget, I'm the one that nominated him to be chair this year. There has been some issues, but that doesn't mean that this board is in any way not to be respected. They do have integrity. They're good commissioners. And our chairman is a good chairman. There has been differences. As I said in the meeting, in our last meeting, I would only consider it if it would bring unity to the board because I knew that there were those that had issues. I've heard them, we've all heard them, we all know. It's not a new issue. The problem, and I'm gonna go here, so just Mr. Chairman, if you could just give me a little bit of leadway there, I'd appreciate it. Um, the chairman is trying to do what the majority of the board members want done. The reason that I think most of us voted the other day to just have the county attorney do it is because we didn't want any more issues taking place and we knew that the county attorney could handle this and get it done and bring it back to our board. And it sounds like to me the majority of the issue is the salary and I understand, but at the same time, you know, we do have someone here who has experience. Um, believe it or not, more so than our interim does right now. So, you know, our interim has been wonderful. He took this on, um, you know, without even questioning it. He just took it on. So he's done the best that he could. He's done a good job. He does stick with, uh, I can see Mike Ron back there. I see him very seriously here. Um, you know, the, the administrator has tried to do a great job. Sometimes staff, uh, it's tough for an interim administrator, particularly one that's worked here for many years. Uh, I think that Mr. Washington started right before I got elected, if I'm not mistaken. He's a good man. There's no bad things to be said about the Board of County Commissioners or the interim administrator. I think probably for me, and I can only speak for me, and you know, I, I heard Martin Hyde bring up sunshine. It's always about sunshine. I don't know of any sunshine that's been broken, but I will tell you that the bottom line is, is that we need a strong interim right now. I do believe that. So, you know, I, I also heard that, you know, well, he's good friends with some of us. Well, you know what? I don't know that I would say good friends. I would say that he has been a partner in helping with Manatee County in different areas. Uh, he's obviously very active in Sarasota, more so in Sarasota politically, I might add. However, uh, to hear that, you know, this board is trying to pull something over on somebody, uh, you know, that, oh, we said he wasn't gonna be the administrator. Well, we didn't lie. He's not gonna be the administrator. He can't qualify to be the administrator. He can work in Manatee County, but he cannot be the county administrator. He does not reside in Manatee County. And I can tell you, he will not reside in Manatee County. He's right over the line actually. So according to Florida statute, he cannot and he will not be the permanent administrator. So, Let's not get things blown out of proportion here. You've heard the majority of the board. We do feel that there needs to be a change. I think we've all stated that in one way or another. I, I, am, I, I think what I'm hearing the board say, and I stand by this board 100%, is that the $25,000 extra might be an issue. Okay, you know what? As we did with Scott Hopes, do we need to recess the meeting and that be discussed? with Mr. Mast, who I heard the chairman say is in the audience. I've not talked to him or seen him, obviously, um, but I'm hearing he's there. You know, is it possible? Uh, I don't know. I think it is a great idea to have Commissioner Bearden uh, speak with him with the county attorney. I think that's a step in the right direction and I support that motion. Um, 
but I, I think a lot of the comments that are being thrown out there are, to be honest, not fair to this board. And I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about the other members. It's not fair. They've done a thorough job, they've worked hard, and it's a good board. So show them the respect that they have earned because it might be things behind the scenes that maybe you guys don't know about the citizens. They work this every day, we all do. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Speaking order is Ron, Cruz, and Bearden. Commissioner Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Commissioner Baugh, thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm supporting this motion to bring uh, Commissioner Bearden into the process. I don't have any problem with that. What I do have a problem with is some of the comments that were made insinuating that we're somehow on the take or being taken advantage of or anything like that. I take this job very seriously when I ran. And, you know, you're talking about development. We're going to have over 500,000 residents in this county in seven years. We better be prepared for it. If we're not, we're going to have urban sprawl. It'll be worse than it is today. So we're talking about the developers. Yes, we worked with the developers to come up with a plan, and we'll be sending out our comprehensive plan to everybody out there, all the stakeholders out there to review our, our comprehensive plan. So what I want in an administrator is that we need to have a subject matter expert you know, in position to help a new permanent administrator there, to help doing some of the heavy lifting along with our great developmental, our developmental services staff and Courtney DePaul and her team, and with Charlie Bishop and Public Works. We need somebody out there that can mentor, has been through the process before, holds a master's degree, you know, has experience in Sarasota County government. So he knows how the government works. He knows, and he's been involved in this government many times he's stayed before this board, giving sworn testimony on issues that concern us all, growth, infrastructure, roads, water, sewer, and how we can move our public works forward. So, Mr. Chair, I thank you very much. I'll support this motion, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Sir, please please have a seat. Uh, can you look no, please that? have a seat, sir. The meeting is in progress. You're disrupting a public meeting. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Cruz, and then Commissioner Bearden. Yeah, a week ago this was being done because the current interim county administrator wasn't getting us more information. Now it's being done because we need a subject expert on development. Um, yeah, I, 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 I nominated Commissioner Bearden to to do this uh, as, as opposed to me myself because it doesn't matter what comes back from my contract. I, I'm not going to support it because I don't support the concept of changing out our interim county administrator at this point in time. That's a, a fundamental belief I have. Even if somebody said, I will do this, as, as our former county administrator pretended to say, do it for free. Like, it, it's still it, it not in the best interest of Manatee County to change anybody out. But people, you know, pe people have been burned before here. And I was on the board, and I was, and I made votes uh, to, to support a national search last time this came up and lost those votes. And we didn't do a national search last time. So you can excuse people if you're going to say, I don't appreciate these comments. Their comments are based on fact. Their comments are based on history, and we build the history that they that they base their impression of this board on. So I, I don't fault them for thinking something is potentially going to happen because it has in the past. If you're so damn sure that this new interim county administrator is not going to be our permanent county administrator, put that in the contract. Slap that in that contract that the interim county administrator being hired is prohibited from applying for or accepting the permanent county administrator role in Manatee County. Slap it in there to show everybody out here that that's not the intent of this position in any way, shape, or form. It never will be the position. Put it in there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Bearden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I want to make sure everybody knows that we will be doing that national search, and I will be interviewing people um, for that position, for that permanent position. Um, we needed to bring Mr. Mass in. In my opinion, I looked at us bringing Mr. Mass in because, one, he has an MPA. I don't feel as if our structure is aligned for this organization in order for the Board of County Commissioners to maximize the management moving forward. Um, and when I had a discussion with Mr. Mass, 
that was one thing that we spoke about was how are we going to reorganize the organization? Because right now, what's, how it's being organized is just not working. So with his expertise and him coming on board, he was going to, one of the things was he, he was going to be able to help with was a reorganization of the whole organization. What I mean by that is I look at things from a military standpoint. CO, XO, company commanders, so on, so that we can manage this process in a whole lot smoother, a whole lot better way. Right now, it's not working. I just want the public to know that. So, and if it's not working, guess what? It's costing us millions upon millions of dollars every day that we can't get this right. So that's why this is necessary. This is important for us to do this. So with his expertise, having that MPA degree, right, he's going to be able to help with that. But as the rest of the board said, we'll put it in the contract where he's not going to be the permanent county administrator. First off, his wife is running in Sarasota County. And if she happens to win, they can't move out of Sarasota County. Okay, so I want the public to understand that this is the reason why our process is thinking in regards to moving forward um, with Mr. Mass, a possibility of moving forward with Mr. Mass. So that's, that's my thinking behind it. We're an immediate, um, important time frame right now to, to, to ensure that we get this done. Thank you, sir. There's no one else on the board. Uh, we've held public comment. Commissioner Baugh, did you have any statement you'd like to make before we hold the vote? No, sir, I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then we can, ca commissioners, we can cast our votes at this time. Commissioner Baugh, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. And Madam Clerk, the motion passes unanimously by a vote of seven to zero. All right, thank you, commissioners. Uh, three minutes till. We will move on then to awards, presentations, and proclamations. We'll start, number one is adoption. We'll, we'll start with a, uh, a motion to adopt proclamations at this time. So we have a motion by Commissioner Ron to adopt, seconded by Commissioner Cruz. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Baugh. Hi. Yes. Sorry. Madam Clerk. Aye. That's right. Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously by a vote of seven to zero. We'll start with the first proclamation, which is Arbor Day. Commissioner Bearden will be presenting adoption of proclamation designating April 28th, 2023 as National Arbor Day in Manatee County, Florida. Wonderful. So I get to present National Arbor Day. Awesome. Proclamation, Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Florida. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this day, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas Trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. And whereas trees, wherever they're planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, that April 28, 2023, shall be known, designated, and set aside as National Arbor Day in Manatee County, Florida, 
All citizens are urged to support efforts to protect our trees and our woodlands and to support our city's urban forestry program. And all citizens are urged to plant trees to promote the well-being of, of present and future generations and enhance our community. Adopted with a quorum present and voting this 25th day of April, 2023. Board of County Commissioners, Manatee County, Manatee County Florida, Chair Kevin Van Osterbridge. Thank you, sir. Who is here to accept the proclamation? I guess I was, yeah. All right, step right up to the microphone, I mean, sir, and <laughs> say a couple of words. You, you certainly have the correct outfit. I had a feeling you were the guy. Oh, yeah. Yes, has sir. To be me. So, yeah, as we plan for celebrating Arbor Day, I think it's important to reflect on the benefits that trees provide in natural areas and in the urban hardscapes. And I think as we plan for the future, it will be important to work collectively and to embrace modern urban forestry infrastructure to ensure that we have a vigorous, a diverse urban canopy moving forward. So that's it, yeah, happy Arbor Day, guys. Thanks. All right, yes, happy Arbor Day. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hunsaker. Thank you, uh, and thank you. It was Richard Larson with the Forestry Service. And I wanted to uh, also compliment uh, the board and their support that you have given the Natural Resources Department, the Sports and Leisure Services Department, and, other, and Property Management Parks Maintenance Department in supporting a tree canopy throughout Manatee County. I, I say it with some degree of pride that while Nebraska planted one million trees on that day of proclamation, you have, you have allowed us to plant 1.4 million trees at DeWitt alone uh, within Manatee County. So we're taking our strides and we're taking our roles as well. And thank you again for your support uh, throughout the year. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. All right. Our next uh, is a presentation, and it is a presentation of Certificate of Recognition to Dr. Deborah Gons Gonsher Vinick. And Commissioner Ballard will be presenting. So today we do have a certificate of recognition from the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, Florida, which is presented to Dr. Deborah goncher Vinick for presenting and sharing the documentary to the Manatee County community addressing opioid addiction and the disparity toward women titled Attention Must Be Paid on April 27th. 2023 at the Manatee County Boys and Girls Club for raising awareness to the cause and impact opioids have on our local community and the struggles faced through the documentary and study of the, of the lives of those impacted and their families, for raising the level of consciousness to the need of funding and accessibility of Narcan as a form of support to those in crisis with the understanding that every life counts. This certificate is presented to Dr. Deborah goncher this 25th day of April, 2023, in recognition of her many contributions to our community. And I, I will say, uh, as, I, as I say often, working in the world of child welfare, I've, I've seen firsthand the uh, impact that opioids have had on, on women and, and young mothers in our community. And, um, and thank you to uh, Dr. gosner Vinick for uh, raising awareness on this important issue. Are you here to accept? Thank yes, you very much. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? Just a couple, if it's okay. Thank you. Absolutely. So indeed, on uh, April 27th, this upcoming Thursday, um, at 6 o'clock at the Boys and Girls Club um, on 30th Street, we'll be hosting the video uh, that she had documentary that she has put together on the access uh, for women specifically. Um, and we invite everyone to be there. Um, it is definitely going to be an opportunity for us as an organization and as a community to reflect on this topic. Um, and the opportunity for folks to be able to have dialogue and to take, you know, some real necessary and needed action. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone there. And thanks to the commissioners, all the commissioners, for supporting us in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ballard. Okay. We will then move on to citizen comments on future agenda items. This is a 30-minute maximum for this. So if there is anyone who would like to come forward to speak, we have three people who have signed up. Uh, starting with advocate Glenn Gibellina. Is he gone? Okay, well, then we'll move on to Denise uh, Ellswick. So future agenda items is for comments on items that are not on today's agenda, but they may appear before this board on a future agenda. So 
like the other items, you'll have three minutes to address the board on something that may or appear before the board or you would like to see appear before the board on a future agenda. If you are here to speak on a specific agenda item, we will call your item, we will call public comment when we deal with your item. Ma'am, please say your first and last name, your county of residence. You have three minutes to address the board on a future agenda item. Denise Ellswick, and I live in Manatee County. I've been here, living here since 1979, raised my children and my grandchildren, and I am happy to speak about this issue. Basically, I want to thank the board and recognize the fact that you make difficult decisions and you have a challenging job, in the, especially in this area. And that area is the environmental concerns and the water quality of the water in our county. And so what I would request is that for any comprehensive plan or code changes, that you would put the environment first and err on the side of caution. Because what you leave as a legacy will we'll go on for our children and our grandchildren. And just think about that when you're making those decisions. And I know that you'll do the right thing. And that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Andrew Griffin. I don't see her here. Andrew Griffin. OK, then we'll open this up to the floor. Is there anyone who would like to come forward to address the board on a future agenda? I, oh, Mr. Gibellina, you are here. You did sign up. I called your name, sir. Oh, I was out there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. First and last name, your county of residence, three minutes. For the record, Glenn Jablina, I sent you all this email that uh, I put on the board to try I to need the overhead display. Thank you. Always try to uh, give you guys a heads up. So we'll talk about parking. The BOCC should collaborate with NDC on the post office. They got a 99 year lease at 10 bucks a year. What a sweet deal. That was for them with the city. So you should negotiate with them. Uh, the, cur the current garage, tear it all down, get a largest footprint as you can, do some mixed use on the floor, four to six levels of parking, affordable housing on the top. Let's talk about the jail. We were ready to move forward to do that to uh, transitional housing for vets. Back in 2016, Bernard Karn came through and said, you know what, we could put Affordable rental apartments there. I looked at that thing. They spent about 25,000 bucks putting that together. And it was only shot down because of, because of the security system that the judges didn't feel uh, comfortable with. But we should go back and put affordable housing in the jail. It's doable. They had the plans. I sent it to all you guys a couple years ago. And his last line was, he hopes to bring affordable housing to bring the Millennium's homes. We should be able to work where we live. You wonder why we got a tra traffic jam? That's why. Uh, renewable energy policy, where is it? Because I haven't seen it. Uh, tiny home, tiny homes, let's talk about that. You know, it, it amazes me, we don't, we don't have any contingencies. You guys can rezone 5,000 houses in a heartbeat and we can't get tiny homes on, a, on an infill lot. So why don't we let, here, let me let. So, help me understand the logic on the tiny homes. If someone can build, the upper, the upper photo is a eight bath, six bedroom, 5,000 square foot house. But on the same lot, we can't put six affordable tiny homes that use less resources under the same, under the same thing. The large house, three quarter inch water line, sewer, septic, the whole nine yards. You're not putting any more when you put six tiny houses. Those people wanna be able to live affordably. That's why they live in tiny houses. And I think you should let the neighbors decide. We got, a, we got a lot, we have an acre lot. Oh, you're gonna devalue us. Well, guess what? If I go to them and say, you got your choice neighbors, I'm gonna put a eight bedroom, eight bath house and make it a, a party Airbnb 24 seven, I'll disrupt your neighborhood, or we can put six tiny homes in and put affordable housing, seniors, folks that work at home. We need form-based code. You need to bend a little bit so these damn people have a place to live affordably. And we're not there yet. We haven't been there. 
for the record, Gwen Jibalena. Thank you, sir. Sometimes I find it really hard to argue with you. Um, is there anyone else opening this up to the floor? Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to speak or address the board on a future agenda item? Ma'am, first and last name, County of Residence. You have three minutes to address the board on a future agenda item. Good morning, Stacy Jesse, Manny County. And I just realized today is May 25th. If you don't know, it's a perfect date. The weather's not too hot, it's not too cold, and all you need is a light jacket. And if you've never seen that movie, then you're missing out. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Ballard got it. Uh, I just wanted to talk again about um, accountability and transparency. Um, we'd like to see more public notice. There have been a lot of things showing up on the agenda that, that aren't out there in a timely manner for people to give written comment or for people to plan in their schedules to get here. Um, rules and procedures for the Board of the County Commissioners, um, it says in 4.4.4, .4, items not in the agenda. Matters that do not require separate, separate public notice may, without objection of the majority of the commissioners present, be considered and acted upon at any regular or special board meeting pursuant to an amendment to the agenda adopted by a majority vote of the board. Commissioners should not, however, bring matters forward for action by the board without placing them on the agenda pursuant to section 4.4.2, except when there is an urgent and unforeseeable need for board action. Um, and so there's just a lot of concern. I know that sometimes things come up and there's no time, but it feels like a lot of these things should be noticed so that we can weigh in, so that you can hear what constituents think, what people want to write in and say. And so that was my only comment, just that if we could find, you know, find a way to really give timely notice so that people can comment, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board? Yes, sir, this is your opportunity on a, an item that you'd like to see the board take up on a future agenda. Oh. First, please state your first and last name and what Rito county you DeMonte. live in. I live in uh, Manatee, yes, sir. Manatee County. And the reason why I'm here for the same reason, I've been here the last three and a half years. And I don't see why you guys don't give up and do what you're supposed to do. Do your job. Your job. Sir, can you please explain to me what the law and fences are? I have a paper that you denied me the last time because I had it on the phone. Now, I went upstairs the last time. I came down. I was not allowed to see. Can you read this to yourself? What does it say? Please explain to me what the fence law is and swale. This is upstairs. I got it from upstairs. What does it mean? Please tell me. Nobody talks. You guys make the law, and I went upstairs to get the law. Now you guys don't know what the hell is going on. I want to know, as a, a citizen, as an American citizen, for 48 years, I'm ashamed to be in front of you that you don't even know the law. I am ashamed. What are you? A, a, a soldier? Soldier? What's the other soldier? You guys are soldier of the country? And you don't have an answer for me? Where do I get this answer, sir? Where do I go? I'm entitled. I have rights. Where do I go, sir? Chair? Number one? Where do I go? There's no answer from you? Sir, you've been here six times. You know the board does not dialogue with you and during you have a QA session during your comment. Okay, this is your then chance you tell me to address where's the board. my where's my commissioner? Why can't he do his job? My commissioner, he chose to be the commissioner. I didn't choose him. Why can't he do his job then? Why can't he tell me what's what can I do in my backyard? Where is the law? Where do I get the law? Right here. And now what? You don't care. You don't need to answer, right? What a bunch of morons. You're a bunch of morons. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank you, you are your, a moron. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone moron. else? Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board at this time? Okay, seeing no one, we're going to close citizen comment on future agenda items, and we're going to move on to the consent agenda, and we'll need a motion pulled up to approve consent minus item number 10, which was removed and voted on separately. So we need a motion to approve consent minus item 10. 
The motion has been made by Commissioner Ballard. I'll second it to raise the sleep. And has been seconded by Commissioner Van Austin Bridge. Um, so we'll open public comment for consent items. Is there anyone who would like to come forward to make public comment on consent at this time? Anyone who would like to make public comment on the consent agenda? All right, seeing no one, we're going to close public comment on consent. There's no one on the board for discussion or debate, so we can cast our votes on consent now, minus item number 10. Mr. Chairman, I'm a yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so it passes unanimously, it passes unanimously by a vote of six to zero with Commissioner Ron absent. Okay, that takes care of consent. There's a lot on consent, so give me just a second here. Okay, we will then move on. We have completed J and K, so we will move on to L, which is public hearings, presentation upon request. We'll start with natural resources. And this is adoption of ordinance 23-082, amending section 2-25-55E1 of the Manatee County Code of Ordinances to revise the terms of members of the Environmental Lands Management and Acquisition Committee representing each county commissioner district. Um, this is presentation upon request. Do we want a, a quick overview or a quick explanation? For the public, I think it's a good idea. Mr. Hunsaker, if you just give us the uh, synopsis, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Charlie Hunsaker, Director of Parks and Natural Resources Department, Non-Natural Resources Department. I wanted to uh, give you an idea that uh, this ordinance is coming forward with commission request to amend our LMAC staffing and volunteer position um, organization. Uh, at the, at the, excuse me, let me get my thoughts here for a second. At the, uh, sorry. <laughs> so um, my understanding is in a nut, well, Commissioner Cruz, why don't you take it? Yeah, my, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, just to, to speed this along since it's a point of request, is we, we have a lot of people, 15 people on the LMAC board, seven of them are appointed individually by the seven board of county commissioners. We get to pick anybody we want within our district, myself and, and Commissioner Bearden get to pick anyone in the county. When we first structured this, because that was a new piece to it, we didn't consider the terms of our seats. So there are certain people on the LMAC board today that were appointed by people who are no longer on this LMAC board, and some of the newer commissioners wanted the ability to select their own person for their own seat. So we were going to modify the ordinance to make the seats more coterminous with the seats on this board, although they're not 100% because it's a max three-year term for the, the LMAC board and it's a max four-year term here. So th there's still some cleanup, but that's the, the gist of what this is. That's right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And he included the word coterminous, so you can't go wrong. Um, okay, is there any discussion on that? I mean, it was kind of cut and dry. We've discussed it before. No? Okay. Commissioner Baugh, do you have any comments? No, sir. Okay. Thank we'll, you. We'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to address the board on item number 40 on today's agenda? Item number 40, public comment. Okay, seeing no one coming forward, we'll close public comment. And there's no one on the board for discussion, so we can cast our votes. I'm a yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously by a vote of six to zero with Commissioner Ron absent. I apologize. The motion was to approve was made by Commissioner Satcher, and it was seconded by Commissioner Bearden. We'll move on to item number 41. Thank you, Mr. Hunsaker. We'll move on to item number 41, adoption of Ordinance 23-68, prohibiting engine compression release braking on Televast Road from US 301 to Lockwood Ridge Road. Right. Presentation upon request. Does anyone need a presentation on this? I will always vote for this. So okay. I already made a motion. So a motion has been made to approve by Commissioner Cruz it has been seconded by Commissioner Satcher. We'll open this item up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to address the board on item number 41 on today's agenda, which is prohibiting engine compression release braking on Televast from 301 to Lockwood Ridge. Sir, first and last name, county of residence. You have three minutes to address the board on this item. Glenn Jablana for the record. So I did look over that ordinance. I'm a little confused. You know, as, as you pass these things and 
different areas or you get complaints from neighbors and that's why you pass it. Wouldn't it be easier just to make it countywide and just approve the places they can do yes. that? Absolutely. Right? I mean, we're, we're, we're piecemealing this. So everybody comes and do, does a complaint. Just make it countywide. Second. Okay. We, we done dialogue during public comment. <laughs> is, there, is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on item number 41 on today's agenda? Okay, seeing no one, we're going to close public comment. <clears throat> Mr. Davis, I'm going to ask you to come down. Mr. Davis, I'm going to ask you to come down to the microphone. Mr. Cruz, Commissioner Cruz is on the board. He's probably going to ask the same exact thing I'm Feel wanting to ask. We'll go to Commissioner Cruz. I just, uh, you, you could talk, it's going to be the same thing. Can we look into this? Can we just look into making this countywide and have people come to us and selectively allow for it? Um, yes, it's something we've considered at a staff level. Um, it, we need to look into it a little bit. There's certain roads where we, for example, the state highway system where we can't regulate it, but I mean, we can craft our, our code to, to recognize that. Um, the, the question we've struggled with internally is, is how do you choose when to post and not to post and, and make sure everybody knows, you know, this is have, a no date to come county, to us to, what we'd be telling. It would have to be presented to us to post as opposed to what we're doing now is presenting to us what not to and, and to remove, correct? Um, to, right oh. now, the default is there, well, people should take, if people were polite, they would take into consideration where they're operating their vehicles and they wouldn't do jake breaking in, in residential areas. And so right now there's no restriction anywhere except those locations that we've listed by ordinance. And so every time we bring one of these to you, it's to identify a road segment and specific limits where uh, the jake breaking is not allowed. Commissioner Cruz, if I may, I think what you're wanting is you, you would like staff to, or Clark, to develop a map essentially of the, the routes, arterials, and you know major connectors where thoroughfares, where jake breaking is allowed. But say overall, the, we're a blanket no jake break county with the exception of these thoroughfares. That's, that's generally the direction you want to go. With. Um, Mr. Clegg, I see you're on the board, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ruin Commissioner, some, I'm not sure we can do that because of the uh, issue that Clark has identified. When you get into court, on these issues, judges often scrutinize whether or not the signage on the roads has put people on notice. And that's, that's I think, the issue that staff has struggled with. So we'd have to figure out practically how we could, how we could provide the signage for that and meet the standard to which judges hold us. And that's, that may, that's that may be the case. I'm just looking for them to look into it. I understand. Yes, sir. So could we, with, without a vote, could, could you accept this as direction from the board? Sure, unless there to is... look into it. I just wanted the board right, to be aware there Clark could be a legal to work issue. on that and yeah. get back to us? Sure. Okay, any objection? Okay. Um, then, Clark, there you, I'm sure you have, have nothing, to, nothing do. to do with your day, so <laughs> now you'll keep yourself entertained with Jake breaking. Yes. <laughs> Please don't let it interfere with the progress of road building uh, <laughs> or road expansion. Um, all right, thank you, sir. Um, then we've held public comment. Uh, there's no one on the board for discussion, so we can cast our votes now. Commissioner Baugh? I am a yes. Thank you. Commissioner Baugh votes yes. Uh, the motion, by the way, was uh, to approve by Commissioner Cruz, was seconded by Commissioner Satcher. Uh, the other commissioners are yeses as well, and it is approved unanimously by a vote of six to zero with Commissioner Ron absent. Uh, yes, so the next item is, will be probably lengthy, and it's 1023, so we will take a 10-minute recess at this time. We're in recess.
along here through our, our regular meeting today. We are on number item item number, excuse me, 42, which is an administrator item. It's discussion of veteran transitional housing. And I will turn this item over to our deputy administrator, excuse me, our acting county administrator, Mr. Lee Washington, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, this item uh, has been one that we've talked about for quite some time and in an effort to address the, the board's concern as well as the community's concern over affordable housing and homelessness, but specific to this item, veteran housing. We do have the organizations of Tunnels to Towers and U.S. Vets to present formally to the entire board um, their idea of bringing um, housing for homeless veterans to Manatee County. We also have in support of this item uh, Manatee County staff from FMD and Property Management. So I'd like to now turn it over to Mr. Gavin Naples, Tunnels and Towers Foundation. Thank you, Commissioner Washington. Uh, Commission, thank you very much uh, for allowing us the time to speak on this issue. Um, our foundation, uh, the Tunnels to Towers Foundation, uh, began out of the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on New York City. Firefighter Stephen Siller, was uh, one of 12 and an orphan himself who was off duty the morning of September 11th. He got the call that the first tower had been hit uh, and he drove his car to the base of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn, which was closed to vehicular traffic. He got out of his car, put 63 pounds of gear onto his back and ran nearly five miles through the tunnel into the South Tower and uh, died saving others uh, in the South Tower and was never recovered. From that sacrifice, over the last 20 years, the Tunnel to Towers Foundation has provided over 1,000 homes uh, to our nation's heroes, uh, our catastrophically injured service members all throughout the nation, uh, the families of fallen first responders, which encompass police officers, firefighters, and EMT workers, as well as the families of uh, Gold Star members uh, with small children who don't return home from war. Our newest program seeks to eradicate homelessness and. Uh, those veterans that are at risk of homelessness, uh, nearly 38,000 nationwide, and our approach is two-pronged. Our uh, foundation has identified key uh, metro areas throughout the United States where the rates of homelessness and in turn veteran homelessness are highest, and we are developing campuses and communities for permanent supportive housing, uh, safe and dignified quality affordable housing, as well as wraparound 24-7 supportive services. Uh, that address the root causes of veteran homelessness. Uh, we found very early on it's not enough to just provide a housing accommodation to a veteran in need. You need to address these root causes to effectively rehabilitate and reintegrate veterans back into society. That is our ultimate objective here. Outside of the key metro areas where we're developing uh, these campuses, we have an internal team of case managers where anywhere in the United States where a veteran is experiencing homelessness, they can call our team. We will provide them with financial assistance to get them housed in safe and dignified housing accommodations, uh, work with the local VA and applicable jurisdictions to get them their vouchers that they need for long-term sustainable housing. And once that crisis element has been lifted from their life temporarily and they can take a deep breath, we've aggregated a national resource network of VA agents and public and private organizations and attorneys and landlords and mental health uh, counselors and employment specialists uh, that can work to help these veterans with those root causes. And it's on a case-by-case -case basis and we diagnose these root causes for the veteran and work to, uh, to overcome those barriers uh, that they experience to uh, reintegrating them into civilian life. Um, so with that, our uh, plan as it pertains to uh, Bradenton, uh, the property at uh, 4530 West 66th Street on Bradenton, uh, here is the site plan in which we are proposing an 84-unit modular complex that we will construct for permanent housing for veterans. On the first floor, there will be the comprehensive uh, supportive service component implemented by our service partners, U.S. Vets, 24-7 uh, security at the site, and then uh, a development of comfort homes around the site, uh, what you know as tiny homes. These are about twice the size, 500 square feet in aggregate uh, for permanent housing for veterans. So uh, just to assuage any concerns as to uh, the caliber, the caliber or quality of what our organizations provide or the um, track record of each. Uh, these are some national joint projects between Tunnel to Towers and U.S. Vets. 
in West uh, Los Angeles, California, on March Air Force Base, uh, you, the Veterans Collective, which is U.S. Vets, Thomas Saffron Associates, and uh, Century Housing alongside the VA has uh, revitalized a campus uh, previously deeded by Abraham Lincoln uh, to the VA back in the 1800s that will once completed, be uh, the largest site in the United States for homeless veterans, housing over 3,000 homeless veterans with 24-7 supportive services. This is the full campus of West LA. In Phoenix, Arizona, through our partners uh, with US Vets, uh, we're revitalizing a 150-room uh, hotel uh, in the Phoenix, uh, Arizona area for permanent housing uh, and, and some transitional housing with supportive service model for veterans. These are the interior renderings. The quality uh, as to the construction is always uh, consistent with what Tunnel to Towers provides. In Houston, Texas, this is a hotel that we're revitalizing. These images were taken about six months ago. And we're comp uh, anticipating completing this project uh, in August of this year. It will provide permanent housing uh, as well as some transitional for uh, hundreds of veterans in the Houston area. These are the interior renderings of what the sites will be, the permanent housing with the addition of kitchenettes. Everyone has their own bathroom. And the interior common area spaces where the supportive service offices uh, will take place, the wraparound uh, supportive services implemented by U.S. Vets. The interior schematic design of the hotel, this will mimic uh, the 84 unit complex we're proposing in Bradenton uh, with permanent residential housing on the top floors and then the first floor is a complete suite of the supportive services for employment, family reintegration, uh, mental health counseling, uh, rehabilitation, um, and all of the other supportive services that the veteran needs. This is what we've been approved for in Houston, Texas. Uh, the left side of the screen is uh, the campus of Comfort Homes that we are uh, going to be implementing uh, within the next year. These Comfort Homes uh, are geared towards permanent housing as well as housing for an older class of veteran that may have a little bit more uh, difficulty reintegrating into society and are looking for a permanent place of safe and dignity, uh, safety and dignity to call home, as well as you know the proximity to the supportive services uh, that are directly on site. This is a U.S. Vets site in Riverside, California, on March Air Force Base. Uh, provided housing for hundreds of veterans currently on the existing building. Uh, this is what we're proposing uh, and what we're implementing now on a fourth phase of the campus be 44 of these quote unquote comfort homes as well as a modularly uh, constructed building in the, in the center for the supportive service component. There's some renderings of what the homes will ultimately look like. And this is the image uh, of the comfort home once completed. I'm now going to turn it over to the COO of uh, U.S. Vets, Daryl Vincent, to discuss the supportive service housing model um, implemented by U.S. Vets. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. It's my extreme pleasure to be here this afternoon. I actually flew in from Hawaii last the last couple of days. I'm, I'm a Hawaii resident. And we have one of our programs out there. My boss is Steve Peck, Gregory Peck's son. He's a Marine Corps veteran, so am I. And Marines always take the toughest duty, so I took Hawaii <laughs> to be the one that I did. Um, U.S. Vets has been around for 30 years. We consider us, we're the number one veteran homeless service provider in the nation. So, I'm sorry, Daryl Vincent, Chief Operating Officer of U.S. Vets. We're the number one and the largest homeless veteran service provider in the nation. Uh, our job is to work ourselves out of a job. And before I get into the slides, I want to make clear, I think we all can agree for veterans and families of veterans, we all suffer an indignity when our women and men are sleeping on the same streets that he or she was once asked to defend. And our job is to make sure that never happens again. So it started 30 years ago with Judge Harry Ferguson, who was a retired World War II veteran. He wanted to help veterans, and he got a college campus in Inglewood, California with a developer, and they decided to do services. In order to do those services, they just Covered, they needed a nonprofit arm to get grants. And after that, the momentum blew up that we were able to go in different locations that I'll talk about in a minute. And we serve more than 5,500 veterans on any given night uh, are sleeping on our campuses across the nation. Our mission and core values, we make sure that we want to eradicate homelessness among veterans. 
We want to instill hope, embody loyalty, prioritize our partnerships, and we want to make sure that we pursue excellence. Uh, we'll talk about all the services we do, but we believe our number one service is instilling hope. Our locations are as such, Inglewood, California, where it started, Long Beach, California, Houston, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, Phoenix, Arizona, Prescott, Arizona, Barbers Point, Hawaii, Inland Empire, Washington, D.C., Waianae, Hawaii. We have a patriotic hall, Richmond, Virginia, West Los Angeles, and Ventura, California. I have the honor to serve over the executive directors of each one of these locations and to visit these locations to ensure the operations are operating correctly for our transitional and permanent housing for veterans in the community. So our program service model is that we have residential services and non-residential programs. In the interest of time, I won't read over every single one, but to give you a synopsis, our residential programs have transitional structure programs that allow veterans to enter who are experiencing homelessness and get the treatment they need, whether it be mental health, substance abuse, getting back to work, whatever their need is, we triage them and do that. Although this project is not transitional housing, it's important to know that those services are always offered to those in transitional or permanent housing. We have a women's program across the campuses. We have men's programs across the campuses. Emergency housing, we can triage veterans and they don't know what the next step is, but they can stay with us overnight so they can get off the streets. We take a housing first approach. We have permanent supportive housing, which is that this project is, and we have long-term supportive housing. We also do prevention. A veteran who needs to pay their rent living in their house, they can't pay it, we can help pay their rent and case manage them so they don't have to become homeless. We can continue to tackle homelessness, but we also have to tackle by prevention so we can cut off the faucet of veterans experiencing homelessness. We make sure we do workforce development. Every year we employ over 800 to 1,000 veterans across the nation. Sometimes the misnomer is all veterans are not going back to work or are disabled of mental health and substance abuse. We make it a priority to get veterans back on their feet and get them back into employment. We also make sure that we do veterans on point. Women's veterans on point is our digital outreach to people. In this new day age, we have to make sure that veterans can reach us online and get with us to get those counseling services that they so need. And then we have aftercare programs. Aftercare so any veteran in our program can actually get care after they leave our programs. All of these services I'm saying are encompasses on our campuses and would be in this project even if it wasn't transitional housing. So our services are as such. We call it a continuum of care, outreach. I think everyone thinks of traditional outreach of going out into the communities and finding veterans that are homeless or at risk of homelessness. That is correct. But outreach is also reaching out to veterans getting out of the military that are making a transition. We see many veterans that are getting out of their first enlistment or even after retiring need to transition to back into civilian society and have a job that can sustain them, have a home that can sustain them. Our job is to reach out to them digitally and by going out and reaching communities and working with the bases to ensure the veterans know where they can go when they get out of the military so they do not experience homelessness. We have case management where they're assigned a social worker, such as myself, and can work with the veteran to ensure their needs are being met. In addition to employment assistance, benefits assistance, education, financial, legal advocacy, we make sure that we have medical care by contracting with CNA, certified nurses assistants, and community partners to come in and take care of those veterans that have that need. We take care of the basic need support. Most importantly, we are working where they live. So we want to make sure that we're there to support them in all their needs and all the services you see listed are what we consider to be wraparound services. In short, we make a campus approach. So in this project, it's not just us on the campus, it's the veterans helping one another. No matter what branch they were in, they have a commonality of going through a branch of service, whether they served in combat or not. So putting them together and having us facilitate that process and readapting them to a structured way of living, but living independently, allows them to work with each other with peer-to-peer -peer support. We have a saying, leave no veteran behind, leave no soldier behind, leave no Marine Corps person behind. The reality is we want to make sure that each veteran is supporting each other in this campus to ensure that they're getting the services they need so they can live and sustain themselves. We do this through a therapeutic community approach where they have a veteran council, they participate in their recovery. We don't do things to them or for them. We do things with them. That means they are taking, empower themselves because the best way to take away someone's dignity is to do for them what they can do for themselves. So we want to facilitate the process of them taking care of themselves on this campus. We want to make sure that we are outcome driven. Everyone that comes to our campus, we want to ensure that they stay in their campus, they're paying their rent, and they're participating in the employment and actually uplifting the community they live. Many of the reasons why people sometimes are against these projects, because they believe it brings the value down, they believe it brings crime or brings drug addiction or mental health. When we go into communities, we get involved with the neighborhood board. We get involved with the police. We get involved with the fire station. We get involved with the VA. We get involved with the political to ensure that we're having a safe community 
and uh, veterans are policing each other, for lack of a better word. They're taking care of each other on the campus with the 24-7 care that the staff is providing. We do it from a client-centered approach, which means their thoughts, their beliefs, their feelings come first, and then we provide that structure around them to ensure that they do what they need to do. I won't list off all the partnerships, but every community we go into, we ensure that we go at every campus we do partnerships. We have major partnerships across the nation with Home Depot, different foundations, with the Warriors Project, obviously our number one partner is Tunnel to Towers when it comes to this development. Every, every entity we go to, we partner with the Department of Veteran Affairs to make sure we have grants and they're accessing the services. If anyone, I know we have veterans on the commission and probably in the audience, we all know that sometimes navigating the VA can be a challenge to say the least. Our job is to make sure that they can navigate that system. We have, we're able to make calls to those people and get them in to get their appointments, to make sure that we drive them to their appointments and make sure they're keeping their appointments. One of the biggest savings we see is when veterans stop using the emergency room as their primary care physicians. When people are home, experiencing homelessness or at risk in homelessness, sometimes some simple prevention of medical care that we provide in conjunction with the VA can bring the cost down dramatically in cities and counties that are existing so they don't use the emergency room just as a place to get help when they can do preventive things for high blood pressure, diabetes, wound care, and all those type of things that go on with us day to day where we see our primary care physician for those things. So our approach is making sure they have those services. Since 1993, we have engaged over 179,000 veterans through outreach and have 67,000 veterans have placed in the home and 17,000 veterans into employment. So it's not just about rehabilitation with substance abuse and mental health. It's actually getting back to gainful employment, employment as well. We've had nationwide impact to sitting in your packet of how many veterans we serve on a nightly basis, how many meals we serve, all those substances things that keep the veteran employed and make sure that they are taking care of themselves. And then our agency outcomes every year, although we can talk about the outputs, I think it's important to have the outcomes. And I want to focus just on a few things in the slide if I can have your attention to this. Forget all the numbers and all this update, that's all the services we got. We're talking about permanent supportive housing for this project. In every one of those cases, it's over 90% retain their permanent housing. That means when they move into our housing, they stay in their housing, and they pay their rent in their housing. And so the ultimate transition, then we ab absolutely have the next room for them to come in and move on so veterans can get the care. It is important that we just don't put people in housing, but we wrap the services around them so they can stay in their housing. We will continue our mission until no veteran is sleeping on the streets to hear she was once asked to defend. This project will allow us to house veterans with a partnership with Tunnel to Towers, put them in a permanent housing setting like they have a lease like any other person sitting in this room. It's a step up. It's not just for homeless veterans. It's for at-risk veterans as well. Many veterans are couch surfing, sleeping place to place. It'd be nice for us to give them a home. It'd be a mixed milieu. It's not just homeless veterans who we want to serve ultimately, but it's at-risk veterans as well, because you want to have a mixture just like any other community. U.S. Vets will stay in this partnership, and we make sure that we have the proper staff on board 24-7, a project director, clinical social workers, case management, and partnerships to ensure that we're up and holding our end of the bargain to make sure these veterans are taken care of in such a beautiful facility the Tunnel to Towers would be working with you on, hopefully, to make available for these veterans. I want to thank you for your time, and obviously we'll be answering any questions uh, as deemed necessary. Yes, sir. Thank you. Does that conclude the presentation? Okay. It does not, Mr. Chair. Um, if the board has questions for these agencies before staff steps up, we can do that. It's really up to the, the I think, board. I think we should. Yes, sir. So, Commissioner Cruz, you're first on the board. I don't have questions specific to them, no. Okay, I have a couple quick questions. I'm next on the board. Um, so one would be, um, does MacDill offer anything similar to this, MacDill Air Force Base? You mentioned that other Air Force, that other um, military bases offer, you know, land for similar programs. I was wondering, is there anything offered at MacDill? In, in terms of MacDill, uh, not that we're aware of. Currently. Okay. Um, Will there be any sort of residency requirement, meaning Manatee County residency requirement involved? Uh, clear, uh, you know, as we've discussed, we want to go where the, the, the need is greatest. Uh, sure. There's not necessarily a, a residency requirement as to that. We want to uh, obviously maximize uh, the utilization of the site and provide housing for as many individuals as we can within, you know, the confines of what the campus entails. Okay, in terms of need, what is the need in Manatee County? Do we have a, a census of number of how many homeless veterans we have? 
So there's over, uh, to, to my last uh, understanding, there's over 2,400 uh, homeless veterans in the state of Florida, and with the uh, concentration of Manatee County and surrounding uh, areas, uh, it's in the hundreds, uh, over 200, I believe. Okay. Um, so let's, let's leave out the word requirement then and say preferential or preference to Manatee County residents. Is there any sort of, I mean, it's, it's your platform, right? It's your, it's your organization. So I'm asking you, when you go in, I can't be the first community to ask this question, right? When you come into our community, will the residents of our community rece receive any sort of preference over folks who are moving here, who were uh, essentially moving here for the program, which I, I, I have nothing against. But my question is, is I want to make sure that my residents are served first. I represent them. That's my, it's my job. So what, what can you do to make me feel better? <laughs> no, no, ab absolutely. Um, uh, clearly, this is why, you know, we've chosen this area and, and it, because this is where the need is. So, yes, the, you know, obviously it will be preferenced. And then if we've uh, accomplished our mission and there's still uh, spaces available, we'll, we, we will then branch out. Uh, okay. So we, we're going to – the idea would be to start with Manatee County residents and then branch out, what, to, to contiguous counties? Or uh, statewide. Correct. I mean, what is what is the plan? No, contiguous counties as as the need arises. But yes, uh, to okay. answer your question, Manatee will be okay. Uh, and then you you mentioned rent as well. Um, can you explain how you've you've set that up? Is is rent for only those who are in permanent housing? Is it for those who are in transitional housing? And then how how are you coming up with this number? So I'll, I'll give a brief overview, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Daryl. Uh, the structure is that we've been working with Manatee County um, as to, uh, you know, affordable housing designation to stay within those uh, confines. Uh, the veteran is expected to pay 30 percent of their income, whether that's $20 a month or $700 a month, uh, and then we would stay within uh, whatever vouchers are uh, released by the county or applicable jurisdiction to cover that deficit within the guidelines, uh, you know, of affordable housing. Um, if a veteran comes in with absolutely no income, uh, the foundation has the ability uh, to provide housing to them, uh, you know, f f for nothing, and then work with them to get, you know, their, their uh, available vouchers, and there's no retroactive payment, uh, you know, required uh, for that four or five month uh, period where they weren't paying. So, so to answer your question simpler, it's 30 percent no matter what that number is, and then whatever applicable voucher, uh, you know, comes with them uh, would cover the deficit. Okay, and total number of units transition, and I think you had 500 permanent. Is that, did I hear that correct? How many units permanent? How many permanent units do you have, and then how many transitional units? That's my question. So, so for this site, it would be an aggregate of 122 permanent. This is all going to be okay. permanent housing. So there's 84 units in the uh, the multifamily uh, or, or uh, the multi-unit building, and then there's 38 of these uh, comfort tiny homes. Okay. I'd just like to also add, in terms of the rental, uh, sir, is that once we come to the county, it's our job to bring those resources we do have nationally. So we get national grants, and U.S. Vets is able to parlay our experience that we come in here and start getting those grants and working with other providers here. So some veterans should be able to pay on their own, so you have those ones that are more independent. Others are doing subsidies, such as Gavin talked about. And then we bring grants in that allow us to move people in, pay their rent, take case, case, case manage them as well, and then they transition off of that and start paying on their own. And outside of my, my residency, you know, sort of request uh, for preference, is, is preference given uh, for any other stipulations, say elderly, um, say, you know, whatever your, your physical or mental health may be? I mean, what's, what sort of other, you know, your ability to work? Um, and, and my only concern is I, I don't want to see able-bodied working age, you know, you know, young single men having preferential treatment over, say, someone who is, you know, much more elderly and, and unable um, to work? Well, there's different, depending on the structure of it and working with Tunnel to Towers, many different campuses take many different approaches. So in West LAVA, it's specifically targeted because the West, one of the buildings are for elderly. It's 62 and over with a mental health diagnosis, and we had to target that. In this project, whether there's specific requirements or not, what we try to do is do what the biggest need is. If that's the need in terms of elderly, severely mentally ill, substance abuse. But what we also like to do is have a mix. So it's not just one population, but it's a mix of population. That way you can have a, people helping each other out. So I would imagine for this project, speaking for U.S. vets, we usually have a thing we call the assessment tool. And the assessment tool tells us what's the greatest need. 
and the one scoring in that assessment too would allow us to say, well, we're gonna prioritize these people versus just first come, first serve. We always do that at all our campuses across the nation. And we do that in conjunction with the continuum of care. I'm quite sure there's many homeless providers already. We would be working with them on what is the need, what do we need to do this project for, what's the best suited for this? So we would want to make sure that we take care of that because we agree with that. We want to make sure that people that need to access this are and we could still help those other people in the community live in individual units in the community, which we do across the nation as well. Do you allow for community involvement, meaning you know, could, could residents of this community volunteer at the facility? That's the therapeutic community approach. Thank you for asking that question. We believe that they should be done with them and active participants working, helping us with the 24-7 coverage. We call it big brother, big system. As soon as they walk into the project, hey, here's someone that can help you navigate around there. We take volunteers in the community and with them. We want them to own that. We also have a client council, so a veteran council. They get elected to become council. They get to bring their concerns with us so they can help things solve with us versus against us. Okay, good. I'm glad. I, I just, th this is a really like welcoming, loving, caring community. And I, I can look around the room and I can see people in this room in the audience who I know would want to volunteer to help. So y'all are very well prepared. Um, I'm impressed by, by the structure of, of your organization. Uh, I am a supporter of this. It's just the devils are always in the details, right? That's, that's how kind of how it works. So I appreciate your answering my questions. The uh, speaking order is Bearden, Washington, and Satcher. Commissioner Bearden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for coming up here and traveling such a long ways to give us a amazing presentation today. I just have a few questions. Um, and these questions come from actual veterans that I know who have had experiences uh, typically within your Houston um, facility. Um, so what I was, told is that, and, and he was a prime example of this, was that, that you guys were getting a lot of people from out of state that were moving into the facilities in Houston, um, and that how you guys essentially bring in your income is off of the veteran vouchers, right? that are allocated to the actual veterans that are out there. Um, and that's how you guys are able to provide the, to provide the actual services uh, that you guys, you know, uh, how you operate your services. Um, so the, what I'm being told is that the main focus seemed to be just to get a veteran qualified for HUD vouchers and the housing and not so much for the rehab or the proper transition, is that, is that correct? Restate the question again, please, sir. So the main focus is to qualify a veteran who can essentially get the veteran housing voucher, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not so much on the rehab or the proper transition of the actual veteran itself. Oh. Yeah, so let me, I think it's better to explain the voucher system. So first, the voucher system is from the Department of Veteran Affairs. It's not us. So right. they have to get assessed by the VA. The VA does a voucher. U.S. Vets is not involved in that process. Got it. At our Houston campus, much like Tunnels to Towers will be with us, the landlord, which is Cloudbreak out there, they're in charge of their units, which is the permanent housing units, mm -hmm. and the VA works with them to put them in there. We merely get cloud break contracts with us to provide the ancillary services for them. So in this approach, the difference between this and that is we're working for Tunnel to Towers that's actually taking the approach of we want you involved in that process about who's coming in and how you're doing that. In Houston, while cloud break used to be our partner, they're just our landlord now. So our process is to give the services to them, but the voucher goes from the VA to that property management. Our job is just to service the veteran that comes in. So our number one job is rehabilitation. Got it. So tell me what happens if that veteran no longer gets a voucher. So two things. If a veteran does not have a voucher, we have the program that we, I briefly skimmed over. It's called Supportive Service Veterans and Families Grant. So say a veteran comes in, he just doesn't qualify for a voucher, can't have a voucher, for whatever reason doesn't have a voucher. We're able to take him, put him into a permanent housing unit, whether it be at our campus or even in the community, pay his deposit, first and last month's rent, and pay the rent for up to a year 
until we transition them off there by working with them through rehabilitation process. That's the kind of grants, and I'm quite sure there's probably that grant out here somewhere, but if not, that's the grants that we use to help those that do not get vouchers, that run through us, not through the property. Got it. So I, I could see where, um, you know, this could potentially help, you know, some veterans. Um, my only concern behind this is the drug and the alcohol abuse that is being done within this facility. Now, the, the property that's being proposed, essentially, you know, um, I don't necessarily think that would be the right place for something like this. Um, but, you know, my, I, I have concerns in regards to um, people coming in from out of state, out of cities, uh, that aren't, you know, Manatee County residents, and then we create something happens to this veteran, and all of a sudden, you know, they're out on the street again, which tip, which happens right a lot, um, and then now we've just increased our homeless population another 250 or to 500 um, on the on the on the uh, and you know increased uh, our homeless situation and. That's a concern of mine. Sure. Um, can you help me with that? Sure. So <laughs> as I started off, although I'm a native New Yorker, uh, I've been living in Hawaii for the last 30 years. Uh, I can I can assure you that Hawaii is a great destination when homeless they want to travel and say, hey, we're going to come to Hawaii because we can sleep on the beaches, we can sleep there and be uh, it's not as it's a I think a friendly town, uh, and we get a lot of people and then a lot of the Hawaii which is obviously uh, not the continental United States. They are very territorial <laughs> when it comes to, we want to help our people that are on the state, not people flying just to become homeless. So I totally understand your concerns. And the way we address those concerns in Hawaii is what the commissioner brought up earlier about how we first designate who is the greatest need and who are residing there, who established, who has residency there. The VA has to take the state the stance when they're running our programs, not the permanent housing, it's the programs. People come in, they have to make the determination whether they're eligible to come access this service, although we encourage people to stay where they are with their services. With permanent housing, we get to set the bar, which was pr proposed about preference, of saying, let's treat the ones that are in Manning County first. Let's make sure we ensure we're taking care of those. So we're not encouraging other people to be displaced and come out and become homeless. There used to be myths about social workers in other states, not myths, myths and reality, about actually flying people out to Hawaii just to be homeless and to other places. And we've learned to work with the other communities and counties in the mainland, we call it from Hawaii, and say, do not send the people here to be homeless. It's a high cost of living. We're going to take care of the Hawaii people first. Now, we will never deny someone's services when they come to us as a veteran, regardless of where they're from but we work very diligently to ensure that the people that are living in that county are served first and foremost. So we, ex we share your concerns, because importing homelessness does not change anything. All it does is make one place to the other. We're not solving anything. Yeah, it, so that's why, I, it's funny you talk about Hawaii, because I actually, when I got out of the Marines, I actually moved to Hawaii. Um, speaking from somebody who has been homeless at one point or another, at one time in my life, I can see in, uh, that this program could be good, but I, but I don't necessarily think it's the fix to the specific issue. Um, and my concerns are that our homeless population would increase with a program such as this because we would be the only one in the state of Florida to have this facility, essentially, right? And with that being said, once the word got out, we would be getting homeless veterans all over the state to come here. And if something were to happen to those homeless veterans to where maybe the um, services did not fix the root of the issue, we would have more homeless veterans out on the street. So uh, just to that point, uh, just to clarify, there are other organizations in the state of Florida uh, that tackle this issue. St. Vincent de Paul being uh, one of the largest uh, has uh, permanent housing uh, along uh, the south region regions of Florida. Um, 
to your point, uh, and really the second prong of our uh, program, why we developed it, is because we found that in the more uh, rural places or outside these key metro areas that we've identified, um, you, you can't utilize a build it and they will come model. Eight or nine times out of 10, a veteran is not amenable to leaving their place uh, where they're comfortable even if they are homeless. Uh, so again, you know, we, we, we've, we've diagnosed where the need is greatest, it's Man Manatee County. And uh, be, this is why the partnership between Tunnel to Towers and US Vets works so well, because obviously US Vets has been, you know, has an ex extensive uh, and a very great track record of provi providing the supportive services over a 30 year period. And Tunnel to Towers is primarily, you know, one of the largest uh, developers in nonprofit housing. Um, but uh, the, the, the point is that um, this is where the need is, and, and because we're not Tunnel to Towers, not as beholden uh, to the receipt of government funds as other organizations are, um, we are able to be flexible and nimble and uh, work around the confines that other ones may be you know, restricted by. Uh, you know, with that, um, Tunnel to Towers Foundation is one of the highest uh, charity ratings of any organization in in the nation for transparency. Uh, 95 cents of every dollar uh, that's donated goes to our programs. Uh, so with that and the gracious um, you know donations that come through our uh, our benefactors and and our sponsors, uh, we are able to be a little bit no, more nimble, as we said. Uh, and while we were extremely uh, excited to work with the counties in applicable jurisdictions, uh, we aren't beholden to other uh, sort of uh, strictures that may force a project uh, to not be optimal um, if they are, you know, in receipt of those funds. So you say that Manatee County has the greatest need of the homeless veterans situation. And I'm trying to figure out why Manatee County has the biggest need when we have cities such as Jacksonville, um, Miami, that have a larger population um, opposed to Manatee County. There's counties out there that literally have 1.5 million, 2 million people plus. Um, so explain to me why you believe that Manatee County has the greatest need. Uh, so we've done research as to the state of Florida, and it turns out that uh, Fort Lauderdale and along that coast, as well as uh, you know Manatee County and surrounding areas, uh, do have the highest concentrations of homeless. I would attribute it personally, I guess, to the boom of uh, Sarasota and the west coast of Florida over the last few years. Um, but uh, you know, based on uh, the research that we've conducted, those are the two uh, largest areas in need. Okay. Did you want to say something, sir? Sure. Uh, yep. In all of our locations except Los Angeles that has the, one of the biggest problems when it comes to veterans experiencing homelessness. Every time we build a location, there's been a reduction in homelessness when it comes to that, because what happens is the answer to the evidence-based practice. Are you saying that a reduction in homelessness, the overall number of homelessness has Correct. been? Correct. Okay. Correct. So when I, 20 years ago, when I first started working in this, uh, there was over 250,000 homeless veterans uh, experiencing homelessness across the nation. That number is now down to 38,000. That was attributed to all the focus that was done under the previous administration, under Obama's administration, that put a lot of resources into what you're hearing right now. Permanent housing, supportive service veterans. Veterans homelessness was one of the agendas of the National Coalition of Homelessness to take that down. Because the idea is that we can do veterans, we could then translate that to the civilian population. It's a smaller population we can do. So building, renovating, making existing affordable housing is the answer to ending homelessness along with services. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. You have, and we will never build our way out of this problem. What we have to do is get existing places that are willing to rent to people that will used to experience homeless. And we have to have the campuses for those that need the communal living. And that's how we tackle homelessness with the services. It's not substance abuse, it's not mental health. Homelessness is caused by lack of affordable housing and lack of income. Well, <clears throat> so you're saying to me that because of the programs in LA, that the not just the veteran homeless situation, but the overall homeless situation actually uh, decreased. LA is the one that the one the anomaly that we've seen increase. I mean, not it stabilized at some point. It got a big drop, and then recently, LA is still experiencing problems right now. Okay, because. I just got back from California, and um, specifically for this um, subject, and I recognize that LA actually increased 5.1% right. and $500 million was spent in LA 
on their homeless situation. So obviously money wasn't the answer to fix the solution, Correct. right? Um, you know, I, I just have a lot of concerns in regards to this program. I'm, I mean, I'm taking down my notes from uh, a good friend of mine who was a captain in the Marine Corps and fought in Afghanistan, Purple Heart Earner. And he pretty much told me that if I were to vote, I would vote no granting them money based off the experience in Houston. They received money from the VA to take care of veterans, but didn't do much to help veterans. So that's my only, that's my only concern is that I've, ha I've actually had friends who have gone through the program, but didn't necessarily feel like they got the help that they needed. And this is a captain in the Marine Corps that you know, had moved from Kansas to Houston to be in the facility. And so those are my only issues with this particular project and, and knowing the fact that I have friends that have actually been through this program um, that, that would essentially, maybe we need to relook or have a, a different conversation on, the, on where we need to place this facility if we happen to decide we want to do it in Manatee County. Yes, sir. Can I ask a quick question just for clarification? Uh, your friend used the pronoun they. Was he referring to this organization? Yeah. Okay, same organization. Okay, thank you, sir. Sp sp not to get into pronouns, but that was the. <laughs> <laughs> that that is what the <laughs> grammatically speaking, that is what it is. Before that became such a hot button issue. Um, Satcher, Cruz, and Washington are next. Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just for getting, just for information, so. With a program like this, um, actually the chair was wondering, so are, are kids usually allowed? Would they be allowed if, if someone has children? No, not, not at this time. Go ahead, yeah. So starting off this project, no, this is not, this is gonna be single individuals of coming into the project of this. Have we had programs in the nation, across the nation that allow children? Yes, we usually grow into that, if that's gonna ever be a, a, uh, something that needs to be done. Okay. But for right now, no. Okay, so be single um, people, gotcha. And then I think for, if I understand the situation, Tunnels to Towers is basically, their commitment is to build this facility. Now, would they pretty much after it is done and finished um, be outside of it, would no longer have a day-to-day -day participation? Uh, no, uh, so this is a program that we've implemented um, and obviously uh, we were able to accelerate our efforts and, and implement this supportive service uh, component with you with our partnership with US Vets, uh, but we uh, want to funnel as many different resources as possible to these sites um, to a point that was made earlier. Um, just based on what we've done prior to this program, we have uh, a litany of people that reach out to our foundation that are interested in helping and uh, diverting their resources to helping uh, you know, our mission, electricians, plumbers, contractors, uh, and we want to funnel those entrepreneurship opportunities, those apprentice opportunities toward these, towards these sites to buttress uh, what US Vets' uh, model is currently, but we have on-site staff, uh, Tunnel to Towers, that are watching uh, you know, and, and overseeing uh, the uh, property management aspect of the site, the safety and security of the site, uh, alongside U.S. Vets supportive uh, service model. Okay, so so you would stay involved yes, and sir. oversee other organizations coming in. The one that you know you work with well and would expect to take on the majority of that was U.S. Vets. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Getting, because we because y'all actually represent two different organizations. One project, two organizations, and you foresee it being the. A majority of services provided coming from U.S. vets. I mean, obviously something could change, but that's what you're looking at. And then you would oversee for the, uh, have most of the authority over the property or the authority over the property. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, so with that, can you, I think you touched on it, but I just wanted to hear, is is this a different, uh, fundamentally different setup than some of the ones you've done in the past? Is there a reason why you think this will work better? Do you have any uh, locations that have operated this specific way before? Because obviously from the commission, you're asking for a, a commitment. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that we, I mean, we're looking at it today. So obviously it's something that we're at least interested in and open to, um, but we want to address different concerns we don't want to be the model of how to fail at this. 
right? We want to be the model of how to succeed at something like this. So can you put any of those, um, you know, uh, concerns to bed or? No? Absolutely. Um, I'll start by saying that it, it comes down to detail, as has been discussed here. Uh, throughout our programs, our three premier programs at the Tunnel to Towers Foundation, we'll start with our catastrophically injured smart home program. Uh, those are for wounded warriors that experience a litany of different catastrophic injuries. Uh, we create homes no matter uh, the location. We allow the veteran to choose where they live, and we uh, tailor the construction of the home to their needs. The level of detail is right down to the brick. Uh, completely uh, accessible, everything's controlled by an iPad, tailored to the needs of the veteran. And that's how we will implement this program, tailored to the needs of each specific veteran. Um, as to our partnership with U.S. Vets, to assuage some concerns uh, as it relates to the Houston facility, uh, that may have come down to some sort of uh, you know, funding issues that may have existed in the past, but that's why this joint partnership is going to be so fruitful, because Tunnel to Towers has the ability to come in and uh, re rejuvenate and revitalize these properties in the Houston property that, you, that you've just seen. Um, that is going to be our new site, joint site, at Houston uh, and the renderings which you've been provided for, uh, which will create a much more therapeutic uh, place uh, for rehabilitation. Um, and it, it's, you know, the, the first component of it, as I've said, is the level of detail. And the second is the consistency of service and making sure that uh, we perpetually are vigilant as to the status. We don't want to come in here and have a project uh, that looks nice and shiny for the first couple of months and then three or four years down the road there's, there's problems. Uh, we are, as I said, eternally vigilant on all of our uh, programs, this one in particular. Uh, it's one that's uh, very near and dear to our hearts as an organization and our boards. Um, and uh, we will implement it uh, to the same quality and standards that the Tunnel to Towers Foundation is uh, known for. Well, go ahead. And, Satch, I would, and we've never, U.S. Vets, in terms of this being a pilot, we have never opened a facility that we've had to close. So I just wanted to address that concern that We've opened facilities and partnerships. We're now partnering with Tunnel to Towers. We bring the funding with us. And I want to make sure we own any experience a veteran has. We're not pretending that some veterans may walk away dissatisfied. And it's our job to figure that out. It's our job to meet with. I would love to meet with that captain. My job is to go around at each one of the locations and make sure we're operating effectively. <coughs> we know that we will sometimes not meet their need because of whatever reason may have happened. But it's our job to do that. You know, usually when we do these presentations, I know there's limited time, we will always have a story of someone speaking of what they've done. And then you always can have a story of people that didn't get that experience. It is our job not to judge them. Our job, all feelings are valid. And our job is to make sure that we can have them have the best experience today. We're transparent, we own it, and if it's something we can do better, we would do it better. But we've never opened a facility that we said, okay, now we have to close it down. It's what wouldn't be a pilot project. It's a project that we're pretty confident with the great conditions great services, it would be very successful. Okay. So, and I guess that was actually where I was going with my next question, because um, I was going to say which, you know, location has this set up. This is a pilot project. So this is a little bit, as you've done things very closely related, enough to feel pretty confident that you can succeed. But this is a little different than what y'all have done bef before, between the two organizations working together on one side and then moving forward. Is that a correct uh, statement? You called it a pilot So, so in, in terms of the comfort home model, that, that may be a, sort of a novel component of it. But as to the campus uh, approach, that, that's not a pilot at all. We obviously, neither of our organizations uh, have a project geared towards at-risk uh, veterans in Florida. But uh, I know that some of, um, you know, we have directed you to our Let Us Do Good Village up in Tampa, uh, which is a 100-acre tract for 100 homes for veterans, uh, Gold Star family members, and fallen first responders. Uh, so we're not... Uh, strangers to Florida, uh, and uh, we obviously want to make sure that the Sunshine State is taken care of in this regard, um, but uh, where the uh, where the comfort home comes in is really to inst instill uh, a sense of independence and to have each veteran have a place that they can organically call home. Uh, that is a, a more novel than the campus approach, but it, it's, it's far from being a, a pilot here in Florida. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. So Cruz, Washington, Ballard, and then Bearden is on the board for a second time. So before we move further, Commissioner Baugh, would you like me to place you on the board before we start? Yes, sir, please. Two? Okay, so we'll go, yes. we'll go Cruz, Washington, Ballard, Baugh, Bearden. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I just want to, this isn't a question so much as I just want to 
kind of make sure. I, I kind of I think this would have made a little more sense if we would have flip flopped this and started with the staff side and explaining and the, what what we're trying to do, and then you explaining what you're going to do on the site after we the staff explain it. But it's neither here nor there. Um, I, I just want to make sure we're framing this right because this conversation came up in February while I was out of town on that four hour update thing. Um, and, and a lot of people didn't know about it. Now everyone's had over two months to, to get their briefings and really learn what this was. Just, just to, to remind everyone how this came about. Last May, we went to Washington, D.C., and a couple of us, three of us maybe, uh, went and met with the chairman of Veteran Affairs for the, for the House of Representatives and had a big conversation about how Manatee County was going to make a concerted effort to focus on our, our, our homeless or our underhomed uh, veterans and, and wraparound services. In fact, at that time, we made it a priority, I think, on our state list. It was a top three priority for the state of Florida to express to the representatives up in Tallahassee that this was a priority that Manatee County was going to move forward with. When we met with the chairman's staff uh, at a subsequent meeting in D.C., they gave us a, a list of, of people to reach out to. And it wasn't about bringing people in to do this. It was honestly about how we could bundle the, the, the HUD VASH vouchers to, to use it ourselves because this previous this, this board, albeit with, with, with different makeup, voted to put $15 million of our ARP funds towards the Judicial Center empty building across the street for the sole purpose of building housing and wraparound services for veterans. That, that was a decision this board made and really went along with it. We told, the, we told the citizens, we told the community, we told Tallahassee, we told DC, this is something we are going to do. And we got a lot of pats on the back and publicity and, and you know accolades for, for making that a focus with our ARP funds. Now we had an opportunity present itself when I started reaching out to all those contacts we had, and originally it was, it was Steve at, at US, Steve, See Peck at, at U.S. Vets, and then he introduced us to Tunnel the Towers, and this became an organic discussion about, hey, why are we spending $15 million of our ARP funds for a project that we have to manage ourselves, we have to build ourselves? We were being told there was no way this was being built out for $15 million. It was a drop in the bucket, we're being told. We're going to have to go out and find other funds that we have to deal with the wraparound. They basically said, hey, if we can find a suitable location, we're looking for a, a location to build this kind of prototype in the state of Florida in one of these select areas, South Florida, over here on the Gulf Coast. And so they came in and met with, with uh, Charlie Bishop and, and Lee Washington and a few others. And at that point, I, I stepped aside because it was getting a little too into the weeds for a commissioner. But that's how this came about. This was a board decision to allocate money and build this. Whether we, we put $15 million and then God knows what else into the, the empty jail across the street, or Tunnel Towers and U.S. Vets builds this on 66th, you're going to run into the same hypothetical problem of are people from out of town going to come here if you build something? So if the decision was we're going to provide veteran housing across the street, this doesn't make that better or worse than what that, that previous decision was in, in your mind. And to say this isn't the right location, this is the exact right location. I understand what people are going to say. Oh, it's, it's, it's a nice piece of property. Someone may build something really needed like self-storage or a car wash on it. <laughs> maybe both, maybe both. Uh, but, the, but the reality is people would want to build things like that on this because of its location. And we've been using this location forever as, utility, as, as government utility offices. So it's not like we've been monetizing it previously. And they have to leave anyway because that building is, is basically falling apart, that hexagon building. So one way or another, when, when we acquired the Lena Road property before any of us got on this board, it was to move utilities because of the quality of this. So you look at this location, it's, it's flat, it's clear, it allows for, for building the project they wanna build. It's on a transit line, which gets people to the support service they need, it gets people to the employment they need. It's in walking distance from retail, from grocery stores, it allows for employment and services right from this site. It's exactly the place you need. You, you want to say, oh, maybe we'll find someplace cheaper. Way up north, close to the Hillsborough border, you have no services, no employment. It's making it that much more difficult setting up this village to fail unless we start shuttling people back and forth on a daily basis to do it. So that, that's why this location was attractive to tunnel the towers and U.S. vets. I, I'm sure, especially after a presentation like we just heard, 
Sarasota is going to reach out and Fort Myers is going to reach out and, and Fort Lauderdale and all these other places are going to reach out because this is an opportunity where at, at effectively the cost of the land, which we appraise at like six million bucks, as we'll hear from the staff, compared to the $15 million that we were going to spend across the street, we get a, a professional project coming in with professional wraparound services that takes that off the plate of government and we all say we're trying to lessen government and focus more on public private, par public private partnerships and that's exactly what this is this is serving a need that we claim to tallahassee and dc and manatee county we were going to provide for in a manner that limits government increases partnership with a very, this, this isn't some fly-by-night nonprofit that started up last month on SunBiz to, to pretend they're a nonprofit. This is Tunnel the Towers. It's, it's one of the most successful nonprofits in the country. You know, I, I just thought this was a great opportunity. I thought this was a great location. And if we're going to use this location for something other than utilities, then I, I think this expresses to, to everybody here that we stand behind our word that, that we care about our veterans, we care about our, our homeless veterans. We're not just going to say that to sound good in a work session. We're actually going to do something about it. And this seems like a very economical way of creating a very meaningful project for everyone in Manatee County. Thank you, sir. Mr. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I truly appreciate all the input from the commissioners thus far, and, and I'd like to echo what Commissioner Cruz just stated. Uh, the county made a commitment to do something for our homeless veterans here in Manatee County. And, and I'd like to say as well as my fellow Marine, uh, Commissioner Bearden would know, uh, we're not all the same as veterans. We may be challenged with mental health, substance abuse, um, and many other things. But to think that this would be any different than any other affordable housing project that we've approved here in Manatee County, we'd be incorrect. The most important thing I would think, though, with this project would be the support of services that are on site to ensure that these veterans are receiving the help that they should need um, if they should be suffering from mental health, substance abuse, or otherwise. But keeping in mind, we're not a bunch of drunks with mental health issues running around Manatee County or the nation. Some of us have just run at hard times. Uh, I know when I got out of the Marine Corps, we um, went to TAPS, got all the briefings of all the services that you would need when you got out of the military. But I was in Camp Pendleton, California. I'm from Punta Gorda, Florida. So when I moved back home, I had no idea of what that environment was like. So if I was seeking employment, and took a job offer in Manatee County, upon to go to Florida, what have you, and that job didn't pan out. And I did not have the financial wherewithal or whatever reason, I had to fall out of my family. I became homeless. I wasn't necessarily suffering from mental health or substance abuse, I just fell in hard times. But having a place that was affordable for the monies that I had in my pocket or my bank account at the time, and also having the support of services on site to help me get back on my feet, that would truly have been a resource for me. So if it's, if it's not this particular site, and, and I do apologize, and I appreciate Commissioner Cruz bringing it up, that we didn't speak about the property site just yet, and we can have staff come up and do that. If it's just the site, let's have a conversation of alternative sites. But if it's the program, let's speak to that and, and then move on. But I think based on what was presented to us this morning, what's been presented to us and we've been working on for almost a year now, We've been able to bring it formally to the board to discuss it. Your questions are more than valid. Um, I'm just hoping that we can come to some kind of conclusion of what we're truly going to do for the homeless veterans here in Manatee County. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The speaking order is Ballard, Baugh, and Bearden. And just to be clear, commissioners, this is the site is in my district, and I have no problem with the site. Uh, Commissioner Ballard. Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for a, a great presentation. Um, so my biggest question is, is with regard to uh, those veterans who are struggling with, with things like mental health and substance abuse. And when you have a, a rapid rehousing model um, with, with people who are struggling with, with some underlying issues, are we just leaning into kind of a harm reduction? What are we doing to actually solve those problems? And what is a situation that's gonna be so severe that it's gonna maybe get a veteran, you know, removed from, from this supportive housing? Uh, 
So th thank you for that question. Uh, it's a question that's evolved over the years, and I, I can hear you speaking from experience with that. So experience meaning understand rapid rehousing, harm reduction models, and those type of languages. Um, we do do a harm reduction model only in the sense of when there's any, like any other landlord tenant when it comes to permanent housing, if there's any behaviors, whether it's drugs or alcohol or something else that becomes a danger to themselves or the community, they no longer can be a part of that community. It, it could either be drugs, it could be alcohol, it's just because I'm upset. And we don't just focus on just the drugs and alcohol, we focus on the outward behavior about that. However, to address the first part of your question, we have clinical therapists and substance abuse counselors that work with the veterans on campus and engage them into the process that we know the cycle of change of just pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, until they're ready to get into that recovery. And as long as the effort's being made and it's not damaging the community and those around them, they're allowed to retain their housing. Now, if we were talking about transitional housing, that is different. We're able to mandate things there. You have to go through treatment. You have to do these things. You have to go move forward with this. And then they gradually move forward. So safety is always first and foremost for the veterans and the staff members and the surrounding communities. And we just don't throw people out. We make the proper referrals to the next place to say, this is not appropriate setting for you. Let's make sure. That's why it's important for us to come here and partner with existing agencies as well. And, and just so I understand, what percentage of the, of the units are transitional versus permanent supportive? In this model, this is all permanent. So this is all, okay, so this is all intended to be permanent. There's no, there's no transitional aspect. Would you consider adding that later? Yes, uh, so we we're finding um, that throughout the nation, uh, not just in Florida, the need for permanent supportive housing is really what uh, the, the issue is. Uh, say in New York, if you're a veteran experiencing hopelessness, there's over uh, 80 places you can lay your head. Uh, but the transitional programs are so, ho and I you know, don't want to disparage any program in New York doing it, um, but uh, it, it's, it, it seems to just be a cycle where three months at a time, four months at a time, they're graduating out of these transitional uh, programs into another transitional program, into another transitional program, and uh, it's just a lot of Band-Aids and no real ointment. Um, so for this uh, program, and as we move forward uh, throughout the nation, uh, we're looking in Detroit, uh, Atlanta, New York City, uh, Portland, Seattle, Colorado Springs have projects uh, going in these areas. Um, we are implementing more of permanent housing. But to your point, and as I uh, discussed before, uh, we're nimble enough as a foundation to be able to implement uh, whatever the need is. So if there's people that would previously have been classified by someone that is bound by the strictures of these terms to take transitional uh, you know, residents, we can do so as well. We're going to be allotting a certain percentage of this overall program for those uh, people that um, you know, may be labeled as transitional, but uh, give them the permanent support of housing. Um, so we don't want to, uh, as you know, was mentioned before, we don't want to uh, be disqualifying anyone before uh, we've really diagnosed their issue and see how we can help them. Thank you. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I've got a few questions. Uh, first of all, I, I kind of take offense to some of the comments made because I don't think anyone on the dais, uh, you know, wants to take away and not be committed to helping veterans. I mean, for heaven's sakes, we might not all agree on this particular way to do it, but we're all in the same uh, line of thought in that we need to do something. So I've got a few questions. What is the actual financial commitment of Manatee County that's expected. I I haven't heard that mentioned. Mr. Yeah, Washington. Let me just, you know what, I've got several questions. Lee, do you want me to, maybe you can answer them for me and then I can continue on. Yes, ma'am. I can actually have staff come up and speak to the actual numbers, Commissioner. Um, we have um, Deputy County Administrator and Air Force retiree Charlie Bishop, as well as our CFO, Sheila McLean, yes, to speak about not only the property, but the financial pieces. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Washington. Charlie Bishop, Deputy County Administrator. Uh, we valued the property that was referred to here on uh, Cortez and 66 at approximately $6,064,000, uh, which would have to be refunded to the utilities uh, department based on bonds. Um, we've also identified a piece of property, I prefer not to get into the address, where we could potentially rent and or buy at approximately $8 million with $2 million worth of renovations. So it could rent brought brought up to county standards to house approximately 75 utility personnel. 
if that site's not sufficient to purchase, which would be a faster direction, uh, we could look at building a new building at approximately uh, $13 million, and that's just a rough estimate, which would take us approximately two years. Uh, that's on land that we own currently behind uh, State Road 64 next to the landfill, not Musgrave, but behind the car wash that we currently own. Does that answer your questions, Commissioner? Yes, sir. So, I mean, we're looking at possibly, from what you're telling me, a little over 16 million if we do the one solution, the other one would be approximately 13. How about yearly? What is our financial commitment uh, after the building is built? What are we looking at there? I haven't heard any of this mentioned on the dais, so I just thought somebody you're, should You're ask referring to operating way. expenses, ma'am? Yes, yes. What are we, what is Manatee County um, committing to yearly? Sorry, uh, uh, n nothing uh, to my knowledge. Uh, the, the project is funded from a construction standpoint, um, and we, as we've said, you know, we work with the veteran uh, for um, to work out a payment structure that that allows them independence and uh, long-term sustainability with their voucher, uh, and everything else is uh, covered by the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. And and I appreciate you saying that. I think it's a very important question because you know when you're a county or a city. Uh, you hear that, but then there's always something that's in the background that maybe you don't realize or know about. So I appreciate you answering that for me. I am familiar with your organization. In fact, I'm very much uh, um, uh, informed about it, and I think it's a great organization. Um, but, you know, I have to ask, you mentioned several cities uh, just a few minutes ago that you were looking at, and, you know, none of those cities are like Manatee County government. Uh, or Manatee County, I should say, as a whole. So I, I know that we're in a totally different situation than some of these other areas that you mentioned. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, I, I don't, well, let me just say this. Uh, I'm trying to be very careful here. Yes, Manatee County government, we need to do something to help our vets. I. I I don't think it's it's fair to say that we would not do that. We are going to do that. It's just a matter of what it is. So I think, you know, if you could answer the question for me, if we have somebody come in from say Georgia and and they're they get into the permanent housing and it doesn't work. They're they, you know, it's just not working and and they have to leave that we essentially are looking at the possibility of now we have another resident in Manatee County that's homeless. Um, you know, we still have that, that problem. So do you have any statistics um, in what you've done so far with permanent housing that shows what the vacancy or how that the units are turned over or how many you have to have leave because of problems of one, you know, something one way or another. Do you have any statistics on that? Yes, thank you. And I'll turn this over to, to Daryl in a second. Uh, but just to, um, you know, address address your question, uh, you know, from what, what Daryl uh, has uh, stated before, uh, for permanent housing projects, the retention rate is over 90 percent. Um, and uh, in your uh, scenario that you've identified where someone from Georgia comes in and for whatever reason uh, they are unable to stay at the facility, the second prong of the program that we've identified is find them housing on this remote basis. So we're not going to uh, kick someone out of the program and, uh, you know, now you're on the street. We will find uh, the appropriate place for them uh, based on their needs. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl. And sometimes that need is reconnecting them with family members that may be from back where they're from. We're not gonna say we do the same thing back and fly them back, but if that's the reconnection, that's the proper step. Uh, Gavin pointed it out, <laughs> permanent supportive housing is one of the most successful models that we have. Uh, over 90% are doing it on the slides that you have. I think it varies from site to site or aggregate, but it's somewhere around the aggregate of 85 to 86% are actually paying their portion of the rent or the rent, uh, so that's a big, it's a, it's a very successful model. It doesn't turn over as much as, say, transitional or permanent housing that is not supported, that has a bigger turn. That's what your statistics show. And I'm sorry, maybe I missed it, but you don't really have another one of these in Florida, do you? 
No, not currently. Uh, we have um, we have a project, uh, Tunnel to Towers, uh, is implementing in uh, Lando Lakes, Florida, which is uh, 100 homes uh, on 100 acres uh, for our three categories of recipients. This is more geared towards uh, the at-risk uh, veteran program. Yeah, and, and I am familiar with that one in Lando Lakes, so I am familiar with that, but I knew it wasn't exactly the same. All right, well, that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think all commissioners have asked questions at this point. We've heard from the administrator. Why don't we go to staff now? Because I think that's going to answer a lot of our questions. And then after that, we'll continue on with commissioner discussion and debate. So we'll go to our, our CFO. Good morning, commissioners, county administrator. Um, yes, um, the, the most important question is how are we going to fund this endeavor? Um, as we mentioned, and Commissioner Cruz also mentioned, the cost of this land, it's, it's coming at $6.1 million to um, convey the land. The general fund will pay for these dollars. General revenues will. As for the second transaction, the first option, which would be the uh, purchasing the similar property at an approximate estimated amount of $8.2 million uh, with a cost of renovation of three and a half for a total of 11.7, in which utilities will utilize the 6.1 to offset this cost at a net amount of 5.6, they would have to pay additional. I would like to pay, make a point that on the CIP right now, the utility department has a building that is cost, that is um, estimated to be constructed at $27.5 million, which by utilizing any of these two options, it will bring the utility department big savings. In the first option would be a 21.1 savings to the system. And in option two, which would be obtaining the um, building in Musgrave property at a 12, 12 and a half net of the 6.1 would be a 6.4. This one will bring, and of course, assuming that it's gonna take like approximately eight months to build this, this utility uh, complex uh, approximately for 20 months, then they will have to lease some other place. So that will cost another $2 million per, a million dollars per year, uh, plus the cost of renovation of whatever to bring it to county standards of whatever the place that we lease, uh, which that will uh, bring a net um, amount total of this option two with the lease of 9.4 million, still saving the, the utility department $18.1 million. Do we have any questions specific to the CFO's comments? I do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I have Cruz and Baugh. Commissioner Cruz. I, I, I just want to make sure this is being clarified because a, a valid question was, was asked about the, the cost of this. And the, the first was the land was approximately $6 million. So presumably, in theory, you could sell that land to somebody else for $6 million bucks. So there's a cost. And then there's the, these talks of two different options. One is purchasing that building and renovating it to move utilities. The other option is just building a brand new one behind the car wash off of 64. And so we're kind of adding these together and saying, well, it's about 17 million one way, 20 million another way. Um, I, I just want to make sure it's clarified and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, and this may be more for Charlie. The utilities is planning to leave here anyway. So while this is a quote unquote cost associated with this, because they're leaving for this use, that, that, that building it was always intended to come down utilities was always intending to move someplace. In fact, if you look at what we've already as a previous board budgeted for a, the combination of moving utilities and building veteran housing, we had 15 million in ARP for veteran housing and $27 million to build a new building for utilities already budgeted for before today, before we sat down here right this exact minute. So we already had 32, uh, sorry, $42 million effectively soft committed for these two projects by this board. And this project costs us about 20 million on the high end if we do the new construction. So it's about half the cost of what we've already basically acknowledged we're going to spend between veteran housing and moving utilities. So this isn't a, a, a matter of, well, they're looking for land that's otherwise usable. They're not trying to build this veteran housing on this property where we have to knock down this building and go build a new one. They're building on a property that was already going to get knocked down and was already going to be vacant. And the question now is, do we use it for for county purposes? Do we surplus it for nonprofit purposes? 
what, what do we do with it? But, but that's, that's kind of almost an off the table discussion. The option here is not leave utilities where they are and save that money. They're moving one way or the other, correct? True. All right. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, I don't think the money is what we're talking about here, Commissioner Cruz. So, you know, I, I get it. I mean, we put 15 million aside, plus utilities has money in the CIP. So, you know, the money's there. So that's not the question at hand. Uh, Sheila, are you still, I can't tell, are you still in the room? Yes, ma'am, she is. Thank you, thank you. Um, my question is, I know, Mr. Bishop got up and spoke about us renting a building, et cetera. Uh, but you mentioned Musgrave property. And then I heard somebody, I think it was Commissioner Cruz, all of a sudden we're talking about behind the car wash. Can you can you help me with that, please? Oh, I guess it's gonna be Mr. Bishop. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, I refer to the property behind the car wash. I think that's the ideal location. Uh, Sheila mentioned the Musgrave, but our proposal and, and our cost estimates are, is the property, uh, what we refer to behind the car wash that utility currently owns. Adjacent to Musgrave. Adjacent to the Musgrave property. All right, because I was definitely going to be a no if you told me Musgrave. So that's why I asked the question. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Washington, you want me to go ahead and move forward with Mr. Yes, Mr. Comments Chair. Uh, any other questions? Comments? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Bearden, Satcher, Cruz. Commissioner Bearden. Oh, that was my question. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, <laughs> so question is, is if, so if there's a program that may be having, let's just say, a negative effect on the community, right? Um, will we as a county be able to partner with you in regards to which program is working better for this county? Without question. Okay. Um, you say that there's a 90% retention rate with veterans, so that leaves us 10%. Um, is that a year? Yes, we do our numbers every year. Okay. So our last year was at 90% permanent housing retention. That can fluctuate at times, uh, but uh, that's what our goal is every year is to retain 90%. Right. So we're looking to do what? Two, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 200 units? It's 122 units. So 120. So we're going to automatically just expect um, and these are very probably very conservative numbers, right? That 12 veterans a year are gonna be out on the streets of Manatee County. And, and is that accurate? Um, and you, you're coming to that conclusion by? By the numbers that you're giving me. Oh, well. The conservative numbers you're giving me. Well, 12, well, 10%, when we say 90%, obviously people transition for different reasons. So yes, I mean, I don't know if they'll be on the street. Some people move to another permanent housing. Okay. Uh -oh. Great. And, and, and again, that's the ultimate objective, right. is while uh, for an older class of recipient, uh, we uh, can implement the program to where they can live there for as long as they'd like, because it is permanent housing. Our objective is reintegration back into society. So the 10% retention rate that Daryl is, uh, referring to also encompasses people that have graduated out of the program, which is what we what we ultimately want. And because we're working more, we're seeing an aging population. Unfortunately, that's sometimes the last place they reside. So that also turns the apartment over as well, or the unit over as well. But the goal is to retain and or when the grant is given or we perform in permanent housing, there's two goals, retain or move to another permanent housing if that's their continuum of care. I think that this land is very valuable, right? I, I don't know, in my opinion, I think maybe we, we should look at a different piece of property. That's just my opinion, but um, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that. But I, I think we have a val very valuable piece of land right there. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. So, I mean, I can just real quick tell you that it's in my district, I'm very familiar with it. There's, there's a creek that runs through the middle of the property which is gonna be a problem. Um, and there's a potential brownfield in the back of the property uh, because it's a utilities yard. So I, I don't know that it's all, when you start you know, peeling the, the layers of the onion back, uh, I'm not sure 
that I even agree with the $6 million valuation that staff gave it, but that's just me. Um, Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think from what I'm hearing and, and summarizing, or to summarize what I've heard, uh, it seems like this is our least expensive option, our most effective option, um, and in some ways our most courageous option. And, uh, you know, I was looking a little bit into the organization, and the CEO stood up in, you know, 2020 uh, on 9-11 when the bureaucracy was afraid to even have a, have a ceremony to commemorate what people did on 9-11, and so they wouldn't have any type of get-together out of fear. And, um, you know, well-placed or not, but it was, and he stood up and bucked the, uh, the powers that be and said, we'll put it together ourselves, Tunnels to Towers did. And I think we need more of that in America. And are there going to be some people that might, even with our best efforts, slip through the cracks? I imagine so. But as for me, I want to be able to say, you know, to my family, my community, my constituents, and my God, that I put forth my best efforts. And if something goes wrong despite those best efforts, um, that's something we all have, will have to live with and deal with at that time. Um, so this seems like the right thing to do. Um, the action that the staff asked for was to direct the board um, to have county staff physically visit the March Veterans Village in Riverside, California, and continue negotiations with organizations to convey property that would house the tunnels to towers and U.S. Vet Supportive Services, Transitional Housing, and Comfort Homes Project. Um, and at this point, I'd like to make that motion, um, and I would also like us to look into if we need some type of lure on this to make sure that, uh, you know, years down the road, it continues to be used for this purpose. Um, I'd like to add that to the motion, uh, but that's my motion at this time, Mr. Chair. I'll second. Sorry. You can take it. Okay. Away. I'm going to give on your screen, Commissioner Satcher. Yes, sir. So we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Satcher. I'm sorry. I was a little distracted. Do you have a caveat to your motion that I didn't hear? It's not a caveat. Just in addition, and maybe this is just an aside to staff, look into, you know, we have not a, this size organization or respectable uh, of an organization. In the past, there are some times where we've, you know, done something similar as far as with a property, and then whatever nonprofit later on, maybe they go into financial trouble, and they're just like, oh, let's unload this. And so five years down the road, the county, you know, is just out that uh, land. first so, right refusal should so I just maybe or, be sold. Or for them to look into Allura, I wonder if we could do that on something like this, where it's, you know, this is part of the deal, goes with the deed. I'd just like them to look into it. Um, but beyond that, I just think, okay. I think this is a good option for us and, and for the community and for our veterans. So we have Mr. Chair. officially have a motion to approve. Mr. Clegg, do you want to try to help us word well, his, uh, does his, you know, sort of the spirit of, of what Commissioner Satcher is trying to achieve into the motion? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessary because the agenda item is the request to proceed with negotiations. So the, the actual transaction would have to come back to the board. There would need to be a resolution under Florida statutes to convey it to a nonprofit. And typically when this goes through staff in the county attorney's office, we look at deed restrictions, potentially a reverter on it so that it remains in the use that the nonprofit is representing to the board. We can look at all of those things. We always do as a standard practice. Okay. Well, well then I'll change my motion to the uh, Just motion the to approve motion to approve. Okay. But then the county attorney's office and, and property management will take, uh, you know, credence of Commissioner Satcher's wishes Absolutely. and the fact that no one on the board disputed his request. Okay, so we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Satcher. It has been seconded by Commissioner Cruz. We'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to address the board on the motion on the floor? <coughs> Mr. Gibellina. Oh, so you did. Yes, I did. I didn't look to see if you'd signed up or if you were going to stand up. I just called your name, sir. All right, thank you. Glenn Gibellina, for the record, we have, you know, this should have been approved an hour ago. I can't believe we're even having this discussion. You have a world-renowned organization 
coming in here ready to lift up our veterans, our veteran situation in, in our community. Let me point out a few things. We got 84, 84 homeless vets. We've had them for 10 years, Mr. Beaton, 10 years. This county has done zero in helping the veterans. You push them off the turning points, you push them off the, to uh, Salvation Army. This is a home run. Where else are you going to have an organization like this? Let me tell you something about the VASH vouchers. There are no VASH vouchers in Manatee. You have to go to Sarasota. This would be a great organization to take over the VASH voucher. Item two on the VASH vouchers. They're for, set, they're for a set amount. Vets go out, try to find housing. Oh, that VASH voucher is only for 1,200. We need 1,600. So they go unused because they can't afford to find affordable housing. These guys are open arms. We'll take them. We'll make up the difference. We'll make the numbers work. It's unbelievable even having this conversation. Support services, that's a handful in itself. They're not asking for, for uh, Centerstone to come in. They're not asking for uh, you know, helping hands to come in. They're not asking for any. They bring in their own pros. This is a no-brainer. The six million, you should, you should convey that land to them free of charge. Let's talk about the 15 million. 15 million, we've already earmarked for that. Give it to them. If that, let's, let's take it one step further. Let's take $2, million, $2 million of that and match the VASH vouchers that we don't have, right? Because it's going to take two years to build that out. In the meantime, we still have 84 vets that are homeless living in the streets of Manatee where they have been living homeless for over a decade in my advocacy that I've been working with veterans. So we haven't done anything. These guys are a home run. The VATCH vouchers, we need to move that program from Sarasota and have our own entity with the VATCH vouchers. I met with Verd McCannon last month. I said, we need to increase this. Glenn, I'll look into it. I met with Greg Stubbe last week. We need more VASH vouchers. I'll look into it. We don't, we don't have enough VASH vouchers, and these guys are willing to take them at face value. This should have been voted an hour ago, 7-0. Let's move this forward. Damn it. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on the motion on the floor? Ma'am, first and last name, County of Residence. You have three minutes to address the board on the motion. Thank you, ma'am. No, Stacy Jesse, Manny County. Um, and I just wanted to first just commend the commissioners who've really prioritized homelessness over the past couple of years, and even the, some of you that have got on here and have recently really prioritized it. A lot of us have watched that and have noticed how hard you've been working, going out to California, meeting with all these groups nationally and locally. And I think that's such an important issue that so many of us are concerned about, particularly where it comes to our homeless veterans. We have so many veterans in this room, um, and, so, and we all know veterans who have protected this country, and they deserve now to have the support of our community. Um, our government and these nonprofits who are willing to work with them. Um, my dad is, is a veteran and he sits on the board of a very similar uh, nonprofit up in Kansas City that helps homeless veterans. Two of my neighbors work for a local nonprofit that does the same thing. And so during this meeting before, I was asking them, have you heard of these organizations? Do you recommend them? And it was a resounding yes. These organizations can do. They're going to give Manatee County the reputation it needs. You need to be a place that veterans feel safe to go to. You should be a place that is known for that. We have over 10,000 new people coming to this county every year. Do we really want to just be the place where people that can afford half a million dollars in East County go to? Or do we want to be a safe place for veterans? Sure, some veterans are going to come from other places, but they've earned our respect. They've earned a place to lay their head and a place to get their lives back on track. And I'd like us not just to be a playground for those wealthy people, but also for those who have served our country and need help getting their feet back on the ground. So I really encourage you not to think the land is too expensive for, for these people who served our country or for anything like that, but they have deserved our respect. They deserve, they deserve the money that it takes to support them. And I think as a community, the only answer to this is yes. And I really thank Commissioner Satcher for, for making this motion because I agree with Glenn. I think this should be a really simple solution. So thank you. I right, thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on the motion on the floor? All right, seeing no one, we're going to close public comment. 
and we will go back to discussion amongst the board. Commissioner Cruz and Commissioner Bearden are on the board. I'll be quick. Uh, first, Glenn, we're not selling the land for $6 million. It's, it's, it is being transferred over. That's the proposal. The $6 million you see is because the land's owned by utilities. They're an enterprise fund, so the county has to make them whole. As That's outside the scope of our agreements with them. Uh, that, that is kind of our contribution towards this, this project. Uh, as for the location and the question of is this the right place or the wrong place, it's it's the exact right place. It's the only place we're looking at. These these groups have come in in good faith multiple times to look at every piece of dirt we could possibly come up with to show them, and we they, they've been discussed. When they first came over, mind you, there wasn't even discussion about other locations. It was because I was talking with Steve Peck from U.S. Vets about how to bundle the VASH vouchers to use to help us cover the, the what was going to be owner's cost of renovating the, the jail across the street. And so the first property they were taken to, geez, last summer, I mean, it's been going forever, was that that jail. And, and, and they were looking at that to see if they could make this work there. And, and that's how everything kind of organically came to this property on 66th right here. And to say, well, it's valuable or it's a nice piece of property. I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, but unfortunately, every other time I say it is about frivolous stuff. We just had a conversation last week about Premier and how we need to like throw tens of millions of dollars into a pool because that has to be the most world-class place in the entire world. We have to spend tens of millions of dollars on boat rims because we need world-class boat. Can we, for once, have world-class something that isn't like catering to the, the to, to all that? Like th this is a great piece of property, and to make an argument like, oh, I'll give them a three million dollar property, not a six million dollar property. It's three million dollars. That's not gonna that's not gonna cover the chemicals for that pool. So it's like, why don't we just build something nice for a change for people who actually need something nice because the people moving in here are not using our boat ramps and their kids are not swimming on the swim teams, but they're going to finally have a nice place to live where they can walk to work and walk to services. I'm not gonna nitpick over this opportunity over maybe there's a slightly less perfect piece of land someplace else so we can sell this to someone because value. That, 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 I, I think we're really, really, making a bad decision if we do that. And any motion I have is for this piece of property with this group. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bearden and Van Austin Bridge is the speaking order, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> no, I, my thing behind it is the reasons why I have um, the, I guess you could say like, the notions that I have is because of experiences from friends of mine, right? And so when I've been around a group of a lot of Marine Corps, Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans, and I've trained those guys, and when they've told me, you know, who are suffering high, you know, PTSD issues and substance abuse issues and things like that, and they've, and, and I've spoken with them that have used facilities and, and gone through the services of US vets, I have every right to have the concerns that I have based off of the relationships that I have. And so <clears throat> that's not necessarily saying that's, that you guys are doing you know awful job. You guys are doing a great job, right? And, and, and trying to fix the solution that we have in this country, right? Um, but it does make me reserve in moving and, and deciding on directions that um, I want to move our county forward uh, here in Manatee County. Um, I think I might feel a little bit better, right, if I could get permission from the board to go out to Riverside and check out the facility. And but you don't need our permission for that, sir. You're you're more than okay. More than I able just, to. Do that. That's just me. I, I like to physically see it. I like to physically see how the people are doing, ask questions with the people and things like that to see if, if they're truly getting services and we're fixing the solution, not putting a Band-Aid over it, right? Fixing the solution with these veterans. Because that's 
my main concern is ensuring that these veterans are plugged back in society, that they feel like they're part of society, because that's the biggest issue. The biggest issue is not the fact a temporary fix that we can all of a sudden house veterans. The biggest issue is that how can we how can we come up with solutions for long term? Now, I'm not like every veteran. I was a homeless veteran. I've been there. I've been I've been homeless in Hawaii. <laughs> I've been homeless in here in the state of Florida at one point in time. Right? I found the solution. My solution was Jesus. That's what my solution was. Right? A, a different solution may be something different. Okay? But I want to ensure that we are finding solutions for these veterans, right? Plugging them back into society, ensuring that they feel like they're part of society, because that's the biggest thing to a veteran is that they feel isolated, right? And so, you know, uh, whether it's this piece of property or another, if the board feels that this is, and, and uh, Mr. Chairman, this is in your district. If you feel as, as if this is the perfect property for this facility, then I, you know, I would support you in that. You know, because you know your district better than anybody else on this board. So um, that's all I have to say um, is that it, it is a big concern of mine. Veterans is at the top of my list. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, they're getting the services that they need so that we can continue to move forward and not have veterans back out on the street again, but actually fixing the solutions, getting them plugged back into society, getting them plugged back into the workforce, getting them plugged back and maybe them starting their own business and so on. That That's where my heart is at. Um, I'm not with the Band-Aid heart, I'm with the solution heart. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. So. A um, couple things. Um, well, I'm on the board next. So <coughs> Commissioner Ron has joined us on Zoom, and we'll be voting on this item, uh, along with Commissioner Baugh, who's on Zoom as well. Uh, but I wanted to address something that came up in public comment. I, I respect the, the man that came up to speak during public comment, but I'm going to disagree with some of the things he said. Um, I, I'm proud of the, the questions that the board asked today. Uh, I think they're necessary. It's It's a... It's a big responsibility being handed literally billions of dollars that is not your money and then being tasked with deciding how to allocate those funds uh, in a way that hopefully is strictly creates a public benefit um, and makes this community a better place and at the same time is fiscally conservative. So thank you all for coming, obviously. Uh, you came a long way and we appreciate that. Thank you for what you're wanting to do here in our community. We appreciate that as well. Um, but it's our, it's our jobs, it's our responsibility to ask these questions because the devil is in the details. And so it's important to sort of peel the layers back and, and find out exactly what this is going to look like before we move uh, any further forward and to, to give some sense of direction as to what the board wants it to look like as you move forward so that as you continue to, to structure this, you're structuring it in a way that is best suits Manatee County. Uh, I also respect the comments that Commissioner Bearden made about his past experiences and his friends' experiences, and that's that's what we are, right? All each of us, you know, ultimately is sort of the the total of our experiences, our life experiences, and so that's that's how we're up here governing and making decisions every day. Um, so I respect the comments that he made as well. Uh, I'm going Mr. to Mr. Chairman. Us. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. May it, when you're finished, may I? I'll add you to the list. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, ultimately, I'm, I'm going to support this. I didn't say it was a perfect site. Uh, I just said that it was. It is in my district, uh, and I'm proud to have this location, to have this site, and this project in my district. If that's what the board chooses, um, Commissioner Baugh, we'll turn it over to you, ma'am. Yes, just just real quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate everything that you just said. I, I could not agree more. Um, I was prepared to make those comments myself. So I, I think sometimes we forget that every bit of the money that we generally spend, it's taxpayer money, all the taxpayers. So, you know, we have to have money that we spend uh, in other areas. And uh, I, I, for one, do not regret the money that we just did on Premier. I think it was very well spent. I think any money that we spend where the residents are going to get a better quality of life 
uh, it makes it worthwhile. That's our job. And I, I appreciate Commissioner Bearden speaking up his comments. I thought they were right on the money and, and I took them into consideration. I as well will be supporting this because I think as we move forward, uh, some of the issues that we're having, uh, you know, perhaps we can, can uh, uh, you know, feel a little better about them, but I think it is a step in the right direction because after all, we do have veterans here that are not just homeless, but have issues. And we need to, uh, to think about that and thank them for the service they gave this country. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I, I would just add on one more thing that you and I were both touching on, and that's that not only are we stewards of this money, but this is money that was not voluntarily proffered by citizens. I have a pretty strong libertarian streak that runs through me, and I often remind myself that the, the monies that we are spending here were taken from our citizens by force, or at least by the threat of force. Um, gentlemen, I, I think you're in a good position here as we move forward with the vote, and I'm in sales, so oftentimes I stop talking when I think I've made the sale. Uh, but I see you all sort of on the edge of your seats like you want to address the board again. Would you like to speak? Long, um, sir. Yes, sir. If you'd like to speak, I'm giving you the opportunity now. It won't be long, sir. That's I your just decision. Want, I, I, I just wanted to thank the board, first of all, and thank Mr. Burton's uh, comments. It resonates in our heart because U.S. Vets prides itself in everything he just said. Uh, not the property, not the partnership here, but Tumble the Towers. Our number one partnership is with the veterans themselves. And... We all have a responsibility to give back to the community in which live, and we all have this different delegation of duty. And even though we're not officially elected in office to a political process, we are all uncles and aunts, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers of serving the veterans, and it's our job to take our goodwill and turn it to the fortune to others. So U.S. Vets prides itself on that. Thank you for those comments. We take them to heart, and service delivery is our number one service. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's a great closing. All right, commissioners, we've held public comment. Uh, we've had lengthy discussion, and there's no one else on the board at this time to speak. So at this time, let's move forward with our vote. Commissioners, you can cast your votes now. Commissioner Baugh, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Ron, how do you vote? Yes. All right. And so ultimately, Madam Clerk, this passes unanimously by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. Well done, Commissioner Cruz, as well. All right, it is 12.18. We're going to recess this meeting for lunch, and we will return at 1.30. We're in recess. All right, thank you, and welcome back. We do have four commissioners in the chamber, and a bad mic. Um, okay, we'll try again. So we have four commissioners.
Okay, we're back and all systems are go. So we'll go to item number 43, which is a public works item. Florida Department of Transportation, Cortez Vision and Action Plan. So we'll turn things over to Mr. Davis, sir. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Clark Davis, Deputy Director of Public Works Traffic Management, and I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. Keith Robbins. He's our um, District Safety Administrator for Florida Department of Transportation, District 1. He'll share with you some safety statistics for Cortez Road and then introduce his consultant to talk a little bit about the vision plan. So, um, Mr. Robbins. Thank you. I'm Keith Robbins, the District Safety Administrator for Florida Department of Transportation, District 1. And the slides that you see before you, I'm going to give you as a preamble to the, the proposition for a corridor vision plan on Cortez Road. Uh, this shows, based off of Signal 4 Analytics crash data, uh, for the last seven years, a total of 21 fatal crashes along this corridor, resulting in 22 fatalities for an average of three per year. 347 injury crashes with 455 serious injuries. Three of the top 10 segments on our top 20 list district-wide are on this stretch of roadway for fatal and serious injury crashes. 10 of the intersections rank in the top 5% of the most dangerous intersections in our district are on this roadway. And by pedestrian fatal and serious injury crashes, you can see the numbers there resulting in six and five fatalities respectively. Uh, what I'm telling you is uh, this is a very particularly dangerous stretch of roadway uh, for use uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are a number of things that we're looking to do to address this, uh, chief of which will come by two studies that will be done here in the very near term. One is a safety action plan on all state system roadways within Manatee County that we're doing in conjunction with Manatee County Public Works as part of the Safe Systems for All program. Uh, and then the second is the corridor vision plan that uh, Mr. Frank Kalpakis from Renaissance Planning Group will uh, explain to you now. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, board members. Uh, Frank Kalpakis with Renaissance Planning. Uh, we're under contract with uh, FDOT District 1 um, under their planning studio group. And the planning studio was um, established to get out in front of uh, transportation um, improvement plans to ensure that the transportation strategies align with a community vision, with an economic development strategy, with a safety strategy, um, environmental preservation strategy. And so we've been working with communities, partnering with communities to um, understand a vision that what the community wants, uh, develop transportation strategies that, that align with that vision and move the community forward uh, towards that vision. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the project study area is on Cortez Road, as Keith mentioned. It's from the bridge um, to 301 Boulevard. Uh, there, the right of way is uh, between 80 and 120 uh, feet. Um, it's a 10 mile, 10 mile stretch. Um, the purpose of the, uh, this plan, as I mentioned, is to develop an integrated land use and transportation strategy, uh, partnering with the community stakeholders to understand their desires for this corridor, the potential uh, for this corridor, and work with the community and stakeholders to develop strategies, both from a land use policy perspective and a transportation uh, strategy that are mutually supportive um, to, to, to move uh, closer to that vision. And so safety is going to be a big part of that. <clears throat> um, we'll develop an action, an action plan that's specific about uh, roles and responsibilities and who's, who's doing what, who's leading uh, different, different strategies, um, and, and just ensuring that we have a, a, a comprehensive uh, view and perspective of the corridor and developing a comprehensive strategy um, to, to uh, address the, the issues that, that we'll, we'll uncover. Uh, the schedule is uh, a year-long a year -long schedule. Um, we'll first uh, really work with the, with the county to kind of make sure that we're 
uh, and, and have a good understanding of, of the issues and the desires there. Um, we'll go through a dat data collection uh, process, really understanding, uh, doing a technical uh, track to, to understand uh, safety conditions, mobility conditions, uh, understand the current policies and opportunities uh, for the corridor. Uh, lots of engagement uh, with the community. We want to really partner uh, with them, work together uh, to understand, to develop, understand opportunities and translate those uh, into transportation strategies that, that, that again, line, align with uh, the desired vision. Uh, there will be also land use policies um, and, again, an implementation plan that kind of lays, lays out our track. Uh, and so, again, we're here to, to um, seek your support to, to move forward uh, with this study. Uh, we want to collaborate with, with your staff um, before we, in, in, in actually developing the scope to ensure that we're including everything that we want, we need to look at. Um, then we'll uh, hopefully kick off a project in June. I'm here to answer any, any questions, if anything I can clarify. Thank you, sir. Um, so. I'm on the board for questions, seem to be the only one. So my first question is, could I get these slides emailed to me? Yes. This presentation, I'd appreciate that. Second, there were a couple things that Mayor Brown and I were planning to, to bring forward to the MPO. One of them would be desail lanes on Manatee Avenue 64 and on uh, Cortez Road. Desail lanes that signal turn lanes at signalized intersections because there are multiple in West Bradenton that do not have those um, I could sit here and rattle them off, but you probably already know what they are mm -hmm. um, So is there some sort of you know Specific plan from FDOT or are you simply looking for here to look for feedback from us first? And if that's the case, I would start with desail lanes I would definitely look at that um, uh, and, uh, Among other things uh, and so I would I would propose that um, maybe we can actually meet with each of you individually, individually sure. kind of really understand that. I think that would okay. be very valuable to the, to the project. And, and another thing that we looked at in West Bradenton specifically where we have constrained roads or constrained right of what roads with constrained right of way, Cortez being one of them, was the, the ability for us to improve the flow at intersections specifically on Cortez Road. We, we've already done that on 43rd and Cortez Road, uh, but other intersections would be 26th Street, probably the most egregious, right? Um, and so we've looked at that from a county standpoint as far as widening, you know, going to dual lefts, going to dedicated rights, as well as the two through lanes. There's right-of-way acquisition that would be needed. 26th Street alone, we were ballparking that, including right-of-way act at, at around $8 million. Um, if there are opportunity for shared costs to help the county improve the safety on it's it's our road, but it's your road, right? Yeah. Um, so are there shared cost opportunities for intersection improvements? Oh, I keep dressing. Oh, he's just a safety guy. You handle the bills. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. There's always opportunities for shared costs, and, and we uh, in, enjoy having the county uh, participate in that manner because sometimes that can help projects move ahead sooner rather than later. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is a timeline because, you know, the MPO process, we, we love our MPO, uh, but the MPO process has a, a, an, extenu you know, an extended timeline, doesn't it? I mean, it tends to take three, four, five years to get something through the MPO process. And if that's the case, then that's the case. But you're here telling me that three people, three of our residents are dying every year on the road. So, you know, can we have an expedited process for Cortez Road since there is such an egregious safety concern? Uh, I'll give you the answer that I know from my department, and I'll let Frank uh, address any of the longer term. Uh, there are some that we can do as uh, <clears throat> operational improvements that can be done sooner rather than later. And when I talk about sooner, you know, not necessarily at the outer edge of the five-year work program. Uh, depending on what they are, they can be incorporated sooner using safety funds uh, and local funds as well. The fatalities, are they all... Is, are these all vehicular fatalities, or are you including pedestrian fatalities in there as well? Uh, that first chart included bicyclists, pedestrians, and vehicular. Okay. All right. I think that answers my questions. Commissioner Satcher, you're next on the board, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I hope that as you take a look at it, um, obviously, I, I think each of our state roads, which 
This is not pointing fingers. You know, we are uh, becoming intimately aware with the challenges of, of expanding a road and capacity and moving traffic and how many different players there are involved in the time and et cetera. And of course, y'all are, uh, that's what you do. Um, but I would love to, I'm excited that you're here taking a look at one of our state roads. I hope that we'll also look at, you know, 64 and 301. Um, and then I've, I've been, I've talked some with uh, our public works department about implementing a, you know, a traffic management system, something that times these lights uh, more effectively. Cause it's, you know, we all know it and I understand that it's probably sometimes just unavoidable, but when you see uh, the biggest light in town green, and nobody going through it because they're all stuck at a little side road right before mm -hmm. it and they can't get to that green light to clear the traffic out. Um, so any type of cost sharing, working together, planning to make something like that, um, I hope we'll really take a look at it because, you know, between Cortez, Manatee Avenue and 301, um, we could have a whole lot of, uh, you know, real progress and some happier residents. Uh, and then I was just talking to uh, to public safety the other day, and they were talking about the need for the lights that respond to our emergency vehicles that they can, mm -hmm. you know, that they have control over when they need to get through a light. So I hope we'll look at that as we go through this process. I appreciate you being here mm -hmm. and, uh, and and looking at one of our roads. Thank you. We're looking forward to working, working with you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, sir. And, and uh, I did put myself next on the board because I just wanted to piggyback off of Commissioner Satcher's comments, we we are looking at, we often speak publicly about aggressively looking to expand the capacity of our road system in an effort to move more vehicles and to, you know, to, to sort of improve flow. But safety, I'm glad you're here because safety is a huge aspect of this that um, oftentimes just doesn't sell as well to people because they don't think they're impacted by it on a daily basis. Uh, but that is an important factor, probably the leading factor in what we're trying to accomplish Commissioner Satcher's district, Moxon Wallow, is, is a road that's a, it's a local road. It's not a state road, uh, but it does connect two state roads, technically three state roads, right, if you include the interstate. Um, so it's an important, what will ultimately be an arterial for us. And that road has become a serious safety concern. And I did text, um, there was a horrible accident on Moxon Wallow three weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Um, and I did text our delegation that night, actually, when it happened, and I sent him a screenshot of the uh, our 901 dashboard. We had three helicopters on the ground at one time, and uh, they were cutting people out of cars. And it was a really gruesome situation at like nine o'clock on a Friday night. Uh -huh. um, and that's that's what we're trying to to protect people from. That's what we're trying to prevent. So I'm I'm glad you're here to talk about safety. Cortez doesn't even have really the option to expand the capacity. So this is strictly about safety. But I just want to make sure everyone knows that the capacity you know, that we're trying to, to add on a lot of these other roads, that safety is an integral part of that and it's tied to that. Absolutely. So, yeah. And multimodal safety will be a focus of this study for sure. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. I don't have anyone else on the board. Uh, I don't believe any action is needed here. I think you were presentation only and you'll follow up with us individually. Just want your support to move forward. We, we absolutely support All that. Right. Do we need to take a vote on that, Mr. Clegg? Well, it's styled as a report, but I see Clark kind of getting antsy. So the, um, there is an action requested in the uh, cover <clears> sheet, <throat> which is Manatee County support for Florida Department of Transportation continued development of the Cortez Road Vision Act and Action Plan. Is that something staff was looking for, Clark? <clears throat> I'd appreciate if staff would come to the microphone and say if you're asking for action from the board. I don't think it's my... Um, we would appreciate the motion of support, but um, we read the consensus as well. So if you don't, I, I think we, we know what to do from here. So moved. <laughs> so we have a motion Second. to support the initiative by Commissioner Ballard, seconded by Commissioner Cruz. Uh, we'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak or address the board on the motion on the floor? Okay, we're going to close public comments, seeing no one coming forward, and we'll move forward with the vote. I guess we'll do it on our screens. I was going to do it verbally, but that's okay. I like that you caught up. So motion by Ballard, second by Cruz. And Commissioner Baugh, how do you vote, ma'am? Yes. Commissioner Ron, how do you vote, sir? Okay. He didn't make it back from lunch. All right, so it passes unanimously, Madam Clerk, by a vote of six to zero with Commissioner Ron absent. All right, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank We're both of you for all that you do for us. We, we appreciate really it. Are. Yeah. All right, that takes care of item number 43. We'll move on to item number 44 on our regular agenda, which is public safety item, execution of a memorandum of understanding for remote site education at Bishop Animal Shelter between the School Board of Manatee County, DBA, doing business as Manatee Technical College, and Manatee County Government. Who is here from staff to present? Good afternoon, Sarah Brown, Division Chief for the Division of Animal Welfare. So I'm here to introduce item 44, the execution of a memorandum understanding for remote site education at the Bishop Animal Shelter. This mem memorandum of understanding would enter in between Manatee County Government and Manatee Technical College, establishing a partnership to co-locate a veterinary assisting program at the Bishop Animal Shelter intake facility. <clears throat> Manatee Technical College plans to offer an accredited veterinary assisting program for the benefit of the residents and work workplace preparation. This is a great opportunity to bring qualified workers to the field of veterinary medicine during a time of a national shortage. The Certified Veterinary Assistant Program is qualified through the Certified Veterinary Medical Association. The Bishop Animal Shelter has the capacity to offer a practical veterinary assisting experience working with animals for the students in the program, providing opportunities for observational and practice experiences at the shelter. This MOU establishes a partnership with Bishop Animal Shelter to locate the program at the facility. The program would prepare students with the necessary skills to work in a shelter setting or a veterinary hospital. Upon completion of the program, students would be eligible to take the Certified Veterinary Assistant exam. It would consist of 750 hours for the certification, approximately four days a week, eight to noon. Uh, take approximately 188 days to complete. It consists of both classroom time and lab time. And some of the notable cor coursework items would include, but are not limited to, the human-animal bond and its effects on human health, veterinary science terminology, careers in, in the industry, safety, animal behavior, animal restraint, basic first aid, preventative medicine and disease control, vital signs and diagnostic testing, microscope, urinalysis, fecal, blood analyzer, husbandry, proper sanitation, laws, statutes, and ordinances, record keeping, surgical preparation and assistance, and pharmacology. Overall, the program comes at a time when there is a huge need in the industry. This partnership would not only provide practical experience to students, but hopefully inspire some work in shelter medicine. Ma'am, if I could questions? help you summarize this real quick. So sure. at a time when you're having a labor shortage, we're talking about free labor for Manatee County, right? We are talking about free labor for Manatee County. It would, <laughs> okay. it would, it would give some great opportunities for people to work in our medical, in our medical area. Just trying to help you speak our language. <laughs> uh, let's go. Cruz and Ballard are on the board. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, this is just an amazing opportunity. And when we first started talking about Bishop, MTC reached out almost immediately. Uh, you know, MTC is a critically important part of our education system here in Manatee County. And they're always looking for these unique ways, whether it's training people up at the jail or, or anything out on the field to, to make them a world-class, uh, you know, facility. And this opportunity, as, as the chair said, to effectively get free help at, at our clinic at, at Bishop, coupled with them immediately probably becoming one of the preeminent you know, uh, teachers in this field, uh, that's a needed field that, that we desperately need to train more people. And it's just such a great public-private partnership to all work together to improve not one but two different institutions here in Manatee County. I'm so happy to see this finally move forward. I will comment, I think the MOU <clears throat> may have a typo in it only because it's a three-year term which seems a little short by the time they actually advertise this and get up and running um maybe they'll get it done by the start of the 2003 season or or class season but it says three years but it says it expires in like june 2025 that's only a two-year we actually started negotiating it last year so i think we probably you're probably okay so we just need to update that based on the, the current day okay so it's three effectively it will be three years from execution of the agreement three years from execution but it does have a um, uh, 
various ways that either party can get out of it. Understood. When that's Understood. But, but they're building out, unless I'm, I'm mistaken, they're building out the, the house there for classroom space. So they're putting meaningful dollars in it. They're not just taking advantage of a free clinic. Not that we would care. That Even that in and of itself is a good opportunity. But they're going to be putting real capital and, and effort into creating this for presumably the long term. It, it, for the, for the short term right now, and that's really where we're looking uh, to starting this program in January, and it would be housed in that kind of living room area of the house that we would turn into a classroom setting. We're talking about eight students um, for this course to begin, and then we'll grow it from there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ballard. So this was actually initially on the consent agenda, and I just think that it is such a wonderful opportunity for MTC, for the county, uh, that I wanted to make sure that we were able to highlight it publicly because it is a really a really great thing for, for these students who are getting trained. It's a really great thing for, for the county and for Bishop getting, getting that uh, critical support staff that we that we need for free um, so it's just a, a win win and I'm so excited to see it uh, to see it go forward and excited to see the program grow and expand and, and become all that it can be okay uh, commissioner commissioner Ron I'm told is now on uh, commissioner Ron or commissioner Baugh, do either of you want to make comment oh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with Commissioner Ballard, too, this is a great thing that we're doing. I mean, we consistently see that we need to help the, the animal shelter, and I, I mean, I'm all for it. So whatever we need to push us along, let's do it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Ball, do you have any comments? Yes, sir. Thank you. Just wanted to say congratulations to Sarah Brown. Uh, she and I have had many conversations, and I know that she's got a lot of good things in the work. And this is just the first of many coming forward. So congratulations on this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, I love this. And, uh, you know, once you get the new building, eventually, um, try and work USF into a, an actual vet, not, you know, vet tech, but then see if you can work with USF to bring vets in as well. Take all the free labor we can get. That would be amazing. All right. Um, we'll open this up to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one, we'll close public comment. There's no one on the board for discussion. Ballard has made a motion to approve. Cruz has seconded. We can cast our votes now. Commissioner Baugh? Yes. Commissioner Ron? Yes. All right, so Baugh and Ron say yes. Everyone says yes. It's unanimous approval, 7-0, to zero, Madam Clerk. All right, thank you so much. All right, we will move on then to item number 45. Mr. Hunsaker is here. Natural Resources Environmental Lands Program Update and Environmental Lands Management and Acquisition Committee, LMAC, recommendations. Mr. Hunsaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On April 3rd, LMAC had the opportunity during one of their regular me scheduled meetings to continue the process of evaluating properties, self-nominated or nominated by others, for evaluation for acquisition on the environmental lands program or control through a conservation easement process. And among other topics that they covered on April 3rd were two uh, primary properties uh, that we are bringing forward for recommendation through the committee structure uh, for your consideration. Um, I'll save my comments for, for later, uh, only to say that these are two just wonderful projects and properties uh, meeting some of the criteria that we've set forth. And Deborah Wirth, who is our Environmental Lands Program Division Manager, will be making our presentation today. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's Deborah Wirth, Environmental Lands Program Manager. Um, as Mr. Hunsaker mentioned, we have really two properties that we're here to um, present to you on behalf of LMAC. Um, our last board meeting, we heard some comments about reviewing our process and procedures. So I wanted to just start off by saying that I included in today's agenda packet some information for you to consider. Um, there's a, a flow chart for our process. There's a, an example of um, a work plan template that is for one of the properties that this board's already approved for due diligence. And also the Florida Forever appraisal methods are written out 
and um, we have put together our LMAC orientation packet in digital form. And so we can provide that to each of you in case you want to peruse all the things that LMAC considers when they review properties and go about their business. So I have some um, by the number statistics here, but you'll also find in the packet is a summary table. And I'm trying to sort of size things up for you there. You'll see at the top are um, the properties that you've already approved for due diligence. The just values are in there, some other basic criteria. Um, the two properties that you're considering today, the four or five properties below that, that LMAC is considering at their next meeting May 1st. And then below that are some properties LMAC has considered that were lower priority that aren't coming to you, at least not at this time. And then lastly, at the very bottom are some that are no-goes according to commission. So um, there will be more coming. You know, this is a, a rolling, evolving process. So um, there will certainly be more. There's also a map that shows you location of each of those candidate properties relative to each other countywide. Very simple map. So a brief review for everyone that's not familiar. Um, the basic criteria, the four criteria that are considered for prioritizing land for conservation acquisition have been in the ordinance since 2003 and they're fundamental to land acquisition pretty much everywhere. We look at the ecological quality of the species or habitat on site, the rarity of the species or habitat on site, connectivity with other conservation lands for wildlife corridors, and also the importance to water resources. So given the referendum language that funded conservation land acquisition in 2020, there were very specific things on that ballot. And they are essentially part of those four criteria, but we've called them out individually so that we check those off and indicate yes or no, whether the drinking water protection, water quality protection, prevention of stormwater runoff pollution, preservation of fish habitat, preservation of wildlife habitat, and provision of parks are being met. So we're accountable for how this money is being spent. The additional considerations that come into play, of course, are um, somewhat more human-based. For managing parks and preserves, if there's an out parcel, a property that's within it that's privately owned, it makes it more difficult to manage, irregular boundaries, things like that. You know, we're looking at cost effectiveness here. So there are some properties that um, we hope to bring forward that will help with that. And I plan to go about including all those in a list, not necessarily identifying the property owners, but just to give you an idea of how many acres, how many parcels, and what the just values of those properties are. We also look at the public benefits, what it brings to the community, if it's a community that doesn't have an existing park in the area, and of course, the cost. If the owner is giving a discount, what our partner funding supports, and of course, we're always trying to optimize the use of those referendum funds and sort of pick and choose which partners we work with, depending on the type of the project, so that we can really stretch our dollars in conjunction with those partners. So one of the mentions that we've made in the past, um, you know, sorry if I'm repeating if you've heard this before, but for the stormwater runoff pollution, uh, we've thought through that as professionals, what does that really mean? What does it not mean? And there is opportunity when you buy conservation land to improve water quality. For instance, taking a ditch or a stream that's been straightened, having it meander, vegetation that's being used. Um, um, and then there's also potential for flood mitigation as well. So the referendum funds, we don't understand to be interpreted to be intended for the gray infrastructure, the, the, the pipes, the steel structures, and the concrete that would be used to, um, for treatment or typical stormwater ponds. But certainly projects that involve that could bring other funding sources in to accomplish greater goals together. So the first of the two projects that are being recommended unanimously by LMAC we're referring to is Emerson Point expansion. This 98 acre property is adjacent to Emerson Point, but it truly stands on its own merit as a conservation acquisition because of the resources it offers. 54 of the acres are in pasture. The remaining is uh, wetland. There's about a half a mile of mangrove shoreline that's along Terracea Bay Aquatic Preserve, which is an outstanding Florida waterway. So these sort of support manatee, fisheries, water quality, 
and other species as well. It's also along an existing blue way, and there's access by kayak or canoe in Emerson Preserve, Point Preserve that would allow um, along this shoreline for the blue way. This property for many years has been on the Florida Forever list for acquisition. And the 2021 five-year plan for Terracia considers it an essential remaining parcel. And this map shows you um, from the Terracia Florida Forever five-year plan. The property is on the very southern border of this map right there on Sneed Island. So this brings with it the possibility of a 75% contribution from Florida Forever. We've discussed the property with them in partnering. We don't know what that percentage would be yet, but based on past experience, it could be 75%. We've also discussed the property with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. And um, there's a letter of support they provided. I put it at your um, desktop there. I forgot to include it in the agenda item. <laughs> it is on our dashboard with the candidate properties. Um, it's included in there for the public to see. And the Estuary Program offers annual grants uh, referred to as their TBIRF program. And this property with its restoration to more native conditions would be eligible for about $250,000 for restoration and for management. It would be eligible in the next funding cycle. And we've already discussed some of the things that could be done, including some tidal creeks, some um, salt marshes, and <clears throat> different features that would be beneficial to the environment and for improving water quality. Uh, public access is um, fairly straightforward there. It's easy to provide. Um, we could have basic public access with a small parking lot near the entrance for about 15 cars and extend trails so that they connect with the existing Emerson Point Preserve. There is a lot of pressure on that park because of the visitors. And if you've been there on a weekend or a holiday, you've probably noticed that all the parking spaces are full and people are looking for other places to park to enjoy. Uh, Mike Elswick is poised and ready to put together sort of an a la carte table with cost estimates for the amenities that could be provided. Of course, we could add in a restroom. You could have boardwalks that go out to the water for fishing, etc. The long-term management cost would be low because it is adjacent to Emerson Point. It wouldn't add substantially to those costs for resource management long-term. The property is currently being offered by the Eschenball Land Company. They refer to it as a Sneed Island project. And the family that owns it has um, four acres that they would like to reserve for themselves for a future home site. It's up in the northeast corner, and yes, we would need to provide access to that home site from the um, entrance of the property. There's currently just a small home that's there that was built in 1937 and renovated in 1977. Very small um, value to that home relative to the overall property. They do um, aspire to have the rights and permits to develop 98 home sites there. The price has been reduced to 16 million. Um, I imagine that price will continue to come down. Just looking at the just value alone in the property appraisers database, it's about 2 million. Our in-house team, <coughs> excuse me, wasn't comfortable doing an in-house value opinion because the property is so unique, but we have an appraiser um, that is sort of in the queue that could have um, an official appraisal back to us in about four weeks. So um, do you have any questions before I go on to the second property? We do. Let's, let's stop. This is, a big, this is the big one, I think. So why don't we stop and talk about this one for a minute? Cruz, Ballard, and Van Austin Bridge is the speaking order. Commissioner Cruz. And yeah. Commissioner Baugh, do you want on the board or Commissioner Ron? Not at this time. Commissioner Ron? Not this time. Okay. Cruz, Ballard, and Van Austin Bridge. All right. So the question is, do we get an appraisal and, and work on it? I mean, because it's sixteen million. Let, let's be honest. This this parcel is great. I mean, I I love this this opportunity. Uh, I love Emerson Point and and making Emerson Point even bigger and more accessible to everyone is something we should one hundred percent be looking at. Um, it's just a quite you know everything just comes down to we have a pool of fifty million dollars. Everything's opportunity cost, and even with seventy five percent share, it's four million bucks. It's almost ten percent of the fifty million dollars. 
um, depending on where that comes out. But relative to if, if we're doing the same thing we always are, which is just basically giving direction to continue moving forward to see where we get. I mean, I, I can't imagine a scenario where we wouldn't at least entertain this. It's, it's too important of a piece of property to not put our best foot forward and see how we can make something like this work. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan, as you know, of, of just blowing 50 million bucks on acquisitions. I mean, just so all you know, just for disclosure, we've been talking, we sat down what, last week, week and a half ago, and pulled out maps because I'm trying to figure out how to use some of this money and create a meaningful wildlife corridor from Mayaka State Park all the way up through Duet up to Little Manatee and, and create a real wildlife, which, which will effectively create a, a, a fire line be, for development. It'll also create a meaningful wildlife corridor, and the state's making a big effort to go all the way from you know, a, a wildlife corridor all the way down to the Everglades at some point. That's a great opportunity with this money, and you can do a lot of that with easements and so forth, cheaper than purchase. But some properties are just going to require purchase. <clears throat> if we're going to look at a purchase property, this is one of them that I would 100% support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so this is this is in my district, and an additional 94. I agree with regarding this property. I agree with everything that Commissioner Cruz said about the opportunities for this property. It, it brings Emerson not quite to the size of Robinson, but about maybe a half the size of Robinson. Right? It, it certainly gets it into that that realm, um, it would essentially double the size of, of Emerson Point, wouldn't it? A third you know more. Many, sorry? A third more. A third more? How many acres is, is, is Emerson? 150? It, Emerson is 360 acres. Oh, wow. From a uh, bird eye view to what appears to be green versus water. But okay. the landed, landed acreage is around 170 acres to 180. Okay. Okay, so my buck fifty wasn't too far off, and then and how many acres of wetland? Put it this way: how many acres of uplands do we have out of this ninety-four acres? I'm just trying to come up, help myself with a valuation here. Less 60. than fifty. Yeah. Less than fifty out of ninety-four, um, and it looks like there's some wetlands, you know, sort of jetting through the middle of the property. Also, is that accurate? Okay. It's been um, in rangeland for many years, and there are cattle out there, and there are ditches, so it's it's been drained, but. This site was very wet. Yeah, it, Commissioner Cruz is whispering to me over here. It ain't worth sixteen million bucks. Uh, oh, he's whispering to himself that it's, it ain't worth sixteen million bucks. And um, well, he, I mean, it's it's that's an obvious statement. Um, it's worth more than two, which I see you have on there. But but you're you're right. I, I don't in house. This is tough. I wouldn't. I I don't know that I'd put too much effort into it the valuation in house, I think I would go out and get an appraisal. Um, I'm sort of salivating, like I want it badly. Uh, yeah, I think, but, let's be honest, I think we all want it, right? It's just, you know, Commissioner Johnson used to say, the answer to every question is money, and, and that's where we are, it's just money. I, I was gonna add, so does the state of Florida. Uh, for 18 years, this has been on their buy list and have been unable to make headway with the property owners. So, so talk to me about that, Charlie, because, you know, you helped bring State of Florida, you know, Florida Forever monies into Emerson Point to purchase that. Is 75% of the money for Emerson Point purchase was Florida Forever money. Correct. I need you to wave your magic wand and do that all over again here, get them to pay 75% of the bill. Um, but, but, but seriously, realistically, what, what are our opportunities with Florida Forever and this property? I mean, in, in your honest opinion, which we value. So, well, certainly better than a, a project that does not, that is not surrounded by existing Florida holdings, uh, state of Florida holdings. Uh, certainly better than a property that would be, have a new nomination come, coming forward because this has been historically on the buy list. And, and, and it's been, I think, and will continue to be, uh, much like Rattlesnake Key, uh, a matter of value whether or not the owner is willing to accept a conservation value for the property or uh, absent that, whether or not if, if we establish a conservation value by appraisal following the state procedures, whether or not uh, a second or third party is able to come forward and make up the difference, so to speak. Uh, but when we say what is the value of this property, our answer has always been it will be determined by the state appraisal process. And... Um, 
and we work from there. Uh, we've, we've spoken the, undoubtedly this, uh, the company that represents the owner is moving to try to uh, optimize the value in a speculative or a real estate market. And, um, but there's certain risks that go with that. Uh, they may not get the rezoning density that they're seeking. Uh, they may not get the sewer services they would need to, uh, to develop this property. There are a lot of ifs, ands, and buts. Um, getting insurance and developing coastal properties these days is getting more and more difficult. Yeah. So we're hoping that um, an appraisal will take all these things into account and that the family uh, who controls this property would be willing to give this consideration. Yeah, and and good comment about sewer services because sewer has made it out to Amber Wind via the city of Palmetto, even though it's unincorporated Manatee County. Right. Um, so sewer is essentially available. I mean, it's it's virtually up to the property. Um, okay, so so our chances are much better than average. No, of course, yes, yes, they are very much so. Okay, um, that makes me feel good. Um, no one else is on the board. Uh, Commissioner Baugh or Ron, do you have any comments? None. Commissioner Ron? I'm on meeting. Uh, no, I don't, sir, but I will tell you this. Um, last week, I had a great sit down with Charlie and the staff on everything LMAC, and I would highly recommend that the other commissioners do it too. It was very informative about the process, how it works, about the properties that are coming up. So I think that might be a good thing to have, uh, a monthly briefing um, with, LMAC, with the LMAC team. That's it, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, should we move on and look at the other, th the other two and then, and then come back to voting? There's one other? I'm sorry. Just one. <laughs> He's been bringing them to us in threes. I'm a creature of habit. <laughs> right. uh, okay, so let's move on to the second one, and then we'll give us a chance to sort of percolate, and then we'll come back to this. Right. Okay. Um, I do have a disclosure. I live on Sneed Island. I live within a mile of um, this proposed property. And as an active part of the community, I have been hearing from um, neighbors asking, you know, what was going on. And so... You should see our inboxes. We're, I, we're yes, aware. Yes, sir. So, um, so I, when I answer them, I answer via my, my work email or my work text. So it's all public record. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, all right. So our second of the two properties today is the Mix and Fruit Farm. And this was actually nominated um, as a stormwater park. And it's a very unique opportunity in that... Um, this you know, wouldn't really be considered for its natural resources in and of itself, the habitat rarity, the habitat quality, or the connectivity. It's within an urban area, but it does provide an outstanding opportunity for improving, improving water quality and also mitigating for flood. So this property is already part of a study that's been going on with our public works department and Southwest Florida Water Management looking at exactly those things. It is a strong candidate to receive funds for improving flood and water quality. They don't know exactly what that will be yet, but within a month or two, we'll probably have the results of the study that would tell us more specifically how the property would work and perhaps how much it would cost and how much of a cost share from water management district there would be. So um, very timely uh, nomination for sure. <coughs> there is 1,500 feet along Glen Creek that winds through the property. It's you know essentially channelized. And as a historic orange grove, you know, there are drains that go into it. Um, the, let's see, I feel like I'm missing something. Um, okay, so I think I can move to the next slide. So the, it is a 39 acre site. Uh, the pictures up top here are from the Mix and Fruit Farm um, website, although we did do a site visit last week and our photographs from the site visit are on the dashboard so anyone can see them. <coughs> there's a large warehouse in the southwest corner and um, there's an organization called CityServe that I believe you'll hear from today, they're here, and they're gonna tell you about what they do and they have an interest in purchasing the four acres around that warehouse to continue the work that they do to serve um, those in need with the products that they receive. The, the, the merchandise that they receive. There's also a restaurant and a gift shop that's in that warehouse. 
Um, right now, um, CityServe is using one corner of that warehouse, but they have an interest in buying it and expanding to use the entire building. There's also a playground, there are tram tours, you can do field trips, summer camps. Um, it's a great place to explore as an adult and especially as a kid. Uh, many of us in the community um, know about our experiences or our kids' experiences there. I've been hearing a lot about that lately. There's also a, um, a wildlife rehabilitation on site. They have a number of different animals that you can see. Some of them hold in touch. There's a wedding venue that is revenue generating. I believe um, Janet Mixon will probably tell you more about that. But for instance, I think it's in the order of 7,000 rental for the venue. They have a home on site along the southern border that they rent out for the, um, the guests of the wedding. And they are flexible in whether they would sell the home with or without the property. We could, we could go either way on this one. There's also a lot of family and agricultural history there that um, is certainly worth preserving in and of itself. So as far as this proposed stormwater park, in addition to those features that we just talked, I just mentioned, um, there could be some tra trails woven through. Uh, the, the image that you see was provided by the, the nominator, Damon Moore, and it shows some areas that could be water with trails going through. These are very popular for bird watching. Uh, there's a stormwater park in Sarasota County that's gotten a lot of attention and is very popular lately. It's been very successful. Uh, there could also be environmental education. We could continue field trips for those. And um, so that's the overview. Let's see. The home, yes, so the home could be part of the acquisition or excluded from the ac acquisition. It's a lovely home. Um, and there are pictures of the inside on the realtor's website. So I did skip the um, in-house value opinion that was done for this property. Um, it was based on vacant lands, so it doesn't consider the improvements that are there, but it is about 10, 11 million dollars. The current ask price is um, 15 million. So um, in talking with the owner, I think we have a reasonable agreement that we could come to between the vacant land and house value opinion estimate and um, what they expect uh, from the property. So I think we have a very promising opportunity here to work with this, um, the owner, and create some value to our community in terms of water quality and flooding. Um, one more note, the development of Tropicana and the areas around it was done before 1980 when the stormwater rules went into place. And so there's really not any stormwater treatment that's happening for their ar those areas. And adding stormwater treatment into this site, collecting water from the areas upstream could be a benefit for water quality downstream. Alyssa's here for any specific questions about that. And uh, I was also going to m mention that there's anecdotal uh, reasons for stormwater quantity control uh, following the construction of the 301 bypass. Uh, it seems that it changed the, the topography sufficiently enough that there was an immediate increase in storm flow through the properties, uh, both when it was a grove and now the current farm. And uh, so there's some makeup there perhaps that needs to be done at this, at this property location itself. The, insofar that this is more of a unique property, not so much for its conservation value, but also for its combined stormwater uh, control, um, I think it probably bears an opportunity to give the representatives of the Mixon family here an opportunity to speak perhaps in more detail than would normally be offered in a three minute uh, moment since it is their property, yeah. and perhaps we could entertain and ask them to approach as well if they would be willing. Okay, before Mr. we do that, though, yes, um, we do have some commissioners on the board, and, and really before we get started at all, this is very good, and I just wanted to say to Deborah, not just today, but the previous properties, you do a great job of laying these out, for, I think she does a great job of laying these out, pros, cons, visuals, you know, everything. I, I really en I enjoy these, and I feel like I... Most of us kind of know these, you know, where they are, have been on the properties anyway, but we don't think of it necessarily in these terms. And so, anyway, I just think you do a really good job at, of, of the way you lay these out, pros, cons, everything. Thank you, um, Cruz, Ballard, and <coughs> I'll take myself off the board. Cruz and Ballard. 
Yeah, here's my here's my question. I mean, it, it's a great property, and and honestly, it's there's a lot of development going on there. Not a lot of parks there. I think there's a lot of opportunity for this property. I think valuing it based upon what's currently there is probably a little. It's not really how I would value it, since the stuff that's there isn't really the concept of the acquisition in the first place. We're not buying buildings with environmental land funds, so valuing. Where else? And if CityServe comes and they're buying that four acres, that's pretty much taking up that portion anyway. So it's not really a proportional if you're going to value the entirety of it, inclusive of wedding venues and warehouses and all these other spaces that aren't really part of a stormwater park per se. It's, it's two different values. There's the usable commercial piece, and then there's the excess orange grove piece, which is more on the lines of what we're looking at. My question here is why does this fall under you like this to me falls under two different buckets neither of which are this set of funds I, i'm 100 percent on board with moving forward let me clarify that 100 yeah. percent on board with looking into this but it sounds to me like th this could be used for one of two things utility funds because they need storm water and 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 things of that nature and we have funds for that in theory i'm sure evan doesn't want me to say that out loud but but that's the intent of it it's not environmental we're not protecting a turtle or anything with this we're not we're not we're fixing water quality it's storm water which is utilities and they purchase land for that purpose or you look at it and say there's that whole big project that was built right next to it and then you've got other house coming on you got the roundabout coming and the 7-eleven and there's more development encroaching this direction let's lock down a piece where we can have a nice central park type area to retain some green space for the citizens and that's parks both of those have, have a good use. Both of those, I'm on board with looking at this property forward. My question is, how in your mind does this, are we just looking for, for pockets of money to buy something? Or is this truly, in light of it, I mean, you, don't forget, you just proposed an expansion of Emerson Point. I just mentioned a wildlife corridor. Mm -hmm. Those are, in my mind, real environmental land fund type funds when you're talking about a Fifty million dollar bucket. This to me doesn't seem like it's in the the heart of those types of projects in terms of being environmentally sensitive land for use of that fund. And I want to make sure, in light of the fact it's a very finite amount of dollars, mm -hmm. that we're using those fifty million dollars where they should be. Because once they're gone, they're gone. Right. Whereas once you know you have the utility dollars and park dollars, we've got those funds, whether it be through impact fees or rates or, or bonding, right. to, to still purchase the same property at the same price, but make sure we're purchasing it out of the right bucket of money before we deplete this one. Right. Just again, like, and you and I have talked about it, and you've disagreed with my sentiment, and I, I wasn't saying it negatively. I was just saying, you know, we're, we're kind of on a first come, first serve basis here as they're being presented, and you've explained that's not the case. But well, once this goes, if it's really 10 to $15 million and we don't have a sufficient amount of matching funds, that's a meaningful percentage. I, I'm on board with acquiring it. I think it's a good use of, of funds. I just don't know if this is the right funds for that. Well, if you would like to find other funds to use to purchase this, you would not hurt my feelings at all. That would be wonderful. Um, maybe we're just a catalyst. <laughs> No, absolutely. So I, I get the I get the the jest, but it's an honest question. We have a checklist of what qualifies for environmental land. Right. This to me doesn't feel like it checks off the number. If, like if we were looking at a bunch of nonprofits with children's services, they rank everything right. before they bring them back to us. Here we rank them on a one by one basis. And it's like, did it check a box? Okay, what's well, presented because it was it was presented. And so using the checklist that's on your screen now, you know, if we look at these four basic criteria, three of the four, no. Um, we are getting water resource improvement from our basic LMAT criteria. Now, the, the bottom bullets are specifically from that referendum language. And so drinking water, no. Water quality, yes. Because in addition, see, enhancing these stormwater treatment are opportunities for water quality for biological improvements to put plants down and create habitat that attract birds and other wildlife. So that's sort of an add-in that we anticipate having funding sources to help with. You're still valid, I completely understand, just looking at the checklist. Um, so we have the stormwater runoff and you know it is gonna you know preserve some fish habitat and provide parks. Well, if you consider an improvement of water quality downstream and that fish do live in some streams, yes. You could literally bet my house to check out. Well, okay. So, 
so, um, and, and that is also why we put this consideration here about the stormwater runoff pollution. So I don't think the funds from the referendum apply toward making all the improvements. And the concept was that we would work together with public works and other funding sources to, to pull this off, that perhaps the environmental millage would be used for the land purchase and then other funds would be used for the improvements. And, and the, used for the land purchase in concert with the public works purpose of, of finding a stormwater outlet in this, in this area, in this watershed. I, I think we are, we are sponsoring, we're sponsoring this application as much uh, for its environmental values as we see them and uh, we would look to our utilities, public stormwater program partners to uh, help us with the stormwater quantity, flooding protections. That this and when you bring it back, fund. that'll be kind of laid out yes. in terms of how yes. this funding would work when we make an actual final decision. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ballard. So I think that Commissioner Cruz's comments are, are very well taken. Um, that, that being said, um, I, I agree with Commissioner Cruz that um, this is a really important piece of land for Manatee County. I think that um, it, it's in my district. We are very, very low on, on parks, places for kids in this area. It's developing quickly, and we have the opportunity to save a, a, a beautiful swath of land right in the middle of this urban area to have a, a green space, I think is it's hugely important for the people who live here um, and who live in District 2 and, you know, deserve a park as much as, as, much as people, uh, you know, up in Terracia or out in Parrish. Um, and we have less of an opportunity for that. We have less of an opportunity in, for that in District 2 because we're, we're, we're built up. It's infill. Um, so... I would like I, I would like to see every option explored for how how the county can can utilize this property, um, whether that purchase is is through LMAC, whether it's in conjunction um, with with utilities uh, with parks. I I would like to see every option explored because I do I do think it's very important and um, and it would be a shame just to see. I think it's kind of that last remaining swath that we that we have in this area, and also I there is significant significant flooding in in this area on 27th. You cannot improve that road in a way that's going to uh, help deal with that flooding. Um, improving the water quality downstream, I think, is a is a wonderful laudable goal. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see this come forward, and I will, I will definitely m vote to move it forward and um, just encourage any, any way that we can, can try to acquire this property. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Van Austinbridge and Satcher are next on the board. Charlie, a couple quick questions. One is going to be, I'm going to throw you in. Well, I guess I'm going to give you a suggestion first. Uh, I like Cruz and Ballard's ideas of trying to bring in utilities money. I think public works money because public works is stormwater, not utilities. Uh, so I throw that in there. And then lastly, you learn a lot of interesting things when you have this job. So there are, for those of you in the public, there are actually are elevation you know, variables in Florida, despite you, know, you don't think the land, we have that much elevation difference in, in our land, but we actually do. So my question would be is, is what is the elevation of this, this Mixon property in, in terms of um, 27th? I mean, how much of 27th really could drain into this property? Because we're not, you know, for those of you in the audience, what I'm saying is we're not pumping water uphill. So it's going to, it's all gravity flow. So it's going to have to flow down, downhill. So is this a collection point? The, excuse me, the Glen Creek, Glen Creek, my goodness, Glen the Creek. Glen yeah. Creek watershed uh, study is ongoing to answer that very question. Okay, so we're not there yet. And then Thank you. Uh, throw a suggestion out there. Uh, the city of Bradenton is sort of shaped like a jigsaw puzzle, the city limits, right? And, which is on, to the annoyance of them as well as us. But um, 
it's sort of all around this property. And so there's going to be a, a net benefit to the, to the city of Bradenton Public Works as well. So if we're cost sharing, <laughs> right? Okay, if we're cost sharing, you know, call Gene Brown up and uh, see what we can get out of them while we're at it. Uh, I'm interested in this. It's not like the my I love the property, right? Obviously, we all love the mix-ins. Um, I kind of share some of Commissioner Cruz's uh, thoughts and that, man, it's a lot of money. It's a significant chunk of a fixed pot of money that we have. Um, I would, you know, of the two that we're looking at today, I would much rather put the money into Emerson because I think it goes more towards what people thought they were voting for when they approved the millage. Um, but that said, I'm not committing to to Emerson yet because it's all about money and, and at 16 million, we are way far apart. Um, so There is a large family of institutional partners that are interested in this property as well. I'm sure. Uh, as, it, as it drains to the Braden River, it joins with the Manatee. This is in the Tampa Bay uh, Estuary Program site and also in the, in, in the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program site. So work here to uh, incorporate water quality improvements which could be supported, would be supported by them financially. Uh, the Water Management District also has an interest in not only funding the study, but oftentimes when the study is approved by the district, then projects flow from that, from di district funds to help us make the construction changes that we want. And it may, not, it, it may be that the Glen Creek watershed requires this fix at this spot and also other work both upstream and downstream. Uh, so it would be part of a, of a comprehensive uh, sure. flood protection program. Okay. Um, so I'm likely to vote yes to move forward with both of these. However, knowing that I'm a long way from, from a yes on final approval on either of them, Emerson Point is simply a money issue, I think. Uh, this, this one is also a money issue, but I want to see where, the, where all that money is going to come from. The valuation is is justified on this property. I'm not going to lie to you on that. It's it's developable land that can probably annex into the city of Bradenton, which is going to greatly increase their density. And um, so they're going to they're going to call for a stiff price, and they're ultimately going to get it. I'm aware of that, and we may not have the funds to to buy it. But Commissioner Satcher, and then Commissioner Baugh or Commissioner Ron, would you like to be on the board? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chair. I'm good. Thank you. Commissioner Ron? I'm good, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Satcher, you carry us out here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to ask you to go back to the slide with the checklist. Oh, sure. Explain to me the, the very last one on the referendum language. So this would be what people actually voted for in 2020. Uh, the very last one, provision of parks. Is the idea, I mean, I need to take a look at the referendum itself, but is the idea behind that that you could take this LMAC money, the funds, buy, you know, a larger parcel with the knowledge that you're also going to take a portion of that and provide it for parks later, or am I missing, what is that supposed to mean? Well, if, if I can help answer that, that, that was designed around the concept that we're currently working with at Bennett Park. What? That, that's, that was designed around a concept we were working with at Bennett Park, where portions of that property provide a true environmental value, water quality, and habitat for the Manatee River. And we, we work it as such. There are other portions of that property that provide open space for athletic fields, uh, playgrounds, and parking. And parks, in this case, sports and, sports and leisure services, would be supporting that. So when the concept of, of parks was introduced with this referendum, it was in, my, in mind with conservation type activities and passive activities in a park-like setting. It was, not, it was not discussed in the literature or in the frequently asked questions that led up to the vote to, in, to indicate that we were, we were offering that this would allow us to purchase parks for uh, athletic purposes, baseball, football, soccer, and all, the, and swimming pools, but it was designed to um, in in the in areas where a conservation park. Uh, a good example is Conservancy Park in Palmer, uh, which is truly a park-like setting for conservation. Uh, there's there's that was one example, or where we had a larger piece of land, uh, which could provide both. 
and looking then in those circumstances where the environmental millage could help acquire those sections and improve those properties for habitat and, and passive trail uh, uh, um, recreation like Emerson Point may offer us if we acquire that. But um, trying, to, trying to draw that separation line, because truly we have many millions of dollars of future parks that we want to pursue. Um, uh, but we were hoping that, and I believe the voters were uh, comforted by the fact that the, the dialogue around the referendum was that when we speak about parks for environmental lands, it was going to be conservation, habitat, water quality, and educational pursuits through those natural areas. Uh, why Mixon's has, gives that opportunity to us here is because, as has as been, been mentioned, there is very limited opportunity for that type of environmental passive um, pursuit in and around what will be in and around the stormwater improvements that are there. Uh, we don't. In, we, we would not intend to leave a rectangular stormwater pond that you might see along a major road improvement, but we would, it, we would spend the environmental millage to really upgrade the, the habitat value of that water feature, provide educational uh, interpretation of that water feature, conduct those tours and, and park visits from school kids and our own, our own customers and clients uh, to learn about how nature improves an urban watershed, and uh, that—that's what I hope I answered your question. So, like on this property, I mean the um, the wedding venue. I mean, we wouldn't be looking to you know, something that would be useful either as park or as part of your conservation. I mean, you're not going to take something like that and tear it down when it should fit pretty well into one of the two visions correct um, that exist right so and, we're not yes in be... fact in fact we have wedding venues at Robinson Reserve right uh, for that very purpose so I, I mean I just see uh, there's a lot of different possibilities and I don't necessarily know that it'll come together perfectly but I could definitely see it um, you know coming together well and I and I will just say I'd reading through the list of what the voters voted for I mean, there's a lot that does, uh, it is on the list. Water quality protection is on the list. Prevention of storm water runoff pollution is on the list. Um, you know, the fish habitat might be a stretch. Um, and then, you know, and then I'm asking the question about whether or not provision of parks, I, I don't know exactly what that sentence means. But those other two, um, you know, this would definitely seems like it might fit the bill. So I think it's def at least worth looking uh, further into as we move forward. So thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, should we hear from Dean and Janet Mixon at this time, board members? Okay. Big mistake for him is letting me go first because <laughs> I hardly ever let go. Um, we are really excited about the possibility of having this, uh, our property end up being a park. And we didn't even... I mean, we always wanted something like that, but, uh, you know, we get hit with developers that just want to tear everything down. But this has been in Dean's family for 84 years, and I've been a part of it for the last 20. And, um, you know, he's the farmer, and I'm the educator. I have my doctorate in, uh, in education, and I have a doctorate in memory making. If you ask my family, I'm the best memory maker. And that was what our prayer was when we, when we bought the family out. Uh, we, you know, we, the, the farm had suffered. We had 350 acres and lost most of it to uh, insects because of uh, NAFTA. Um, and we felt like with the last part of our property, we wanted to make memories. We wanted people to learn. I, my fear was that as young children, they, they don't understand that oranges actually come from trees and you squeeze them. And so we've made, you know, we do tours. We added the tram tour and we added this stuff to help people to understand a farm. Because if you've noticed, um, 20 years ago, there were 350 small farmers like us in Florida that did citrus. There are 14 right now. They're all going away. But we could still use the property as some place that people can learn about um, farming and agriculture, doing uh, uh, 
a place where people could actually have their own gardens. And um, there's, you know, the bamboo, which is out there, is 30% more oxygen. And having a class that meets out there with their little blankets, and it's just an amazing. If you haven't walked and been out there in that bamboo, it's amazing. And the farmhouse, yes, we're willing to keep it, but I think they could use it for offices, or it could be a, a small museum because we have a lot of the mix and memories. Mix and property was, uh, we have the original abstract of our property. And in 1849, the United States government sold this property to Joseph Braden. It's like one of the first parts of Bradenton. It's how Bradenton started. And there's not a lot of areas like Amanda's saying that uh, could be a park, but this is like part of the beginning. And we would love to be a part of helping that happen. Um, for the last couple years, our church has used our building for a thing called CityServe. And like I said, 20 years ago, Dean and I prayed about what to do to bless our community. And part of it was to add the tours and to add things that would make memories for people. And CityServe is an amazing thing. They just have filled up our plant and they just give it away. It's to people that need it. to have And to be a part of something like that, to to see couches and bedding and all kinds of stuff be coming in and then blessing people with it um, has been an amazing thing. And so if we could section off that little four acres in the corner, I mean, they're willing to buy that ahead of you. But we, we just feel like in the animals, I mean, he'd love to stay there with his animals and uh, be a part of educating kids and families as to what, what animals are here, what animals, what happens to animals when they fly down in the middle of the street. And, um, and so there's just so much here. And like they said, the wedding area does get about $6,500 just to rent the space. So it could be a place where actual money can be made on this. The playground, we've had corporate, corporate parties that rent both the, the, both the facilities. Um, so it could continue being a blessing to all those people in our community because once it becomes a, a subdivision, nobody's allowed on that except unless you live in there. And so the idea of making a place where it's still blessing people is just would be a, a blessing to us. And you were talking about the storm stuff. Oh, we have wells. We have three wells. Two of them are 600 feet and one 1,000 feet. We have springs in, in the property. Um, and we have a koi pond with uh, 400 fish, George. It's got fish. We put in five, so they just, just appeared. <laughs> And now they're all there, and it's got turtles. And, and that is something the kids, I mean, people love to see those fish and the f turtles, and um, it's just absolutely beautiful out there. And he's going to talk about something. You don't want me to talk? Yeah, <laughs> just for a second. She got her PhD, and I, I've got mine pounding hard dirt because I've been been there for all my life. And you need uh, to state your first and last name for the I'm record. I'm Dean Mixon. Thank you. Sorry. Been here all my life, Manti County. Um, she said we're concerned with our with the the legacy that we pass. We'd really like would like to see it used, um, as she said, for the educational purposes and and uh, for families. Uh, that's been top of our list. Um, from the beginning, um, like I said, my my grandfather and grandmother started it. Moved there in nineteen, moved to Manny County in nineteen seventeen, and uh, so we've seen a lot of the, the issues. We talked about some of the flood issues. In my lifetime, I've only seen that canal out of its banks maybe twice, and uh, and it was at times when the whole county was dealing with other flooding areas too. But uh, we talked about the 27th Street flooding. Most of that is to the north of our property. I don't think that ours would 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 take care of any of that, or, or that Glen Creek Canal would would handle any of that. Um, the improvements that were made several years ago. Uh, there's another canal that runs about halfway between us and, and 64. Um, that helps some of it, but towards 64, there's it doesn't take much of a rain to flood there, and it's always been a problem. Um, 
but anyway, uh, like so we we do have the uh, the irrigation in there that uh, at one time all 350 acres were connected underground. We have uh, a tap to the city of Bradenton, uh, uh, reclaim water that we have used for 25 years or so now that uh, as irrigation water. So we do are conserving that way. Um, be open to any other questions you might have as far as my knowledge or other. Yeah, this, you're talking about drainage on, on 26th Avenue. Uh, uh, Charlie talked about the flood that we had. It took out about 20 acres of our of our grove. Um, that was when the 301 bypass was put in, and um, it, it, you dug the reservoir on the end of 15th uh, 15th Street and the end of 26th Avenue. That took care of most of that problem. We haven't had that that kind of an issue since that was done, but also. Those floods and so forth were done when it was all farmland and everything around us was farmland. Now you've got a thousand houses to the to the west of us and another thousand twelve hundred being built uh, on the McClure property to the east of us, and so um, it's a whole lot different issue as far as your your rapid runoff. And so something's going to be needed in that area to take take care of that. Anyway, questions? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you both. Um, lived here my entire life as well and went to Mixon's when I was a kid so I know the property I know the property well I know the history of the property as well and uh, I would love to see it be some kind of a public asset so we don't have anyone else on the board uh, Commissioner Barr Commissioner Cruz if you would like to, sp to speak before we go to public comment speak up otherwise uh, we'll go to public comment now is there anyone What's that? I think you meant Ron. Did I say Cruz? I'm sorry. I meant Ron. Uh, so we'll go to public comment. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll go to public comment, and you can, when you come forward, you can speak on either of these two uh, proposals. I encourage you, if you drove down here, come up and speak, by all means. Uh, you'll have three minutes. And when you reach the podium, just state your first and your last name. Tell us your county of residence, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Sir? Uh, Glenn Jablina, Manatee County. So I'll, I'll speak on both, actually. Emerson Point, if they're going to be $16 million, right, uh, you can have him donate the other four. He's going to have to, he's going to, have to pay the 20% anyway, so if we just come up with 800000 he can take the tax right off. The other thing I'd be wary of in that contract, it says, have, can develop to the other 80 houses. Now, you read the emails. They don't want any housing there. So I would be cautious in putting in that language if you do move forward on that deal. You don't want no part of that development because it can come back and bite you in the gluteus maximus. But the, um, uh, the other thing is, is uh, mixing for sure. For sure, uh, utilities money, stormwater money. George, you made some great points. They have deep pockets. Uh, they're like FPNL. They never run out of money. And those funds are reoccurring. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can make this deal work. The, the private partnership with, uh, with the, uh, the other organizations are going to make that park a winner. Like, like Amanda said, there's not much around there as far as parks are concerned. So uh, that, should be a, that should be a big plus. You have to take that into consideration. And uh, for them, you know, they could, they could sell it off to developer. They've been approached by several of them. They can get a lot more money than what they're asking, but that's not the legacy they want to leave. It's a 106-year history there. That's what they want to leave, and that and that has value. That has added value to the property, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, both are worthy mixing for sure. I would encourage us to move forward to do a, um, a deep dive on it. And uh, a couple of housekeeping things. I would I would encourage this board that when we have items like this and you have emails, and you have people from the church and other folks that want to talk, you would, you would consider a time certain. Would be, I think, beneficial to all the people that show up, you know, uh, that want to come here. If there's a time certain, I think you'd have a, a, better, better, a better showing. You know, Jack had to leave. He had a chiropractor practice. But he was all day here waiting to speak on this subject matter. So if he knew at time certain that, hey, three o'clock and be there, well, then he wouldn't have drove down here. Uh, I would drive down here, but he wouldn't have. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, 
That's about it. I uh, want to thank George. Thank you so much for coming out to the open house Saturday. It meant a lot to my community, and what you said was all good. They can't believe that they had our at large commissioner at my open house again. Thank you. Amen. All right. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, please state your first and last name, your county of residence, and you have three minutes to address the board. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Revel. I've been a resident of Manatee County for 46 years, 36 of those on Sneed Island. I uh, come to speak uh, spe specifically uh, about the Emerson Point Preserve Purchase. Uh, I serve as president of the Sneed Island Community Association, uh, and I represent the approximate 310 uh, residents, uh, homeowners, and businesses that are on Sneed Island. I would note that we are not an HOA, uh, but we are a voluntary community association which was chartered in 1962 and it has remained continuously active for all of those years. Uh, what brings me here today is, is uh, I, I believe and I, with my hope that I'm preaching to the choir here uh, about the purchase, uh, about the potential for this purchase. The, among the goals uh, of our association as uh, stated in our bylaws, they remain very clear that we stand united in our active support of the conservation of the island, its natural resources, including the surrounding waters. Uh, this might explain why your inboxes have been so full. The, uh, as a sidebar here, uh, the next item on our goals and, and objectives of the association is to resist all efforts by anyone to promote further annexation of Sneed Island by the city of Palmetto. We'll leave that for another day. But on behalf of all, of all of the homeowners and residents, I wholeheartedly, uh, and I believe you will approve uh, and accept and applaud the recommendation of the 17 member uh, LMAC. And just a thought, <laughs> when's, the, when's the last time we had 17 uh, members of a citizen advisory vote, board vote unanimously? I mean, that just never happens. But um, as Deborah mentioned, the location of this property by virtue of its location on Terracia Bay it represents a very small piece of the remaining undeveloped um, shoreline of one of Florida's most heavily populated watersheds, uh, which all the more reason to keep this in conservation. Uh, and as we all know, our community and these areas are being are, are, are overpopulated and more so every single day. So as you've heard from staff, it meets all the criteria for conservation and the most wonderful potential for expanding this park, the, the Emerson Point Preserve, which I think you all know uh, what a, an, a piece of environmentally precious land. So to sum it all up, let's find the money. I know we can, and I think you all do too. Have a good day. Yes, ma'am, thank you. First and last name, county of residence, you have three minutes. Yes, my name is Kristen Becknell. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm one of the executive pastors at Bayside Community Church and a Manatee County resident for almost 20 years. And I just thank you for the opportunity to take a minute and share the incredible impact that the Mixon Warehouse has been able to have on our community through Bayside. You see, for the past two years, Bayside has used the Mixon Warehouse for a community outreach that we call City Serve. The mission of CityServe is to distribute resources into the local community and then into other churches as well to directly support individuals and families that are in need. It's a nonprofit volunteer ministry, and basically what we do is we receive new unused goods from Amazon and other big box retailers that they no longer want or need, and then in turn, we take that and then we distribute that out freely directly into the community. In the past year, just to give you a snapshot of the impact, um, we've impacted 3,040 individuals and have distributed $742,000 of goods and kind directly into Manatee County through CityServe. And so for this outreach to operate, we have used approximately 15,000 square feet of the Mixon warehouse, but we are in need of 60,000 square feet in order to facilitate the amount of goods and products that are coming in so that we can distribute them into our community. Um, we understand what the county is, is uh, considering um, this mix in property for a park and the community outreach. And so we, Bayside Community Church, we're interested in purchasing, uh, as Janet mentioned, the four acres 
on the corner of 26th Avenue and 27th Street from the Mixins. We understand that it needs a new roof and many other repairs, um, but our desire in keeping the building as is is that not only does it help our local community through the City Serve outreach, but it also helps to preserve the mix and legacy that we all know and love so well. I think about it, and as Janet men mentioned, for 84 years, people have come to that area to make some kind of memory. Uh, I think about moving here, and I think about my first time experiencing the orange ice cream, which is our favorite. And then uh, just introducing it to our son, who's now 12. And, and I know you all have those different things that are connected as well. And so the county purchasing the property and then allowing Bayside to purchase these four acres on the corner from the Mixins, it would allow us to continue helping our community through CityServe, as well as keep the Mixin legacy of bless blessing the community for years to come. So our ask is that you would assist in purchasing this property and allow Bayside to purchase those four acres on the corner from the Mixins. So I thank you so much for your time, for you guys' consideration, and honestly for all you do to make our county so incredible to live in. God bless you. And well-timed, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to compete with. Sir, I, I think you probably know the routine. Hello, my name is Damon Moore. My county of residence is Hillsborough County. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of both the properties being considered right now. Um, the first, I'll start with the Emerson Point uh, annexation type looking property there. Um, I think that one is a no brainer. You guys all seem to get that. It has you know, all the values. You guys already know that. Um, the one thing I would comment on about that, and um, I think uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge, you, you kind of touched on this. I would suggest you get a formal wetland determination done before you move forward on the valuation of that because uh, a lot of that open area, the open pasture area there is more of it may come back as wetland than a lot of people might realize. And I think that's really gonna sway the value one way or another. And I think that would be an important part as far as you guys being able to make a well-informed decision on that. Um, the second one I would like to talk about is the Mixon property. Um, I was the one who submitted the nomination to LMAC for that. Um, we, you guys have touched on the water quality improvements, the flood enhancement projects. Um, I was, you may have seen me make a face when you guys were laughing about the fisheries aspect of this project. Um, this, it actually could be very well a, a highly valuable fisheries project. It's at the upper tidal reach of the, of Glen Creek and incorporated into this, this could serve as a juvenile snook and tarpon habitat, um, which is very similar to the way the Robinson expansion project was done to the extent that that brought that project $8 million worth of funding from outside agencies to be able to do that. Um, on, another thing along the lines of the um, wildlife value functions is this site is located within the core forage area of the county's only um, federally listed wood stork colony that's at the mouth of the Braden River there. Um, this would provide a lot of nearby forage habitat for that federally listed species. And again, that ties in additional funding that can come in through other agencies to work with that. Um, and then the other thing too is like you guys have said, like all this stuff comes into costs. Some of the things I think you should kind of recognize with, with both of these projects is um, there is a, a, an unprecedented amount of federal funding right now available for anything that has to do with coastal resiliency and flooding um, through the, the federal infrastructure bill. Um, the state is making so much investment in resiliency funding. I think you guys are all aware of that, but most these both of these projects would be high, you know highly likely to receive funding through that. Um, I mentioned the fisheries enhan enhancement, listed species enhancement, um, and then the other one with the um, the mix in property to kind of keep in mind is that you're you'll you'll generate material that will be of value if you create a stormwater park there, whether it be clean fill that can be used for projects in other areas of the county or possibly even travertine limestone for artificial reefs or anything like that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Before the next person comes up, I'm just going to take a quick opportunity to say to, to new commissioners and those of you in the public that uh, Damon Moore, Charlie Hunsaker, his brainchild was Robinson Preserve, but Damon Moore was the architect of Robinson Preserve, and he's the one who like literally created it for us. And when he speaks about uh, our ability to obtain uh, funding from other sources for specific needs uh, in, the, in the ecosystem and in specific environmental needs that we have, he, he speaks from experience. The guy knows how to pull dollars out of thin air Robinson was built for literally pennies on the dollar for the county. It's a 
probably the greatest county asset we have natural as far as natural resources go. Um, is there anyone else who would like to come forward to speak? Yes, ma'am. So first and last name, your county of residence, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rita Bernat, and I think I sent a, like, didn't think, I sent a, a note to all of you about today. But anyway, um, I am a resident of Manatee County. I have been for 22 years. And of those 22 years, where have I lived? On Sneed Island. When we moved there, Sneed Island was just a dirt path going out to the end of the island there. I mean, it has so improved, it's so beautiful. I cannot even imagine um, you not considering it for expansion. And of course, Deborah and Sue and Charlie, we all know one another, we love our island. Um, I don't know what I can say that can convince you more. And I don't know, Amanda, you feel the same way about the mix in property that I, I do where I live. Um, what I've seen from all of you and I've heard from each and every one of you today uh, is very impressive. I have to say that I don't always feel like this when it comes to politics, but um, I know you guys will do the right thing. I know that we've got people um, working on our projects that um, no ins and outs of different things, which I certainly do not. But um, I just want to thank you for your consideration and all your work and efforts. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your thoughtful words. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward to address the board on either of these two acquisitions? Okay, we're going to close public comment then. And Commissioners Bearden and Ballard are on the board. Commissioner Bearden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much for your comments. You know, I, I love both properties. Um, I believe that if there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I know that we're going to be working diligently to look at both these properties. Um, you know, uh, I like the fact as well with mixing farms and what they have to offer. And I appreciate Bayside coming up and um, giving me their comments. You, you, you all have a special place in my heart, Pastor Bernard back there. We've had several conversations. Um, and so uh, there's just so many different benefits and different things that, you know, um, both of these properties have to offer. And uh, I'm going to definitely look into what I can do um, or try to figure out a way, we as a board figure out a way to possibly acquire these properties because um, they are they're they both serve their purpose so that's all I have to say mr. chair thank you sir Commissioner Ballard I, I agree that these are both very uh, very important properties and and very worthy of of our consideration and 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 conservation mr. Moore I just want to thank you so much for for coming up and um, giving us a little bit more information than, than we could have realized about the potential impacts that, that conservation of, of the mix and fruit farm could, could have on our community because there, there are things that um, obviously a lot of us wouldn't think about and it sounds like there, there are some great opportunities for, for federal monies there that, that maybe, um, maybe we as commissioners wouldn't know about or think about. So, so thank you so much for coming and, and sharing that uh, and, and your wealth of experience. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Well said. Um, Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for coming and, uh, you know, two ex really exciting uh, projects. And each one of them is, is new York, unique. You know, we talk about the one next to Emerson, and, but that, that location has, you know, three different district commissioners that are really their districts are closely tied to that. I mean, that was in my district um, a year ago before um, the great divorce, no, before uh, before District 3 had to grow um, and, and needed more population. And then, of course, uh, right there close to District 2 as well. And, uh, and we're looking for opportunities for each of those, um, you know, for good things for the whole county. And then, uh, of course, you know, the, the mix-ins, it's wonderful to have you here. 
um, with us. And uh, someone mentioned, you know, you don't always like politics. And what's funny is we'll have a meeting, a whole meeting like this, where we're talking about, you know, moving forward and spending, uh, you know, obviously, you know, it's county uh, funds or state funds in some cases that we're talking about working together with. But uh, working hard to do something of environmental or roads or et cetera. And then the very next meeting, someone will come up and you guys need to be working on and then talk about all the things we just spent hours working on at the pre previous meeting. Um, but I, I do appreciate also uh, echo the sentiment to ha uh, Damon coming on what is now his own time after uh, de over two decades, right? One decade with Manatee County? Anyway, um, making a big difference here and then now uh, enjoying semi-retirement. So I appreciate him coming and uh, appreciate everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ron, do you want to make any comments, sir? Yes, sir. I, I, be, I agree with everything everybody has said. These two properties are important to Manatee County. Um, I'd like to thank the Mixons for coming forward and all they've done for this community over the last 80 years plus years. But uh, I'm I'm in support of whatever we need to do to help uh, get both these properties uh, moving forward and the due diligence done. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Baugh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say that it's nice to see Damon there. And, you know, I had the honor of working with him for several years. And when he speaks, I listen. So I'm looking forward to bringing both of these properties on. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And I'll just close it out and like everyone else, Damon, thank you for taking your own time to come down here and, and speak to us. We appreciate it. Uh, and thank all of you for coming out as well. Charlie, uh, I'm going to end up supporting both of these. You've, you've kind of got all of our eyes really big on both of them with potential. Um, but we're leaning on you to, to find alternative funding sources for both, um, particularly uh, the, when it comes to the, the appraisal and the valuation, Sneed Island is the one that's really standing out. I want it, don't get me wrong, but my background's in real estate. I never go into it emotionally. Um, if he doesn't get up off that price and you can't come to him with a, a reasonable appraisal and that they're not willing to come down, I'm not gonna, it's not my money, you know? I mean, it's it's all, you know, the, the want is there. And, and if it's my money, I can overpay for something with my money, but it's not my money. So no matter how badly I want it, I'm not, you know, the, they may, you know, the rest of them may vote for it, but I'm not going to vote to purchase something that's that's exorbitantly overpriced. Uh, so we've got to find a way to, to bring him down or her, whoever it is that owns that down to a reasonable market value for that property. As badly as we want it, we're not going to grossly overpay for that property. We're not going to overpay for that property at all. So uh, we, we kind of learned leaning on you to find alternative funding sources and to, to get these folks to, to reasonable prices. So hopefully, excuse me, Madam, Mr. Chairman, that hopefully the combination of two might get us to the finish. Yes, sir. All right. We've held public comment. There's no one on the board for any further discussion. There is a motion by Commissioner Cruz to approve both items. Um, so the, the motion uh, has been seconded by Commissioner Bearden. We can cast our votes now. Commissioner Baugh, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Ron, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, so Commissioners Baugh and Ron vote yes, as do the rest of us. So it passes unanimously by a vote of 7-0, to zero, Madam Clerk. And that is the motion. This, this is the recommended motion, yes, ma'am. Passes 7-0. to zero. Okay, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Well, you can happy to stay if you like, but, but, but thank you all for coming down for those items. That was the last item on today's agenda, so we can just jump right into Commissioner comments. Um, Commissioner Satcher, I don't remember where we started. Do you? Are you first or not? Okay, we can start with two. Commissioner Ballard. No comments today, but a, a, rou uh, a rousing and great discussion on, on LMAC. Yes, Thank I you. agree. Hey, folks, as you, uh, as you exit, the meeting is still... As you exit, folks, the meeting is still underway. Thank you. Uh, there are no comments from District 3. District 4, Mr. Ron, Hi, Commissioner Mr. Ron, do you have any comments? No, oh, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, five, Commissioner Baugh. None. Six. Uh, Bearden, no. Seven. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, just just a quick reminder. Uh, I've been doing monthly town halls at the various libraries. Uh, the next one is tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Braden River Library. So if you're around and want to ask a question or tell me something you want me to know, then by all means, 
Come on down. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Commissioner One, actually Commissioner One, District One, Commissioner uh, Satcher. <laughs> For one in your heart. Uh, no comments, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Mr. County Attorney. No, sir. Mr. Washington. No, sir. All right. If there's no further business, we're adjourned.